if we start from our situation today, which affects all political matters, as well as all thinking about political matters, we can say that we are the contemporaries of the greatest triumph of rationalism. And at the same time, we, have, we are more aware, more obviously aware, of the hollowness of that triumph. The original project, project of that rationalism was this. Man's universal and lasting happiness should be brought about by the conquest of nature, by the production of abundance and all its implications. That is still around and by no means insignificant, but to speak only of the most obvious level, the awareness is today more common that abundance and its implication and, uh, and freedom and all the other things are not sufficient to solve the problem of the individual. But here, modern man has developed a supplement to the political and social arrangements, and that is psychology, especially in the form of psychoanalysis. Adjust the dissatisfaction with society, however, however satisfactory society may be, is a lack of adjustment. And therefore, one has to bring about adjustment by uh, psychological, psychopathological means. I mentioned a few other points which illustrate the situation. For example, there is the project of a science of public administration, which claims to bring about a degree of efficiency which pre-scientific public administration is incapable to achieve. In the words of Herbert Simon, who is especially responsible for that development, the older view and the older thought of public administration is based on a kind of popular wisdom, proverbs, that has to be replaced by a scientific study of public administration. If we look a bit behind this formula, we see this. A human activity which was traditionally thought to be a sphere of common sense, a sphere uh, belongs to the sphere of common sense, of practical wisdom, of prudence, is now to be taken over by science. And that is of uh, general application. The distinction between practical wisdom or prudence and science has lost its evidence. This has something to do with, us, with what I said last time about the abolition of the difference between theory and practice, between theoretical sciences and practical sciences. Practical sciences were meant to be forms of practical wisdom or prudence. This distinction has lost its significance. One other example is the substitution of prediction, scientific prediction, for guesses, guesses, informed guesses of experienced men, are regarded as inferior to genuine predictions, and they would be inferior if we hit, if predictions were possible. Behind the basis of this whole project, as it is still very powerful today, is this. There is no essential difference between man and the brutes, between life and non-life. This is, at first glance, there are very striking differences, we all know, but the more science progresses, the more these differences will prove to be purely provisional. And the project of which you might surely have heard from even, uh, if only from the daily papers, of thinking machines, which, quote, think, unquote, as well as man, or perhaps better than man, is a necessary consequence of it. If there is no essential difference between men and brutes, or between life and non-life, then there cannot be an essential difference between sufficiently clever machines and 
clever men. Uh, I read on the occasion of this meeting here, the Christmas time, of the scientists, a statement made by Norbert Weiner, who is well known as a representative of this view. And I think this statement is very revealing, although I must say, uh, make this remark with a, with a qualification. I have not read the paper by Professor Weiner. I've read only the newspaper report, which may be wrong. But he seems to have said that one of the major dangers to which we are now exposed is that these clever thinking machines may take over, they may crush us. Now, if he really said that, one would say, why did he build them in the first place? And why does he continue building them? Why does he not stop immediately with such, uh, with such a danger? And uh, secondly, if they are really thinking machines, thinking beings, if they really think, why does he not try to negotiate with them a settlement <laughs> by virtue of which we might survive? After all, if they are very clever, one could show them that as uh, servants of these machines, the kind of slaves we humans could still fulfill an important function. Now, that, this, yeah, you laugh about it, but you must admit that it's simply a reaction of ordinary common sense to this proposal. This common sense is excluded from any consideration by definition by this kind of people. So it is truly ridiculous, but it's at the same time also a weeping matter, not only laughing matter. Now, the hollowness of this proposal, of this hope, appears from a number of considerations. The most obvious one is uh, not so much the thinking machines, but the undeniable fact that man, ha who has developed this tremendous technological apparatus, is by virtue of this apparatus enabled to destroy himself. No such possibility existed in former times. Individuals could destroy themselves, but it's not so that some individuals could destroy the whole human race. On a more theoretical level, this science, this modern science, on which our well-being depends, is by its very nature incomplete. It lives in an horizon of infinite progress. The very idea that at a certain moment all scientific problems could have been solved is incompatible with this notion of science. But if this is so, that means that the whole which is studied by that science will always remain mysterious or because all progress is taking place in time. There is not infinite time at our disposal. And science is by its nature cap uh, only in a, uh, would uh, become complete only in infinite progress. The, uh, the fundamental mysteriousness is in fact admitted by that science, but it conceals that fact. What is in the foreground is the promise of ever greater progress, of ever greater rationality. But this does not away with the permanent, persistent, fundamental non-rationality. The fundamental situation of man, that is to say, can never be changed, because the mystery will always remain. Another point to which I referred last time is that the principle of all scientific investigation, causality, is, appears now to be a mere assumption and no, not an evident principle. The fourth and last point is the one with which we are immediately concerned as social scientists, the distinction between facts and values. And that means practically that reason is incompetent in the decisive respect. For all questions, all practical questions at any rate, have to do with means for ends. The means are meaningful only in the light of the ends. And if the, the status of, if the ends cannot be shown to be sound or unsound by reason, and the rationality of the whole enterprise, remains uh, undecided. 
An implication of that fact value distinction is that real science cannot, or reason, cannot establish the goodness of science itself. It cannot answer the question, why science? It can, of course, say that science is good for that. For example, medicine is good for health. But why health? This question is uh, a question uh, which can no longer be raised, which can no longer be taken up. The answer which was formerly available in a, uh, for more, in a more uh, unsophisticated age, that science is uh, evidently useful for human life, for human survival, is today an assertion which cannot make any impression on anyone because science is not necessary for human survival. On the contrary, science creates a danger to human survival which did not exist before. The question, is reason, as it has been cultivated throughout the ages, a delusion? Or does not the error lie in a certain understanding of reason? It's this understanding which came into the fore in the last centuries. In application to, this, to political matters, is it absurd to try to understand political things? Or is it only absurd to try to understand political things without evaluating them? A proper discussion would have to go, of course, into the details. The most I did this in, uh, to, uh, in the, for example, in the second chapter of my book on natural right, where I examined the position taken by Max Weber. Now, the view of Max Weber is by no means identical with that prevailing at the moment in the social sciences, that somebody is somewhat older. But one must also say that Max Weber is whole understanding of the problem was much more profound and reflected than that which is prevalent today. Today the view of the so-called relativ relativism in the social sciences is a, a very simplistic view uh, which is manifestly absurd, namely that all value judgments express nothing but like or dislike like or prefer mere preference, for example, someone, some people like peaches more than apples, or vice versa. And that is a statement, is said to be the statement of all value judgments. That's a predominant view. And that is simply not true, as you can see if you look. If you look at any uh, assertion you or someone else makes about right and wrong, for example, you mean more than you just like it better that way. And this is not even faced by these people. Max Weber did face it. Now, I can I say a word about a recent attempt to defend Max Weber's uh, position. That was done in a French translation of some works of Weber, of some lectures by Weber, by Raymond Aron, in the French translation which came out with Plon. I mention only a few points for those who, uh, as a kind of supplement to earlier remarks I made. Aron grants that it is impossible to speak relevantly about social phenomena without making value judgments. That's a very simple thing. You cannot speak about a given politician or statesman without forming an opinion as to the quality of that politician or statesman, whether he is uh, public-spirited, whether he has breadth of a broad perspective or narrow perspective, and all the other qualities which are relevant. The values belong to the subject matter. Once you abstract from the values, you are no longer speaking about the phenomenon which you, are, which you claim to analyze. Is this uh, our own grants? But what's the difficulty which he maintains? I read you. Max Weber, he, uh, seem, uh, our own says, might have admitted that, uh, what I have objected to him. He would have raised objections only in, in a later phase of the argument. 
For he would have accepted, for example, that one must distinguish between Leonardo da Vinci and his imitators. That's, you know, what this means, it's a value judgment. That's a mere imitator. He does not have the originality, the power of Leonardo da Vinci. It is obvious that you cannot have history of art, sociology of art, or whatever you call, without making this distinction. Nor can you have a sociology of knowledge without making distinction between scientific geniuses and people who are not scientific geniuses. That should be clear. Whether a scientific work was epoch-making or merely a kind of textbook formulation of what really original man had found is obviously a factual question of the utmost importance for this kind of thing, a factual uh, question which is includes essentially the value judgment. But he goes on to say, can the historian establish a hierarchy between Persian miniatures and Italian painting, between the statues of Elephanta and the work of Phidias? within a universe which possesses its proper criteria of appreciation, the historian cannot but evaluate without falsifying his comprehension of reality. But when the criteria are fundamentally different, when the universes are essentially different, the historian could not appreciate except by taking sides. And by this very fact, he would cease to be a scholar. Do you understand this objection? Then let us take another example. I have never heard a speech by Billy Graham, but I believe that most people would say, most Christians surely would say, that however great he may be, Paul, Paul or Pascal even, are men of a much greater stature. Yeah? And they would say this not because they like Paul uh, or Pascal better than Billy Graham, but they would show it by reasoning, by arguments. But what if you have to compare Jesus with Buddha? Yeah? That's obviously a question of a different order. He means to say, if you have a certain, for example, say, a Western art, where certain basic intentions remain the same throughout the ages, as he assumes, then you have an inherent and imminent criterion by which to judge anything occurring within it. But if you have an entirely different kind of art, an entirely different kind of religion, an entirely different kind of society, perhaps, then you cannot uh, judge, say, Western phenomena by Hindu standards, nor Hindu st phenomena by Western standards. What do you say about this point? Well, uh, permit me to read to you something which I have stated in print somewhere, and I couldn't state it better now. If we cannot decide which of two mountains whose peaks are hidden by clouds is higher than the other, cannot we decide that a mountain is higher than a molehill? For all practical purposes, there are value questions which the social scientist cannot settle. We can grant that. It is, uh, I think it is prudent to say that it's beyond the competence of the social scientists, uh, of the, for example, of the sociologists of religion, or the historian of religion, uh, to decide the question as to the respective rank of Christianity and Buddhism. It's prudent to say that. But what follows from that? That he cannot judge at all? that he is not capable to appreciate, for example, Billy Graham in contradistinction to Calvin? Surely not. What follows, there are questions, value questions, just as there are factual questions, which are extremely difficult to solve. 
so much so that one can say for practical purposes they are insoluble. But what follows from that? That social science, the social sciences as such must abstain from evaluating? Not at all. And the reason is this. There is no clear, universally valid line which can be drawn between the sphere in which we can evaluate and which we, in which we cannot evaluate. There are certain very simple things where every human being of you, if he is not insane or uh, if he has a minimum of experience, is perfectly competent to judge. Others require a very special competence and a special training. And there may be finally a sphere where hardly any human being can judge. And there is no hard and fast line. And to build the notion of the scope of social science would require either, uh, in the ordinary way, requires that value judgments are impossible on all levels, which is simply not, not only not true, but fatal to the idea of social science. There is no difficulty in admitting that there are quite a few value problems which are practically unsolvable, unsolvable and uh, insisting on the necessity of judging in terms of values wherever one is competent to judge. I remember when I began my teaching in Chicago, I had a long drawn out fight with one student, he is now a member of the political science profession, who absolutely refused to admit that the distinction between art and trash can be used by a social scientist. Now, if that is so, I contend then such a notion as sociology of art or history of art doesn't make any sense. With what right, uh, or for that matter, history of literature? If anyone writes a poem in the Sun Times of Chicago, then he's a poet. But I think quite a few among us are were in a position to say, with all due respect uh, to this gentleman, that this is perhaps rhyme, but not a poem. And that is not merely an impression, but that we could quote chapter and first for proving it. So uh, the second point which comes out in this connection is this. Weaver's argument uh, can be stated as follows. The objectivity of the social sciences requires the exclusion of value judgments. Uh, I contend that there is no objective science possible if there are, is no possibility of objective value judgments. Now, how did Weber try to solve the problem in particular? Weber admitted that any social science uh, requires criteria of relevance. A social scientist doesn't study all facts, but relevant facts. What is relevant, what is not, is established only by reference to values. These values were, according to him, fundamentally subjective values. But he said this does not affect, this does not affect is the objectivity of social science for, following, for the following reason. Science is a body of true propositions, of the answers to questions that can be established by ordinary rules, whether that answer is, is uh, or true or not, can be established by reference to the rules of evidence or of proof. He may have admitted that the questions which the social scientist addresses to the phenomena are not objective. They are due to his direction of interest and therefore ultimately to the value system which he adopts. So you have said the enterprise as a whole consists of an inevitably subjective part, the questions, and an objective part, the answers. But there is this difficulty. The questions, and especially the broad questions, supply the theoretical framework, the fundamental concepts 
the answers, whatever, however separable they may be from certain specific questions, they are not separable from the concepts because the answers are necessarily couched in terms of the concepts. In other words, if Weber is right is that there are no objective values, then uh, there cannot be an objective social science. The consequence is that, uh, as I stated in my criticism, that social science, as Weber conceives of it, is necessarily a parochial affair. The values of a given social scientist, and that means in practice of his society or of his age, determine the conceptual framework of the science. And the universally valid social science is impossible from this point of view. I discussed one example, uh, mentioned one example. Weber's social or political doctrine is concerned with what he calls the three forms of legitimacy, three principles of legitimacy, traditional, rational, and charismatic. A traditional, say, what would, take, would be the situation, say, in, in a medieval society or in a Central African tribe or what have you. Rational, that is what is characteristic of the modern constitutional liberal state. Charismatic would be something where, uh, like Hitler, where the personal gifts of the ruler are the legitimation of the rule. I contended in my criticism that this is a purely, uh, that is, is a distinction which cannot, uh, cannot possibly lay claim to any universality uh, because it is simply borrowed from the situation in the Western European countries in the 19th century. Insofar as there, there was this great struggle between the relics of the ancient regime and the modern revolutionary movement stemming from the French Revolution. In this context, the opposition of tradition and reason made some sense because the ancient regime claimed, based its authority in a way on age-old tradition, on prescription. The modern regimes, which emerged in opposition to the French Revolution, claim to be based on reason. And with a view to experiences like that of Napoleon I, Weber added a third one, what with the charismatic, a kind of leadership which was neither that of the ancient regime nor that of the modern constitutional state. Now, I make this remark on this subject. I will leave it at that. The three terms, tradition, reason, charisma, correspond to two principles of obedience. Men obey chiefs whom tradition consecrates, whom reason designates, whom enthusiasm elevates above the others. That's his justification. In other words, he claims that this distinction is one which is really based on the nature of man, on the nature of the ruler-ruled relationship. But I ask you, what does that mean? Uh, uh, he obeys chiefs whom reason designates. Is uh, President Eisenhower or Adenauer, uh, Chancellor Adenauer of Germany, or whoever may be, uh, or, or Macmillan, are they designated by reason? What does this mean? What does this mean? They've been elected in a legal manner. But what has this to do with reason? Well, if you make all kinds of unclear assumptions, you can perhaps justify in a roundabout way that it, the word reason could make sense after all. But primarily, it doesn't make any sense. It makes sense if you take into consideration this conflict between tradition and reason in the 19th century. It's not in itself a meaningful distinction. The main point uh, which I made, uh, I want us not even discuss, that means that the Weberian distinction between reason, tradition, and uh, charismatic is ultimately based on the view 
sense deepest, most human, most profound, is charismatic group. Without this value judgment, conceived, but, but discoverable, the whole distinction would not make sense. Uh, and I think that every attempt, I know that the word charismatic is, is constantly used in a certain kind of popular sociological literature, but these terms do not stand up uh, under any analysis. Especially in the Weberian form where it does not make any difference whether the so-called charismatic ruler is a fellow like Hitler or an inspired salesman like Churchill. They are both charismatic. What's the difference? And there's obviously a difference. That the one works in a constitutional framework and the other does not is true, but not so simply because whether Hitler's government, uh, at least in the first stages, was not perfectly legal according to the prescriptions of the Weimar Constitution is, as you know, a very complicated question. Uh, or if you take the other case of Lincoln, who surely was an inspired ruler, and the, uh, but whose rule was not in every respect constitutional, according to the then understanding of the American Constitution, then you see the difficulty. Uh, it has a certain plausibility for the Western world uh, in, in, the, in the 19th century. Uh, I always seems to admit everything I said by saying at the end. The Weberian scheme helps for seizing the core of the political problem of our civilization. But Weber wanted to use it for the understanding of all civilizations. Therefore, he in fact admits my suggestion that this is a merely parochial scheme. There is perhaps one more point which I could mention. Yeah, no, but that refers to the, uh, my, my main point which I made that the Bibian position strictly leads to nihilism, which uh, Aron, with some hemming and hawing grants, it would take us uh, too long to discuss it. I will come back to the point from which I started. Perhaps what is wrong is not the belief in reason, but a certain understanding of reason, the modern understanding. But even if this is not so, we must try, at any rate, to understand our dilemma. And our dilemma is surely due to the failure of modern rationalism. Modern rationalism is in itself a transformation of classical rationalism. Modern rationalism is necessarily a derivative phenomenon which we cannot understand except by going back to the original. I will illustrate this by one example. When Hobbes, who in a way is the originator of modern social science, of modern rationalism, began his argument, he says uh, the following thing. When I turned my thoughts to the inquiry of natural justice, I was admonished by the very name justice, according to which, by which one understands a constant will to attribute to everyone his right. I was admonished by this very name that one must seek first how it comes that someone can call something his rather than another man's. Now, since it is an established fact that this distinction is not by nature, meaning that I own this cigarette, not by nature, but through the agreement of men. For nature has given everything to all, and men have divided it afterward. I was therefore led to another question, namely, for whose benefit, or by virtue of which necessity, men wished rather to divide up things so that there would be property than to leave them in composition. Now, what does this mean? Hobbes begins his inquiry by starting from the definition of justice. Justice is the constant will to give, to assign to everyone what belongs to him. How does he know that this is justice? What do Plato and Aristotle in 
Mr. Gartus is question. And we have the Republic, Paris Republic, we have Aristotle's ethics. Their justice is treated. What do they do? They seek a definition of justice. They seek, they start from, in a much more elementary way and arrive at a certain definition of justice, which is much uh, more rich, much more articulate than what Hobbes, what Hobbes says about it. But Hobbes does not no longer see any question. Everyone knows what justice is. Someone has to find it, it's clear. And on this basis, then he raised a question which could not possibly take on the basic importance it has for Hobbes if it were so, if what justice is were a problem. Now, this is only one example, but I think it is a typical example that modern thought somehow assumes that certain basic and therefore inconspicuous questions have been settled by the tradition and they can then begin, therefore, on a higher level. To take the most simple example, and the most, uh, but at the same time the most profound, these people who revolted against Aristotle and Plato and so on in the 17th century, 16th century, they said, then I saw that's all wrong, their results are wrong, they, are, they did not have the right method, and so on and so on. But one thing was no longer a question for them. The possibility and the necessity of a political science or social science. This was taken for granted. The question was only in what way it should proceed. But is there not a grave assumption implied in the very belief in the possibility and necessity of social science or of science in general? This truly fundamental question was the primary theme of the classical thinkers. In, from, in this respect, as well as in others, modern thought is derivative. It transforms the preceding science. It transforms it, but in the act of transformation, it presupposes it. Therefore, one cannot understand this modern stratum without having understood that through transformation of which it originally emerged. Therefore, it is necessary, if we want to understand the problem which with which we are confronted, which is primarily created by modern science, both natural and social, we have to go back to the origins, and these origins are to be found in Greece, uh, especially as far as social problems are concerned. The problem is we have to go back to social, and that we, uh, we wish to do. Before we turn to the text, I would like to make only one remark, with which I began last time, but I will uh, limit myself to one aspect of it only. Quite externally, Socrates never wrote. What is Socratic political philosophy is we know only from pupils of Socrates, Plato and Zeno. But to speak uh, and, uh, here now only of Plato, uh, who is a much greater man, Plato, on the other hand, disappears behind his Socrates. Uh, Socrates never wrote. Plato, we may say, in, uh, with a slight exaggeration, never wrote except in the name of Socrates. That creates a certain difficulty in itself. What is behind that? What does this mean? The problem of political philosophy, as the classics understood it, is that of the best social order, the best political order, the best regime. And this is fundamentally the problem of the best life, the best way of life. We can say the best way of life of the individual is the core of the best regime, as Plato and Aristotle understood that. This teaching is, trans is regarding the best regime or the best way of life 
is transmitted by Plato, not in the form of a treatise, as Aristotle did it in his Ethics and Politics, but in the form of dialogues. And in a way, the problem of Plato's political philosophy is identical with the question of why Plato wrote it in dialogues about it. Apparently, we cannot understand what the best regime or the best way of life is if we do not understand it through dialogues, whatever that may mean. I will, would like to bring up only one point. The best way of life, the best way of life, that is something which is meant to apply if in somewhat different ways, to all men. It is a universal. Any way of life, of good life, presented in a dialogue, as Socrates' life is presented in Plato's dialogues, is not the best way of life, but the best, the, the best way of life as lived by an individual, uh, Socrates, with these and these, Uh, accidental qualities. The best way of life, as stated, say, by Aristotle, would be stated only with a view to what is essentially necessary. No accidents like born in Athens, uh, uh, snub nose, and uh, can drink uh, more than anyone else, and the other things we learn about Socrates would enter here. Whenever an individual is represented as a Socrates, as leading the perfect life, accident and chance necessarily enter. And that seems to be, in other words, an inferior form of presentation. But there is another way of looking at it. The best way of life, as described, say, in Aristotle's ethics, presents an odd This is the way in which men ought to live, in which men should live. The presentation in the Platonic Dialogue, by, of, uh, the presentation of Socrates in the Platonic Dialogues, shows the best way as actually lived, the best way of life as actually lived. Not merely the ought, but the act, the deed, the compliance. Not the mere prescription, but the execution. This excess of the execution of the act beyond the prescription seems to convey a lesson which the prescription does not convey. One thing is clear. The prescription can never say that any man actually lived up to that. The description shows an example, but that surely does not go to the root of the matter. One point can stay, be stated generally, if not, uh, not uh, clearly, but uh, that must be said. The best way of life is surely a life which is actually lived. If it is merely prescribed and demanded, it is not actually lived. There is something beyond the prescription, beyond the logos, which is in a way the most important thing. The mere prescription, the mere logos, is up in the air, must be executed, must be fulfilled. I appeal to an experience which you all must have made. We hear all kinds of universal statements, prescriptions. <coughs> demands, commands. In a way, these universal statements become intelligible only by application. What we understand before we have tried to apply them is not yet an understanding. For example, if someone recommends a self-control, in a certain situation which we have never been in. And uh, that is, in a way, a very empty thing. But once we have been in such a situation, we have seen how difficult it is to exercise self-control there, then we understand.
understand what it means. Theoretically, we are perhaps, we can perhaps not say more than we said before, but there is something there, very important and very powerful, which we understand now and which we did not understand before. The question is whether that excess stemming from lived experience can find its full expression in speech, in logos, unless one uses such devices as, for example, a dialogue, for that matter, poetry. In a very, it is a very common thing when you read a book dealing with human conduct, and the man never uses an example, never an illustration then, in strictly speaking, it is unintelligible. I made this experience once with John Dewey's Human Nature and Conduct, which is not disfigured by a single example. And so you hear all these nice things about the relation of impulse and custom, and how to strike a balance between the two in the proper act. And as you say, you cannot not be sure whether you understood Dewey because he never gives an example. Naturally, you must, uh, if you want try to understand, you must find examples for yourself. But you can never be sure whether they would be the examples which Dewey would have in mind. <coughs> Universal rules become intelligible only by being seen in particular cases. The individual case, say Socrates, conceals the universal, in a way, because there is always, Socrates may be uh, someone else in another situation would, would uh, act entirely differently, would understand entirely differently, perhaps. That is true. To turn to the principle, accident always enters whenever you present an individual case. But it is equally important to realize that the individual case also reveals the universal that as universal it is never revealed in its meaning. That is one of the reasons why Plato, in presenting the best life, presents it in the form of what we can call a description and not in the form of mere prescriptions. Plato's work as a whole is nothing but a presentation of the wise man. The theoretical discussions, for example, about the best regime, the best life, virtue, justice, and so on, are all parts of that description or presentation. Or, to use a term somewhat closer to Plato's own usage, Plato imitates in his dialogues the life of a wise man. Of course, uh, he imitates the wise man in action as a wise man. He does not tell us how Socrates uh, behaved uh, when he was dressing or undressing, because there is nothing wise about that. Uh, but and the ch chief activity of the wise man being Speaking, he presents him, of course, almost exclusively in the act of speaking. I say almost exclusively because there is also so there is also presented as dying, you know, which seems to be a more appropriate way of showing wisdom in action than Sugar is getting married, for example, which Plato never presented. Now this constitutes the uniqueness of Plato's work. There is no other describer or imitator who did nothing but imitate the wise life, the life of the wise man in the action of wisdom. A few Greek examples, Homer's Odysseus is not the wise man. Odysseus lacks Homer's wisdom. In Hesiod's works and days, we do find the self-presentation of a wise man, I mean, of Hesiod, uh, the poet himself. But side by side with this work, there is Hesiod's Theogony, which has 
no important connection with the self-representation of the wise man. Parmenides, in his poem, presents the wise man himself mythically, namely in the act of receiving the truth from the goddess. His life is not presented at all. And I think if you will look at modern presentation, or medieval presentation for that matter, you, the examples will, to say the least, be very rare of a man who devoted his whole life to the presentation of the act of the life of wisdom. Do you know any examples? Don't say Shakespeare, because uh, I, I think of Shakespeare in this connection. Tempest is such a presentation possible, but that is one of many plays. It's not the sole theme. So I wonder whether you know of a single, of a single man at any time apart from Plato, whose whole theme was the presentation, the imitation of. The good life, because that means for Plato the life of the wise man, the good life uh, uh, indeed. Still, as though Plato's work is without precedent, he could use earlier presentations of wise men, and surely did. He could he even have the good fortune of having a presentation of his wise men. At his disposal. And what is that presentation of his wise man, which Plato could use? Pan? No, no, not a presentation. Sure, so what is living? And it was already a presentation of so what is before him, which he could use. The clouds. The clouds. I think we turn now to the clouds. Well, you told me Monday, so I'm not worried about that yet. I said Monday. Monday. I am almost sure. I, uh, I, uh, as, as, no, of one thing I'm sure, that I meant to say Wednesday. Well, you uh, said Wednesday, but you said there's not enough time. I said, if it, oh, I'm sure you are right. I said, if you the 11th of... Yeah. But you see how much we can be uh, deceived. Uh, good. So uh, then we have simply to uh, help you a bit in uh, uh, writing your paper by beginning with the clouds directly. But before I turn to that, I would like to know whether any of these very broad uh, points which, to which I would prefer uh, call for further clarification. I mean, I, I know that they call for them, but uh, I must make this dependent of, on your desires for reasons which you will understand if you don't understand them now as soon as you have begun to teach. And what I tried to say here was, to repeat was this, that we are concerned, confronted with very serious difficulties which make it advisable, if not necessary, to return to the origins of our way of thinking. And that means for all practical purposes to Socrates. Once this is admitted, the question, we are confronted immediately with this great difficulty that Socrates did not write. And therefore, this great, we have to go into the question as to why. Yes, so it's did not right, or in different ways, why Plato wrote only in the form of a presentation of the life of the wise man is distinguished from such presentations as you have in Aristotle and in all later philosophers. Mr. Cohen. Yeah. You spoke of the, the possibility that reason would be considered to be a delusion. Yeah. And I can perhaps understand what that means in modern terms. Yeah. Uh, say in Kant, for example. Yeah, you would go very high. If I go into Kant, I can give you a much simpler uh, 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 song taken from our province here, but our division, I should rather say. Did you ever hear of ideology? What is ideology except 
and irrational speech. A highly esteemed by the people affected by it. And I would call it. But some, the view which is very common, of course, and uh, that uh, in her sis, and you must have heard it uh, end times, there cannot be a, a rational doctrine of the purpose of civil society. On the other hand, people cannot live without having opinions about the purpose of this society. Yeah? You know? These opinions are now called ideology. That means, this implies, of course, reason. Let me say, there could be a true, rational view of the purpose of this society. It's impossible. We have to be satisfied with irrationalities of uh, social value. Where a uh, violation, of course, uh, arises, uh, how can you? <coughs> is it not reason which establishes the social value, which creates certain difficulties? Yeah? Uh, but that is. Well, does does ideology in this in this view imply that a rational account of the purpose of society is impossible? Not sure. uh, because otherwise, you would say that. For example, if you take the Marxist view, yeah, if because it is Marx who made the notion of ideology as popular as it is today, you know. You know that it was not coined by Marx, it was coined by Napoleon, the term ideology. Yeah, but I mean, in but Marx, Marx there is no, and, and the people who hold the Marxist view don't think the Marxist view is really ideology. No, of course not. They are still old fashioned. And therefore, a Marxist wrote a book a few years ago, a German Marxist, the only Marxist, the only educated Marxist in the Western world, George Lukács. He wrote a, he's a Hungarian. Uh, his books are not translated into English. And uh, he, he's really, I mean, he, he's first reading. Uh, That's not his much a deeper thinker than uh, the mates in the main uh, than, uh, to say nothing of Khrushchev. Uh, so, it, I mean, if you want to know what Marxism could mean, right. uh, one more history. I believe that uh, it could, uh, I don't believe it establishes the truth of Marxism in any way, uh, but it is uh, one should know that. Now, uh, uh, Khrushchev, I said, Lukács showed a book a few years ago in German called The Destruction of Reason. By which he meant the destruction of reason. But even in the less advanced stage of it. You know, they, sure, they would say they have the scientific account to show that is what dialectical material would mean. And that what anything we think, anything we think, is a good. What happened then was that a certain half Marxist called Mana, partly following Lukács, said all social forms, including Marxism, are ideology. In other words, it's a form in the form of Lukács himself, which shows his cleverness and at the same time something else. Uh, Lukács said uh, 40 years ago, Marxism must be applied to itself. But surely, if you apply Marxism to itself, it, it, uh, in this way, right, then uh, it will believe itself as an ideology. And that is today the common view. All are ideology. We have an ideology, and they have an ideology, the Nazis have an ideology, and some tribe in Central Africa is an ideology, and uh, man is an ideology in Everywhere. That's today. It's a very common issue. So, I mean, there are some people who use slightly different expressions. For example, they say every society must have a myth. Right? But that amounts to the same thing as you. It's a very good indicator. So, when I read Plato, I don't find this possibility entertained at all. That reason, the possibility that reason is a delusion. That reason is a delusion. No, but it, uh, 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 that 
must be forgive me, that's what I said. I said, the one criteria of Bhagavad Gita is reason is a delusion. Then we must try to live with positivism, yeah? or if this is really too impossible, and we must find our way somehow with existentialism or something of this kind. But if reason is not a delusion, we really have to go back to those men who stood for reason for the Pacific. And the greatest name as far as the study of human things surely is concerned is really so good. Or if you wish play. That is what I see. I've heard it expressed that this is a Socratic or Platonic faith in reason. Is, is, is Yes, that is the question. Is it a mere faith? If, if it is a mere faith, then it would be also some ideology. As of course, what people say, as this is the Platonic philosophy, is one particular expression of the Greek way of looking at things. Uh, that means, of course, it is not intrinsically true, it only has a certain evidence for the Greeks. For us, other things are evident, but not because they are intrinsically evident, but because we are modern men for whom certain modern notions have to evidence. What is at the bottom of it? Well, is it, um, to have this faith, or to, well, at the bottom is the question whether the possibility of knowledge is simply an assumption that you have to begin with. Yeah, it's a question, but uh, whether it is such a deep question, such a difficult question, is rather a matter. But it's only at a certain point, it seems, that people come to question, if not the possibility, certain elements of knowledge. You see, the point is this, uh, for raising, I mean, so that the question is serious, there must be grounds for the question. For example, if I question, that this is a shawl or a scarf. Is that it's a silly question, I believe. Yeah, unless, or is it, or am I, is a bad example bad? I believe it's really a scarf. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a silly question. Uh, it's a silly question. But under certain conditions, it can very well be a legitimate question because, for example, we start and ask something. So the question whether is knowledge possible, is knowledge possible, needs some grounds. After all, uh, when I say, I know you, Mr. Colbert, which I do not mean that I understand a complete understanding of your quote, personality, I quote, uh, but silly, I can distinguish you from any other student around here and would probably recognize you in a crowd of hundred thousand of men. Uh, and then, uh, if someone says I can't, uh, I simply say, uh, uh, you are panty, I have never uh, a very poor memory or so that you can't remember people after they've seen you or so. There must be grounds for that. As a matter of fact, that was the way in which it came about. Uh, for example, if you read uh, Descartes' first meditation, one must doubt of everything. Descartes gives some reasons why one should doubt. Whether the reasons are good enough is not a matter. But he at least fulfills the minimum requirement of trying to give some. Uh, but that, uh, of course, the question whether knowledge in a very general way is possible is not sufficient because the question concerns now good, knowledge of good and bad, which is a more specific question. And we, 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 come to, we have to face that by all means, so we come to solve it. There was another point in your remark which uh, may give me an occasion to restate what I was trying to say. It's so there are only ideas in that. Today is a popular view. There is the social sciences. There are only ideologies. There is a democratic ideology, and there is a communist ideology, fascist, uh, um, of the ancien regime, and of uh, any tribe. <coughs> what does social science do? Social science recognizes the need for such ideologies. Yeah? And that would probably be given in the form of a need for growth, rationalization. People live in a certain way uh, for economic or whatever, or climatic or whatever reasons. But men are such strange creatures that they need to believe that there are reasons for that, good reasons. Yeah. And that's the rationalization. 
We, we don't believe in any of these ideologies as social scientists. We describe them and we understand them in their relation to the actors and life of these people. Is this not what the social scientists as ordinarily understood does? The question is whether that is possible, that is my, uh, whether that is possible, whether this so-called impartial and objective study of ideologies in their relations to institutions is not ultimately based on some commitment, on some values, as people say. That is a problem. And whether, for example, can you, uh, can you study, even if you leave it at the word ideology, can you study ideologies without making distinction between groomed and sophisticated ideologies, huh? narrow and broad, and so which are ideologies? In your uh, discussion of Max Weber, I got the impression you were suggesting that even these values, which the social scientist must assume, are themselves for can be shown to be only parochial under the same principle. Which can be these unreflected and it is obvious. If someone denies the possibility of value judgment, cannot tell letting them in by a back door, then he surely has thought about them. And then they are most well, almost certainly and there's almost certainly something wrong. Then let us take uh, let us take the most again the most crude and simple example. Our social science has a kind of partly a basis and partly an appendix, which is psychopathology. The social scientist cannot help speaking of adjusted or maladjusted people or some such research. Yeah. And that, whether he says these are not value judgments or not that are merely descriptive things without any value judgment, that does not make any impression because in fact they are value judgments. But if you speak about the just, if you leave it as a distinction between adjusted and maladjusted, you take an extremely narrow view of man as if, I can only repeat myself, a slick operator may be adjusted, well adjusted, in terms of this distinction. And a very nice and thoughtful man may be maladjusted uh, in the psychological sense. A man who was at odds with the Nazi regime, or is at odds with the communist regime, like Pasternak, of course, is in a sense surely maladjusted. One can say that it is necessary to be maladjusted to a bad society. Uh, and uh, adjust, being adjusted uh, at all costs is a very silly and, and narrow notion of what uh, is really important. So you have here, in fact, a value scheme, but a particularly narrow and poor value scheme. Without it, you can do anything. Then, jumping to the uh distinction between Jesus and Buddha, where you're saying that there is no basis, at least no practice. We are for practice. You see, that, 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 to use, I must now, for a being saying, I must now use the language of our time, uh, the common language. In most cases, what is called the religious experience plays a character. Without religious experience and a very deep religious experience, the student is completely incompetent to say anything. And uh, who could claim to such a deep experience? Yes. So that is a, a practical, I think it is simply good and practical to say that's impossible and to judge. Of course, there are connections. There are connections between what is said uh, on the basis of religious experience with other things, with, with things which one can see even without religious experience and understand without them. And I don't say that there is no possibility of this, but it is surely uh, extremely irresponsible and 
difficult thing. And for practical purposes, I would, if a student would come to me and say, I want to write a critical evaluation of Buddhism, I would say, uh, I don't think this is a good idea. And I would say it also to quite a few professors. Uh, that is what I meant by class. Uh, but uh, that, uh, now, is there any other point? You. Yes, I'd like to raise sort of a. You are, you are Mr. Hayek, yeah? That's right. Yeah. I'd like to raise sort of a practical question about uh, value judgments in the social sciences. Yeah. You said that while we can't say compare Jesus and Buddha, it is still possible to compare Calvin and Billy Graham, for yeah. example, and that this kind of value judgment we can certainly use. There's a problem, it seems to me, about the point at which you decide that you want to leave the comparison alone because you're not good enough to handle it. Because the more major the comparison you want to make is, the more important the things are that you're trying to compare, the more serious your mistake will be if you make a mistake. If you're writing a sociological history of religion, and you make a mistake comparing Calvin and Billy Graham, well, this will confuse a relatively minor area of your book. But if you make a mistake comparing Jesus and Buddha, this will confuse a great deal, ruin your whole book, probably. How do you decide at what point you'd better stop making value judgments? Well, I think, uh, yes, that's, that's a hard question. Because it sins, the question sins, because of its generality. You know, a general uh, question. Yeah. yeah, that is always in all interesting questions of this kind that they, uh, that, uh, they must be uh, brought down on, 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 on you know, must be said in concrete terms. You see? And I said in my exposition that I do not believe that in, a, that in a, any practical, useful way you can draw a line. I would say, uh, living on the level of mission stages, I would say that as far as I know, against this publication, there is no man who is competent to judge, in the sense of evaluating, of everything. There will always be, at least all human beings I have ever seen, I was gifted and brought there, they had their limits. If they were men of levity, they would judge regardless. Yeah? You know, I think that Lord Balatrasus, whom I have never seen, would perhaps be a well-known example of someone who judges regardless. But if they are sensible, they usually don't go beyond. They don't, they don't go beyond that. I mean, and they have likes, and in con conversationally and jocularly, one may say all kinds of things which one cannot support, surely. But when one speaks seriously, and I believe to speak in print should really mean to speak seriously, one should not go beyond that. What one calls friends is what one could support. The, the, the easy relativism which prevails and which, uh, for example, says, since uh, all new fashions in painting were greeted with derision, and 100 years later, people paid $100,000 for a painting which, uh, which was given 50 cents at the time, uh, it doesn't do anything at all. It merely proves that uh, it takes some time until a really original thought, an original conception, here, whether this, that doesn't mean, of course, that all original thoughts, if they are original, which are much rarer than you think, are, are good. That is not a question. Perhaps not, one cannot decide. It, uh, there is a very simple example, apart from this fact of so many historical change. There are quite a few things uh, uh, which we experience in our lives where a long familiarity was required before one could appreciate it. There are things which impress us immediately, but there are also things which may not impress us immediately and only 
uh, by some back doors we ended by some accident and then we gradually begin to appreciate the unconscious facade. Yeah. That could be it's very complicated. Very complicated. And uh, frequently a uh, yeah, one must be one must be careful in judging, but but the same applies of course to the facts. For example, look at uh, a, a, a sphere in which the distinction between fact and value judgment simply doesn't go on. When we read a passage in Plato, we are concerned with the fact what did this speaker mean here? Uh, and we are not concerned with whether what he says is true or not, or beautifully expressed or not. But is it not as different? to get the truth about the fact, what did he mean? I mean, a certain factual statements are extremely simple to make. For example, uh, how many people are in this room? Simple counting will do. But there are also value judgments which are extremely simple to make. For example, it would be thinkable that a, a, a human being, male or female, of quite outstanding beauty, yeah, I mean, I, I, maybe it is one, I don't want to go into this business, but I might. We are all good somehow say, of course. Also very simple. Uh, or, or that someone is particularly uh, weak or clever or uh, particularly nice and you know, can be as simple as counting. But a mere counting is, of course, of, 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 of uh, in such room is a fairly simple mental operation, you know. Uh, although it uh, not all human beings uh, have, uh, have this process. This Your question is an inevitable question, but it is unanswerable because of its, of its generality. That's usually well defined. It permits, therefore, only of a universal answer. Uh, just uh, if someone would say, how should one live? Yeah, one. Uh, one can only say decently. It becomes meaningful only in application. <coughs> in generality, you cannot say more, but you can perhaps spell it out a bit more than decently. You can perhaps uh, say decently can show itself in, in, in relation to others, in the way in which he treats himself, and, uh, and so on. You know, it can be done. But still, it is not as illuminating as someone knowing this individual with his problems, or this individual perhaps himself, tries to spell out for himself, what does it mean to live this for me, circumstances in this way. That cannot be done. Yes? Uh, two things. First, a short defense of my question, and it's a general question because it was directed to your statement, which was a general statement. And secondly, the example you gave, that you quoted from your book on distinguishing between a mountain and a molehill, yeah. I think I understand this, but it's a little bit confusing. Is it possible to make distinctions between a mountain and a molehill or Jesus and Billy Graham? But does this mean that value judgments are possible? So long as you're not dealing with extremely large or important subjects, or does it mean that you have to be careful to just make only gross distinction? Uh, that is a possible inference from your example, I think, that it would be possible to distinguish between Billy Graham and Billy Sunday, or between two molehills. Did you mean that? I don't think you did. did you? Yeah, look at that. I mean, there may be, I mean, I don't know, I can't trust the beginning. I know much to read about this Sunday to say anything about this. But if he is new for me, if he so forget about this example, I don't know whether I might be seen to be unfair to anyone. To tell him my, my symbol, uh, whether two more years, yeah, whether one is higher than the other, could of course be sometimes very difficult to say. And surely, I mean, if they are almost, almost right, surely. But that is, uh, and as a practical point, as if you take, consider the meaning of the comparison, is whether that we are capable to distinguish between uh, mountains and molecules, morally speaking, in terms of how the thing which counts. And the relativism is practiced today 
induces one to forget this big wood for all the traits. That's the reason I said. Huh? No. Then I didn't want to say that. Uh, and didn't you uh, even go so far as to say uh, anything about the comparative greatness of, say, uh, Billy Graham and Jesus in order to achieve considerable understanding of them? Because can't you compare them in certain respects and try to understand their particular approaches? I'm sure you can do that. That's the best What do you want to do that? Do you simply key back for yourself something which occurred to you while going over the evidence? That can be done for various reasons, for reasons of very gross prudence. Yeah. You don't want to hurt the human being. Or it can be done uh, for other reasons of propriety. But that is not a matter. Propriety may uh, pose us all kinds of resistance. But the main point is that you, I do not believe that you can go into such a subject matter and uh, with understanding, without forming a judgment, which is necessarily a value judgment. Well, if you don't compare them, say, and just want to try to uh, you, understand Jesus or whatever, whoever you wish to take, try to you're sure. re relive the experience or have or whatever is involved, then need you make it, uh, then can't you describe you're sure you can, but then you, you see me as I say, you, you, for certain reasons, you keep back what you couldn't have observed. But it is there. After all, the, the value judgments are not identical with the value state, written statements, or, 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 or uh, made statements. I think that's impossible to go into any such matter without forming it with some depth without at least, you see that is, we must also not forget this, if you reach this, and which is really forgotten in the communist statistics, if you compare two human phenomena, the same is very important and individual. If you come up with a view, both are very great. Yeah. You say a, a, a tragedy by the Soviets and tragedy by Shakespeare. Yeah. And uh, if you are asked which do you prefer, I mean, not uh, really from the point of view of life, of your personal uh, life in the world of future, and you can simply say you can't do that. Uh, Shakespeare's comedy has these and these high qualities. Solomon's tragedy has these and these high qualities. And uh, there, there is no possibility of weighing the flank of qualities A, B, I don't see any, any difficulty in that. I mean, uh, value judgment does not mean that we must always say A is superior to B. It can very well be that A is equal to B, but for different reasons. But the value judgment consists in the fact that you say they are both great verbs of love. That's a very good question. Uh, also, in, uh, in, 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 more, in, in more narrow in moral matters, matters of, of uh, which concern the conduct, uh, there may well be this, that two causes of action, which are mutually exclusive, can each be recommended as strongly as the other on serious grounds. And so that you can then ultimately do something which is equivalent to tossing a coin. That is also why should this be impossible? There's a beautiful statement of this problem by Hume, both in his uh, History of England and his Treatment uh, of Human Nature, about the war of the roses, the two parties, uh, York and Lancaster. And that is, he states it with great rhetorical skill that the case for both parties was equally good. It could exist, why not? And there, so that the decision a man took at that time, it depended on to which family he belonged or on other accidental things. But as a, 
and legal uh, or even moral superiority could not be established. Why should this not exist? The Schutz is not being possible. But this does not mean that value judgments are impossible because the whole argument is based on value judgments. In every point, I mean, these are the good sides of the York. These are the good sides of the Langes. These are the bad sides of the York and the bad side of the Langes. As the overall picture is so, <coughs> regarding the mixture of good and evil mixtures, is so that you cannot say, one is better than the other. I don't see any difference. Those who, like me, deny the impossibility of getting along in social sciences without value judgments do, do not mean that uh, one possesses a, a, a kind of handbook of prescriptions in which we can look up perfectly demonstrative solutions to all human problems. That truly doesn't exist. The question is only whether the alternative view is the, the absurd one, which says we cannot make any preference, any event, which is not merely subjective. That seems to me complete. But that there, is, that there are not questions which cannot be settled does not refute the position which I take. I would say it even confirms it, because the difficulty arises on the basis of valid <coughs> Hume's statement, I recommend to you, you will find it in the history of England as a proper place and in the English trees and human nature in the discussion of justice over there. Yeah, well, next time we'll be uh, to come back now to the organization's report. Next time we'll be here to report on this ambassador on Aristomanes' clouds. And we will have here an interesting example from the beginning. Even if you look only at the surface, a scientist who denies morality, who denies that morality is true, and he comes in conflict with the citizens who know from experience, from experience which the scientist lacks, that this is not so said to teach people to beat up their parents. Yeah, if they if the parents don't behave, that this is very bad, very bad, because it destroys the order of the household, it destroys the possibility of bringing our children, and uh, and that is bad because man is a being which has first to be a child before it can be grown up, and therefore there is the necessity of paternal authority. You can develop that, it's not a merely irrational reaction. And I think we should, before we go into the deeper stratum of the problem, pay some attention to this very simplistic, very simple uh, and superficial point of view. There is a certain similarity, not identity, but a certain similarity between the problem posed by the Sogales of Aristophanes and the problem we have today. A science <coughs> which is, which is to say, is no support for morality. And I think some of our contemporaries would say oh, Aristophanes uh, presents a kind of McCarthy reaction uh, to this extremely academic man. He goes even beyond anything uh, Senator McCarthy ever proposed. He burns down the academy, not only books, but the academy itself. So that is not, uh, even on its surface, not a subject which has not a message in meaning for us today. And uh, Mr. Messer, so next time that is understood. And to avoid any ambiguity for the future, uh, Mr. Hayes, you are ready next Wednesday to the details of the argument. Apart from it, you have the great merit of having restated the accepted view. And I think that it's very good at the beginning of our discussion to be have uh, be presented to us. This is the with minor variations the accepted view. That this is a, a slanderous attack on Socrates without any foundation in fact, justified 
to some extent, as you put it, better than some other people do in this point, by Socrates' strangeness. So it is a justifiable error to that extent, but above all by the medium in which, which Aristophanes uses, namely comedy. No comic poet is supposed to be a reporter of nothing but demonstrated fact. And you emphasized very strongly the contrast between this avaricious, filthy, immoral fellow Socrates and the Socrates whom we revere. That is uh, surely true. But can we leave it at that? If Aristophanes had been such an unqualified slanderer, which he would be in spite of all mitigating circumstances, how could Plato have presented him as being together with Socrates in a perfectly nice and gentlemanly way as he did in his banquet? The dramatic date of the banquet is about seven years after the cloud, so that's all. That is a first indication. The second point, was Socrates always the revered Socrates? I mean, this wonderful character is presented, you referred especially to the Apology and Crito. It was, of course, the Socrates who was an old man. But Socrates was born uh, not as a revered Socrates, but just as any other human baby. And what did he do when he was young? Was he at really at that time the revered Socrates? Now again we have plus simple platonic evidence. In the Phaedo, Socrates himself, on the day of his death, says that he was not always the revered Socrates. That originally he was engaged in that kind of natural science which he later on rejected as wrong, subversive, immoral, or, or what have you. So Socrates admits that he was originally led astray, as quite a few other people were. And perhaps Aristophanes, that is the minimum one would have to say, that Aristophanes throws that early Socrates, the young Socrates, and had not seen the complete change which Socrates had undergone in the meantime. But again, perhaps Socrates, uh, uh, Socrates was not so familiar with Socrates that he knew that change which took place in Socrates himself, yeah? uh, in, in, and was known only to the most fam- people most familiar with Socrates. And incidentally, it is not only Plato who says that, Xenophon too, although that is less well known. In the Xenophon writing Economicus, which I would have loved to read with you, but which we can't read because of the idiocies of the printers or publishers. In this Economicus, uh, that is also dated after the clouds by some references. Socrates is presented as a man who does not know what a perfect gentleman is. Just doesn't know it. He is uh, presented there as a fellow who is interested in all kinds of high things, but he doesn't know what a gentleman is. And he has to go out of his way, literally, to find out what a gentleman is. And, and he does this in the most naive way. He has heard that a certain individual is known to everyone as a perfect gentleman, as a prototype. And he asks him point blank, what do you do so that everyone calls you a gentleman? And that is the source of Socrates' knowledge of gentlemanship. Again, it shows that there was a time when Socrates did not know, was not concerned, and was even in a way ignorant of the moral political things, and concerned with other things. And now, this applies also to one special point. Socrates had no school. How do you know that? From Plato and Xenophon. But Plato and Xenophon present to us the revered Socrates, or the young Socrates. I do not say that Socrates, the young Socrates, had a school. I don't know that. But nor can I say the contrary, because I don't know. In other words, that Aristophanes should have made 
a caricature in which every element was a mere invention is an unsupportable assertion and I believe even a not a plausible assertion. Now there is an other point which one must consider. If one speaks of this, uh, the position or the enmity of Aristophanes to Zugares, because your interpretation really implies that there is an enmity there. Now, enmities ordinarily arise among people who are not quite uh, self-centered on political grounds rather than on the philosophical. Now, you stated very clearly to us that Aristophanes was what is now called a conservative. You even referred to Burke, not entirely wrongly. And it is sure that the standard for Aristophanes at first glance is the good old times, old Athens, not these terrible New Dealish Athens of his time because there are parallels to that. And please don't misconstrue what I say as revealing any political opinion of my own. I only try to use simple contemporary parallels to make it a bit uh, clearer. Now, where did the revered Socrates stand politically, and the revered Plato, and the revered Xenophon? Well, he desires to get rid of most tradition. No, that is not what you... In that, in I mean politically. But there was a very simple case. At a certain time in this country, perhaps even still today, you could identify politically an individual by raising the question, what do you think of Roosevelt? I mean, FDR, FD Roosevelt. Yeah? There was a certain individual in Athens who had a certain, uh, really a comparable position, also a traitor to his class, Pericles. Now, the simple thing is, how, uh, the practical question, how did you stand to Pericles? Now, how did uh, Plato stand to Pericles? Absolutely negative. Like any uh, radical country club member uh, in this country to Roosevelt. Clear. Uh, in brief, politically, there is, I mean, uh, about politically, I mean really now on the level of day-to-day -day politics. There is no difference between Plato and Xenophon and the one and Aristophanes and the other. This reason for enmity did not exist. I would go a step further and say the fact of enmity is still to be proven. But there is surely a criticism of Aristophanes against Socrates. And we have to discover the meaning of this criticism. And that has very much to do with our question, and with the origins of social science or political science with which we are concerned. And before I turn on the subject of practical question, Mr. Hayat, your paper is due next Wednesday, which duty does not imply a right that you will necessarily read it next time. That depends on how far we come today. Yeah? Sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, but you cannot bank on that. That is right. Mm -hmm. Good. Now, let us first begin with the first impressions. What have the clouds possibly, what can the clouds possibly have to do with our problem today? Well, very loosely expressed, to use a phrase which, which uh, Mr. Um, Metzler used, so as a sophist. And what does that mean? Again, very simply, a man who denies morality, that's to say traditional ancestral morality. And this suggests to us immediately, on the, on the basis of our knowledge of Plato and Xenophon, the true Socrates, in contradistinction to Aristophanes, was a man who discovered rational morality in contradistinction to merely traditional morality. Now, what then is the relation between rational morality and traditional morality? Well, how would you say what it is? I mean, again, starting from the revered Socrates, as we must start because that is the first kratom of our knowledge in these matters. You see, traditional morality defended by Aristophanes, attacked by Aristophanes and Socrates, 
But the true Socrates, the Platonic Socrates, does not simply defend traditional morality as such. He is concerned with rational morality. Yeah? What is the relation of the true more rational morality to traditional morality from this point of view? The uh, traditional morality based upon experience kind of like that. Well, I'm still equating it here with uh, Burke. Here, uh, yeah, that is, that is dangerous, because Burke's uh, reflections belong to a much later age, where so many things which are st he is still in the process of emerging, in the process of being established, had already become a tradition of many centuries. Yeah? And therefore, I mean, it is not, not bad in a very initial statement to refer to Burke, but it is also not very helpful if we try to understand better. What I have in mind is this. The rational morality is surely based on reason. The traditional morality is based on tradition. But nevertheless, they might have the same content. For example, traditional morality says you should not beat your father. An example very, which plays a major role in the comedy. And Russian morality might say the same thing. But in prior to investigation, we cannot know whether they fully agree, whether the new morality, the rational morality discovered by Socrates, will back up the traditional morality in every point. That is a great question. Is that we owe it especially to Hegel, whose influence for the understanding of classical philosophy is overpowering up to the present time, that we are inclined to believe the content was not changed, but only the mode was changed. That is a very great question. And I will later on give some reasons, but I mention here only the fact. The second question which arises at this stage, which is most important to us, is Sugar is the founder of Russian morality. Sugar is the founder of the view that value judgments can be validated in a perfectly unobjectionable way. And we must see later on to what extent what this means in Sugar is and what the base of that is. Now, of these two things, what the true revered Socrates did, we hear, of course, nothing in the clouds, because there the old Socrates, yeah? I mean, the pre-Socratic Socrates, you know, is, is, is the only one who occurs. Still, what we learn from the clouds is by no means negligible. In the clouds we are presented, we are shown a Socrates who is very far from establishing a rational morality, who in fact attacks the traditional morality radically without suggesting any new morality we could respect. He suggests a new morality. That's exactly the point. But this morality seems to be altogether subversive. It includes, for example, the principle that a son may beat his father. Yeah? to say nothing of other examples which occur. Now, this position, then, which Sugares appears to defend in the clouds, has something in common with the view which is prevalent today in the social sciences, with what is loosely called relativism. And just as in the case of present-day social science relativism, the intellectual power behind that is quote, science, unquote. Socrates is presented primarily as a natural scientist. And this natural science issues in a subversive moral teaching. Now, in the clouds, Socrates is presented as a scientist. And that means, to mention only one point, which is, in, in fact, the most important point, there are no gods. Hence, there are no sanctions for morality. You see, that is the crucial point in the clouds. The traditional morality is a morality sanctioned by the gods. And therefore, if the belief in the gods fails, morality fails. 
but more specifically, and that you can say is a difficulty which cannot possibly happen in our world, in the biblical world, the difficulty here is that the gods, the guardians of traditional morality, behave themselves immortally. So whenever you are told something, this is just, and this is what you ought to do, and what your fathers and grandfathers and ancestors have done before you, a naughty young man can say, well, the greatest of all, the of all, Zeus, did all these terrible things. So, so that is the weakness of that morality, and you see also the connection here with Plato immediately. Plato's critique of the poets, as it is called in the second book of the Republic, the Republic is necessary in order to find a solid base of morality. The gods, as understood by the Greeks, are no such basis. At any rate, Sugaris, as a scientist who has discovered that these gods are nothing, uh, discovers by this very fact that traditional morality has no sanction. And uh, being a consistent man, he preaches immorality. That's the first thing. But what happens? That is uh, what's going on in the larger part of the, of the comedy, but it doesn't end on that strain. What happens? Who didn't tell us that? I didn't. I was... What, what happens? I mean, Sugar is, is, uh, preaches immorality on these grounds. All right. And what happens after he has preached it? After he has taught it. After he has taught it, well, the uh, child is not the tool of his father, as his father hoped. I beg your pardon? The son is not the tool of his father, not the... No, but very simply, what happens? It does it end so good as sitting on this throne as a oh, tyrant? The school is burned. So, in other words, the citizen who has come under the influence of this immoral teaching Revolts, revolts, and takes revenge. The dialogue presents at first glance a revolt of the honest citizens who know the need for morality, who experience that need against that academic abomination presented by Sugaris. You can see it very simply. One of the par one part of the teaching, why that is necessary part we shall see later, is a son may beat his father. What the new teaching says, yeah? A son may beat his father with the same right with which the father beats the son. Now, what is the reaction of the father? Let us forget now about the dialogue. Or is a preposterous teaching because it destroys domestic discipline and it leads to corruption of the young, naturally. Well, again, we don't have to go so far away to understand that. We have today a phenomenon which is uh, of great concern to many citizens and social scientists called juvenile delinquency. So that this brings about juvenile delinquency, and, and, and if that is not an evil, I don't know what an evil is. That's a simple reaction of the citizen. Uh, our social science admits it as a matter of course, although it doesn't uh, say allow a value judgment. Now, incidentally, why does not our social scientist, who is confronted by the phenomenon of juvenile delinquency, go on, as Aristophanes did, say, if juvenile delinquency is a consequence of this kind of teaching, must this teaching not be wrong? Must it not be radically revised? Must we not restore the old moral teaching? What I have in mind is this. Uh, what is the difference, I mean, on the most superficial descriptive level between the present-day social science student of uh, juvenile delinquency and Aristophanes? Or his hero, Strapsiades? Yeah? The uh, present-day onlooker who perhaps say that the uh, direction is correct, but the, uh, but the uh, application is wrong, and this has to be modified and changed and perfected. Yeah, that is true, but very general. Uh, well, there does a, a difference between the present day, the typical present day social scientist, and Aristophanes Trapsiades come in. The social scientist today is uh, not primarily interested in changing it. Oh, no. I mean, there are 
innumerable studies and suggestions by social and analysis of juvenile delinquency by social scientists. I'm sorry that I'm not in the Department of Sociology, but uh, if you had known that, I would have called up one of my colleagues there and told me how many articles have appeared in the last uh, year of the American Journal of Sociology. I, I, have, I don't know it from my own this knowledge. Is presented, but though, in his, his true role, he can justify his social science. Is yeah, well, that is, I mean, uh, let us not be uh, too subtle in this very elementary stage. But what is the difference, to so repeat, the comedy of Aristotle suggests to us a teaching which leads up uh, to juvenile delinquency must be wrong. In a way, the present day social scientists would admit that too. But how, what's the difference in the diagnosis? What is the wrong teaching according to, uh, I mean, what is, the, what, is, what is the basic error? The basic error of conversion is the destruction of domestic authority, of paternal authority. Here's where the difference comes. The social scientist would be less impressed by the need for paternal authority. The term which occurs not only in social science literature, which I haven't read, which I know only from hearsay, but also in law courts when juvenile delinquents are arraigned, is lack of law, lack of comprehension. The nagging mother, the drunken father, and so on and so on. But no emphasis on paternal authority as a such method. In other words, the social scientist would be afraid of that because he thinks paternal authority is all authority. If too much stress leads to authoritarianism. And that is a thought which is wholly absent, of course, from Aristophanes. Now, I, will, I wish to show you the complexity. There is another point, there is a clear sign. There is one institution of which we find an, an indication in the dialogue, in the comedy, which uh, Aristophanes absolutely takes for granted. Everyone else takes for granted. At least no one contests. And that's the institution of slavery. Trapsiris has a slave whom he commands, taken for granted. So the, there is some difference here, surely. We can say what distinguishes social science from Aristophanes is not only the value free, the alleged freedom from values, it is also a certain notion of freedom, which the social scientist in fact has, in spite of his claim to that his social science is value free, and which in this sense does not exist in Aristophanes. But what distinguishes the social scientist from Socrates, I mean, also the broad difference, don't say a difference that the social scientist is an empirical student and Socrates is not, because Socrates is presented in the comedy as an empirical student of certain phenomena. But which phenomena does Socrates not study empirically, which the social scientist does? Then what is the empirical phenomenon which Socrates studies there, or some of them? Well, and one example will suffice, because they are all of the same kind. Astronomy. Huh? Astronomy. Astronomy. Or how far can a flea jump? Yeah. Not human, yeah. In other words, he studies only natural phenomena. He doesn't. He, he does not engage in the empirical study of human phenomena, of social phenomena. Why does he not do that? Why does Socrates, this empirical student of nature, as he is presented here, not dream for one moment of the empirical study of human social phenomena, <coughs> political phenomena? What do natural phenomena have? what social phenomena do not have. Objectivity. That is a modern expression, uh, which, is, which points in the right direction. But the Greeks use somewhat different expressions which are more helpful. What is the status of social phenomena? For example, of such a thing as beating one's, not beating one's father. What is that? Uh, the term which doesn't exist. 
What is it? I mean, how is, would it be called also today by a non, not sophisticated or not corrupted man? Mm. And not really. Hey. And? There. No. Yeah. A law, a law. It doesn't have to be a written law, but it's a law which you cannot transgress. A law. So what covers the social phenomena is that they are either laws or based on laws. And what is what is wrong with that? Natural phenomena are even such humble things as how far a flea can jump are serious objects of study. Social phenomena are not. And that is connected with the fact that the social phenomena are laws, have the status of laws, are dependent on laws. I mean, what is the basic defect of laws from this point of view? The cognitive effect of laws. A man is governed by laws which he makes himself. Yes, that is true, but that is not in itself decisive. He could make them different. The laws, all laws are arbitrary, however good reason they may seem to have. That's the basis, the principle. And therefore, it's un- that it has no, no solidity. It depends on mere fiat. That a flea jumps this way, not that way, that is not arbitrary. That is so the nature of things. In other words, laws, and everything depending on laws, has to exaggerate the status of stamp collecting. You see, we know there are many people who collect stamps, but, but uh, the other people collect butterflies. But the collection of butterflies has a higher status because that is really a natural phenomenon and where we can learn something about the whole. But stamps are arbitrarily made, and there are certain rules which you can perhaps observe, uh, which are cu- curious. I think one can say the variety and beauty of stamps is a sign of bankruptcy, at least in former times. And uh, the solid countries had always the same dreary stamps. Think of Queen Victoria's England. Today things have changed because of the influence of stamp collecting on stamp production. But that is, but still, it is not a serious thing. Uh, that is the point. Uh, so, in other words, Socrates despises the social phenomena because they are found based on law, on human arbitrariness. That is the obvious difference between Socrates and the present day social scientists. What's the re- uh, behind the present day social scientist that is no longer immediately visible is the notion that social phenomena are as natural as natural phenomena in the narrow sense behind it. For example, when you speak of such a law as it is called of supply and demand, it is meant to be a law as independent of human arbitrariness as any Newtonian law. This notion is wholly absent from this uh, state. Now, one must also mention, uh, if only in passing, the following point, because that may come in later on. A certain parallelism between Aristophanes, Socrates, and social science exists. The true Socrates, the revered Socrates, the Platonic Socrates, opposes this Aristophanian Socrates, surely. And to that extent, the true, the Platonic Socrates agrees with Aristophanes. What is the difference between Plato, let me say, and Aristophanes? Did Plato or Plato Socrates express scientifically, rationally, what Aristophanes expressed poetically. I mean, Aristophanes in a comedy shows the, pre- the preposterous character of this teaching. Plato shows the preposterous character of this teaching by argument, by a con- an allegedly demonstrative argument. argument. In other words, we, ha- we ha- must not forget this question, that Aristophanes' 
argument against this, his Socrates is a poetic argument. By telling a tale, he refutes it. Plato refutes that position, not by telling a tale, so it seems, but by universally. Now, what does the difference between these two forms of expression mean, between the poetic expression and the scientific expression? The dramatic poet, of course, has one tremendous advantage, it would seem. He demonstrates at oculos. We see with our own eyes where this leads to. This, no scientific argument can do that, because we would have to make the transformation from the universal statement into some visible fact by our own effort. The dramatic poet does this for us. But it is, of course, also true that there is also a weakness of the poetic argument. Here we have Sogates and Strepsiades, the two chief characters. These are two individuals. And what is true of these two individuals, with their individual characteristics in an individual situation, may not be true of other two individuals. So that Sogates is the revolt of the citizen, which is here beautifully demonstrated may not take place if the scientist were somewhat different from Socrates and if the citizen were somewhat different from Strepsiades. That is a limitation of the poetic argument, whereas the scientific argument would be of universal validity. And there's another point I mentioned in this context. It's a comedy. Socrates is ridiculed ridicule. We laugh. Is this laughing not also a form of convincing? I mean, is making men laugh not a form of convincing them? You know, in a scientific argument, laughing or making people laugh is not permitted to be legitimate. But is it not in a comedy that is surely done? What is it? What makes us laugh? What makes us laugh? And is that which makes us laugh not something connected with evidence? We laugh about all kinds of things, but we laugh also, and that seems to be the case here, about massive absurdities. Is not the, if we are suddenly confronted with a massive absurdity, are we not compelled to laugh? And is this laughing not an essential comic concomitant of the realization of the massive absurdity? That also is a point we must keep in mind. But let us now go into the details after these very general remarks, which are partly, some of which I need of revision. Strepsiades is the antagonist of Socrates. I have assumed up to now that he is the citizen who revolts against his immoral teaching. I have assumed, in other words, that Strepsiades is a normal citizen. Is he a normal citizen? Is this action against Socrates the action of a normal citizen? What do you say to that? No. He's not a normal citizen. If he is not a normal citizen, and his action is not that of the normal citizen. What does the comedy prove? What do we have to think of Socrates if he comes to grief only by virtue of the action of an abnormal citizen? Do you see? So we must open the question by going to the details. We are in need of patience. And not everything of importance reveals itself, it reveals its meaning immediately. So we are in need of patient observation, as we are also when we do other things. We must wait and not force any schema 
on the thing until a pattern emerges. Not everything is fit to be digested into a reader's digest. In other words, we have to read with some care. It goes without saying that we cannot read this work with the necessary care. There are limits. I mean, the absolute limit to speak practically is the end of the Wednesday meeting, because otherwise we will never uh, uh, read something else. And it is also important that we get a notion of some other Aristophanian comedies. End of the revered Socrates from the mouth of Plato, if this course is to fulfill its function. Now let us then turn to the clouds and begin at the beginning. Strepsiades is in the night, Strepsiades is awake, and he is ill-tempered, as most people are when they are sleepless, and he thinks of the good old times of peace, and now there is war. It was a Peloponnesian war. Here at the beginning he presents himself indeed as a normal citizen who is annoyed by the hardships of war and especially of a war which doesn't seem to be so necessary. And he is more particular, it also appears a rustic. And the rustics, the farmers, they are regarded by the reactionaries, by the conservatives, as the most respectable part of the democracy. That's one of part of the background, still intelligible, as is proven by all gerrymanderings, by the provisions of the Constitution regarding the Senate, you know, as it's distinguished from the House of uh, Representatives, and so on. It's still it's the same story, fundamentally. And uh, our sovereign sympathy is generally with the rural population against the rabble of the city, to you call a Jeffersonian expression. So it's a normal fact. But he has a peculiarity which appears immediately. And what is that? At first glance, his peculiarity, what distinguishes him from the thousands like him, he has a son, a peculiar son. And he has a peculiar indulgence towards that son. And this indulgence has ruined him. Yet beneath that indulgence, which shows itself throughout the play, he curses his son because of the troubles he has created him. He, as it were, wishes, although he does never say it in so many words, that his son had never been born. But he is too delicate to express that. He re regrets not the birth of his son, but that which made possible the birth of his son, namely his marriage. What was wrong with his marriage? Well, the first what he does is try, he tries to go, what keeps him awake are his debts. And he tries to go over his accounts and to find out some way to pay them. But even this he cannot do because his son dreams. He sleeps in the same room. He dreams. And what does he dream of? of the same thing which is a cause of the father's death, namely horses, horses. His worries who keep, which keep him sleepless are to his son, and his son is responsible for his not being able to handle his worries by his dream speeches. Now, what was wrong with the marriage to come to that which is a cause of causes? He was a fellow of rustic simplicity, a simple peasant. And then through a matchmaker, he was induced to marry a fine lady from the Athenian upper crust. She was not exact. I suppose she must have had some blemish. Uh, perhaps she belonged to a poorer branch. Perhaps she was not the most beautiful of these ladies. However this may be, he was persuaded by matchmaker to marry her. And so there are uh, two wholly unmatchable people, a fellow of rustic simplicity and contentedness, an easygoing fellow, married to a fine lady accustomed to pomp and to an overindulgence in the pleasures of the body. 
So, and this shows in itself in the sun and simply in the name of the sun. The sun is called Fidibites, and hip, part of the name, Hippos is horse, the nobility, you know, the knights. Fid, fight, that comes from the Greek word phidomai, which means to save, to be harmonious, and that is a paternal heritage. The sun is meant to combine the virtues of the simple, rustic people and the upper class. But unfortunately, the maternal heritage is so much more powerful than uh, what he had learned, um, what he um, had learned from his father. Sapsiris, in his great troubles, you see, he is not a normal citizen. Such mesalliances were obviously not common. Uh, that is, belongs to the very definition of a mesalliance, yeah, but it is not something which takes place all the time. If you cannot draw conclusions from a uh, present-day American, Stepsalis has uh, found a way out of his difficulty. But whether that is feasible depends entirely on his son. He cannot give his son orders. That is precluded by this situation. That's crucial. Let us turn to, if you have the translation, page 155, bottom. There are verses 88 and 89. What does he say to uh, Sophia's, to Philippides? Do you have that? Drive off as... Strip off your present habits. Yeah, as quickly as possible. Yeah. And go and learn what I would advise you to. Yeah. Strip off these things. Now, the son swears by Dionysus that he will do whatever his father will ask him to do. Now, what does the father ask him to do? To go to Socrates, to learn there the art of winning any lawsuit. You see, one way of getting rid of your debts is, of course, to defraud your creditors. And that depends to some extent on your facility before the law court. And if, uh, that is a very simple device. Here there a slight and not uninteresting difference appears. Strepsiris has heard of them guys. He does not know the name of Socrates. He knows only that they speak of heaven and that they teach for money how one can win any cause, just or unjust. Philippides, the son, knows the name. It's the first interesting book and which throws light on Socrates, and which throws light on the whole situation. To indicate the significance of this for the whole work, I mention only this. Socrates comes to grief through Strepsiades, and Strepsiades is an abnormal citizen. He does not belong to the upper class. He does not belong to the lower class. He belongs to a very small intermediate group. Yes, the immediate group. You see, lower class simply wouldn't take cognizance of Socrates. They are busy. The upper class do take cognizance of Socrates. Phidippides, who is uh, moving in the most elegant society, knows the name of Socrates. Yeah? Knows the because having more time, and they, they take cognizance of all uh, cultural events in Athens, one of them being seven. But why does, but what is the attitude of Phidippides to Socrates? Utter contempt. These are filthy starvelings, no elegant graces of horsemanship, of sport, and so on and so on. So, Socrates is not threatened by the upper class people either. Yeah, that's important. And though they know of his existence, whereas the lower class people don't. When, as soon as Philippides hears that he is supposed to go to Socrates to learn there the art of speaking so that he can talk himself out of his debts, he swears that he will not do that. He will not do that. Originally, he had sworn by Dionysus that he will do the, everything his father says. And now he swears by the same Dionysus 
said he will not keep the original law. He perjures himself right to begin. So the outcome of all this is that old Strepsiades, this small crook, I think as we can call him in fairness, if although he has some excuses, he did not live above his condition, it was only his overindulgence to his son, but still a crook, decides to go to Socrates, but as you will see in verse 127, he, first he will pray to the gods before he goes to Socrates. So if he is a crook, he is at least pious. He goes to Socrates after having prayed to the gods. He has a perfectly sober judgment about himself. He is an ordinary man in an extraordinary situation. As such, as an ordinary man in an extraordinary situation, he comes in contact with the extraordinary man, Socrates. Now he goes to the house of Socrates, which is to repeat, he did not even know his name. That's very important. Socrates was not well known. I mean, Athens was not a small town. The utmost you could say about Athens is that in Athens everyone knew an actor acquaintance of everyone else. Not everyone knew everyone else. I mean, a, a, small, a small town is one where everyone knows everyone else. Uh, but if everyone knows only an acquaintance of everyone else, it's already a larger town. And that was that. So, uh, now he enters the house of Suez. But, of course, not, or rather not of course, uh, he knocks at the door and, and not Suez opens nor for that matter a slave, but a pupil, a pupil. And there is a scene with the pupil which we must briefly discuss. I, I look it up in, in, in your book in case we have to read one of the other passages. Uh, so pupil complains about the rudeness with which Strepsavis had knocked at the door because by this noise he had damaged a tender thought which was just about to be born. And then he finds out what this was, and although the pupil speaks all the time of the great secrecy of the matter, uh, he, he, he blabs out everything. So, I mean, in other words, if Socrates had uh, made certain security arrangements, they were very poorly enforced and poorly contrived. Socrates is not a very practical man as a person very. Now the pupil tells Strepsiades of Socrates' concern. What did he do? He, for example, he measured the jump of fleas. How far can a flea jump? Yeah? The comic, I mean, in itself, of course, for a sensible man, a perfectly reasonable biologist, a perfectly reasonable question. No? But from the point of view of someone who is suddenly confronted with, with adult people doing such things, uh, an absurd activity. Uh, to be exact regarding contentedly unimportant things. Does he not have anything better to do than the measures jump of this? So Epsiris is impressed by the cleverness with which Socrates did that. Uh, we, can, we don't have to go on there. The second question is, with which Socrates is concerned, do gnats hum through the mouth or through the behind? Strepsiades is again impressed by the cleverness, but this time with a view to the consequence. Namely, that men who are so clever that they can find out that can be, win every lawsuit. And the third point is that Socrates or his pupils observe the ways and revolutions of the moon. In this case, Strepsiades is only amused, amused by the ridiculous incident which prevented the observation, and if some lizard did something, dro um, dropped a dropping on one, so he couldn't continue observing. Uh, that doesn't mean anything, as you will see. These are the three theoretical objects of Socrates which are mentioned, and then we come to a practical. Let me what we can call Socrates, if I understand the passage correctly, and I understood it in the way in which the commentators understand it, which does not necessarily mean there's a correct understanding. 
said Sukadev stole. If they didn't have anything to eat, he stole something which uh, a coat which he then stole, but he he stole it by means of geometry. Let us call it Sukadev's geometric theft. So he, in other words, it's not absolutely decent. I mean, he, he he did steal it seems. But of course, it's also clear that there is a strange disproportion between this cleverness and the result. Yeah? They are starving fellows, and after all, really clever, unjust man doesn't have to steal a coat from a, a gymnasium and sell it so that they have a dinner. Now, at this moment, the door is open, and he sees a subsidiary, he's first the students, the pupils of Socrates. And they are do five different things. Some seek what is beneath the earth, say it's the rudiments of geology, but uh, a subsidiary, the farmer, thinks that they are looking for onions, which is, of course, not true. And then others go to a much deeper depth, <coughs> So that they have to pick uh, very deep, and so that their <coughs> mind looks at the stars. The third is astronomy, the fourth is geometry, and the fifth is geography. The only subject in which Sepsiades is not interested at all is astronomy. Who cares for the heavenly bodies, you know, I mean, you don't live on Earth. He is also not impressed by the search beneath the earth, nor by geography. He is impressed to some extent by geometry, because geometry means, means measuring the earth, literally said, measuring land, and the prospect of distributing land, you know, of the rich, is of some attraction to a practical rustic. At this moment, Sugares comes to sight, and Sugares is suspended in a basket, high above everyone else, and his very first word, uh, in verse 218, is a catalytic. He says, Sapsilis calls Sugares, little Sugares. How would you say, how would you, uh, a mother have called a young Sugares as a baby? For little sugar is socky, socky, socky. And then sugar is says, "What do you call me, you ephemeral being, to you creature who lives only a day?" His contempt for man is the first uh, sign of sugar. He lives on high, not on the earth. The earth which Shapsir is cultivating. And the thought behind it is that subtle thoughts can thrive only in the subtle air. Thin thoughts require thin air. The quote materialism implied in this doctrine yeah, is a very important position. And we know from Plato, Plato's Plato, that the view from which Sugar started was a materialistic philosophy of nature. As soon as comes down and as Sociales tells Sugar why he has come to, in order to learn from him. And he offers payment. And now we get a very great surprise. And this <coughs> is one point which I must hold against Mr. Metzler as well against, as against the common interpretation. Socrates is absolutely uninterested in the money. He doesn't even listen to them. Absolutely uninterested. And uh, there are some later references to money or rather to gifts, but they are never at a request of Socrates. Stratzeres out of gratitude brings him some flower, whatever it may be. So he isn't interested in money, not at all. But Socrates is, is interested in something else, which is much more important to him, and which is much more grave, and which is much more strange. To use a very harsh word to convey the shock. Sugar is not interested at all in his money, but in his atheism, in his denial of the gods, 
from everyone worships. And apparently Sugaris is, is, you can say, a kind of fanatic. So that would be the first impression who wants to sell these new gods. He initiates Sugaris, he initiates Strepsiades for, and that is very important, this Sugaris who rejects the gods whom everyone knows and worships, has gods of his own. And he has a cult of his own. He has new gods, strange gods. And who are the strange gods? In the first place, the clouds. The clouds, the place called the clouds. And in a way, the clouds, rather than Sokrates, are the heroes of the play. Of the clouds, it is said that they inspire the sophists and poets. Now, sophists doesn't necessarily have here the, ne- the pejorative meaning. Sophists means simply the wise men who speak or write prose. The poets are the wise men who uh, speak in meter. Why do the clouds have... Uh, the clouds are the thing which appears first. What is the relation between sophistry and poetry on the one, between wisdom on the one hand and the clouds on the other? Clouds are transitory in shape and appearance. They come and go. They, uh, there is no kind of absolute basis, a concrete foundation to lay anything on with the clouds. Yeah, but something more specific is they said. They appear this to one man, to another, another, something else. Yeah, yes, uh, but one must say this more precisely as it is said. They imitate everything. A cloud looks like a horse, like an old man with a beard. You know all kinds of figures which you see. The clouds imitate everything. And therefore they are the origin of all imitation. That's a certain. They make visible, then by imitating, they make visible the nature of things. That is the meaning of clouds. Anticipating later, uh, some later point, I would uh, say this. Sugaris is engaged in two activities. The first is what we, would, what we can call natural science in the widest sense of the word, what, the, what was called physiology, the speaking about nature, not merely what we now understand by physiology, physiology. So what is this? There are only gods. Zeus doesn't exist. And on the other hand, the clouds help or serve only so that is an alliance which is underlying the whole play. And therefore it is crucial for the understanding of the play, do the clouds also suffer from Socrates' misfortune, as Socrates obviously suffers from, you know? We shall see the clouds are much cleverer than Socrates. They don't suffer. So the clouds are the only gods. Zeus does not even exist let alone that he has any power to harm or hurt. That is presented to Stratheus. That's the first scene of, uh, between Socrates and Stratheus. Everyone thought Zeus was responsible for reigning. Yeah? Zeus is, is reigning, the Greek said. Zeus does hear. So that it's no nonsense. The clouds rain, make rain. And he gives uh, proofs. He says, did you ever see rain without clouds? You know, you must not underestimate in this very funny presentation the arguments used there. The clouds, therefore, take the place of Zeus, because they are responsible for rain. But then, the still is not quite satisfied. It's not so simple. 
granting that the Jews doesn't reign, but the clouds are responsible for reign, is not Zeus still higher than the clouds? Is there not some ne- compelling force, some necessity, which makes the clouds do what they do behind them? 379 for me. So there is no. The, he admits there is something which uh, a cause of what the clouds do, uh, the clouds do. But that's not truth. That is world. Word. Is this in, intelligible in my pronunciation? W H I R I R L. Yeah? Word. Good. Word. Now let us read on page 167 in the uh, translation. Yeah, say in about the middle of the page where Suvades begins to speak. Yeah? Mr. Metzler, the uh, But when to the brim, filled with water, they swim by necessity carried along. They are hung up on high in the vault of the sky, and so by necessity strong. In the midst of their course, they clash with great force and thunder away without him. But is it not he who compels this to be? Does not Zeus this necessity send? Yeah, no, then you see, he raised the question. You know, that's the point. Is there not some cause? which causes the clouds to act, and is that not Zeus, to which the body says? No Zeus have we there, but a vortex of air. All right, what is it? Yeah, a vortex and in, 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 in being in the ether, yeah, an ethereal vortex, yeah, yes. But vortex, that's something I own. I knew not before that Zeus was no more, but Vortex was placed on his throne. But I have not yet heard to what cause he referred the mad thunder's majestical roar. Oh, yes, tis they, when on high full of water they fly, and then, as I told you before, by compression impelled as they clash, are compelled a terrible clatter to make. Come, how can that be? I really don't see. Yourself is my proof I will take. Have you never then eat the pudding, the broth puddings you get when when Athenia comes around? The uh, festival, yeah. And felt with what might your bowels all night in turbulent tumult redound? Gone. My fellow, tis true. There's a mighty to do, and my belly keeps rumbling about, and the puddings begin to clatter within and kick up a wonderful rout. Quite gently at first, pepper packs, pepper packs, but soon pepper pep packs I get away. <laughs> Till at last I'll be bound I can thunder as loud pepper pep 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 packs as they go on. <laughs> Two more lines. Shall thou then of a sound so loud and profound from thy belly diminutive set, and shall not the high and the infinite sky go thundering on without end? Yeah, but literally it's in not the air. Yeah. In other words, he brings a very homely experience and says, look, that happens on a cosmic scale, in the case of thunder, and here we discover air, air, as that which is above the clouds. I mean, not only locally, but as causing what the clouds do. Still, Sebsian is not completely convinced because there is one fact which the air doesn't do and the clouds do not do. Namely, the, the Zeus is the garden of justice, and he uses his lightnings for striking the petrolers. Yeah, that is a fact. And how does Socrates apply to that? That's the last straw for Strepsiades. Zeus as avenger of perjury, and he says, "Well, are not these and these guys notorious petrolers?" and never struck by lightning, and on the other hand, it's not Zeus' own temple struck by his lightning. So what you regard as a fact that Zeus strikes, uses the lightning for striking Petrurus is not a fact. Saxeris is completely convinced of the truth of Socrates' teaching. And that is enormous. Imagine a simple rustic, completely corrupted, in less than an hour. Don't underestimate that. So we have now a new, we know now the truth about the universe. 
there is the highest principle you can call it vertex, as it is sometimes you can also call it air, you can also call it ether. That is not so very clearly distinguished, it's not so important. And then we have a subordinate principle called the clouds. And the one, the highest principle corresponds to physics or physiology, yeah? which speaks the, the nature of things and the highest principle. And then the other is the rhetoric represented by the clouds, as we shall see later. Now, at this point, the clouds encourage Strepsiades to become clever. That is to say, to become victorious in action, in deliberation, and in speech. The clouds help Socrates in getting a pupil. They are his publicity agents at this point. Socrates, however, demands that Strepsiades must not respect or recognize any other gods except chaos, clouds, and the tongue. That is only another formulation of the same thing, because this highest principle, being completely, uh, call it ether, being completely senseless, mindless, can very well be called chaos. Chaos is the absolute absence of order. There is no meaningful order, and why not call it uh, chaos? And the clouds, of course, that which inspires the tongue, and then the tongue is the greatest human instrument. Strepsiris pro- promises to do that. The clouds listen to this, but they are silent about it. Just as they were silent when Sugaris was setting forth his projection of the old gods. They don't say anything. They are very shrewd. They think of their advantage. But uh, they, are, they are shrewd, the other gods. I have, I mean, one, one must see how the whole thing will run, and that they wait. Uh, they repeat their promise even after they have heard that what uh, Strepsiades desires is to learn only to win lawsuits by tricky means and to get rid of his status. They are not concerned in Strepsiades becoming a, a sage, a student of nature. What they are concerned with is that he is becoming their worshipper. And he will become their worshipper, of course, if through them he will get rid of his debts. Yeah, and they promised him that you will lead the most enviable life of human beings with, together with us if you undergo the training by Socrates. The clouds also encourage Socrates to begin Socrates' instruction, and first, naturally, to test Strepsiades' mind. In other words, what we do here by looking for the reports from the college, uh, you know, written reports, the report, records from college, which didn't exist, is here done, or for that matter by IQs, is here done by a, by a simple examination. That is the next thing. Socrates investigates Strepsiades' nature, this account is incomplete because Sugaris and Subsidus enter the house and we don't know what is going on in the house. What happened there? The chorus speaking for the poet addresses the audience. You see, that is one of the most obvious differences between tragedy and comedy in olden times. In the tragedy, the, the tragic poet never addresses the audience. In the comedy, at least in the Aristophanian comedy, an important part is the so-called parabasis, in which the poet, the chorus, and especially the leader of the chorus, express, addresses the audience in the name of the poet. Now, that, that is also important. Aristophanes raises the claim that the clouds are his cleverest comedy. Now, that is a difficult question because the, of the comedies we have, it is the third earliest and we do not know whether this judgment would extend to the later comedies. But there is a, that is a difficult question you know, of regarding which I have no judgment, because there is a tradition that Aristophanes rewrote it. You know, he rather failed in that contest, and that he rewrote it, and that we have now the second version, which, of course, would, in that case, would have been written later. I regard it as possible that Aristophanes meant this 
judgment, even at the end of his career. But this is a mere guess. And uh, what does he say in praise of that comedy, especially its lack of grossness? It is really uh, compared, although you have read a passage which was rather crude, yeah? and there are scholars of the same kind, but they are much more decent. I think Clauser is much more decent than almost all other comedies. The most shocking words, which in English I understand would now be called for letter words, are extremely rare here. And if I'm correct, Socrates himself never uses one of them. It's lack of crossness. He speaks of another point, the novelty of the conceits underlying it. Novelty. That is important. The poet doesn't say anything here of his moral or political motivation. And that is perfectly intelligent. You see, the and that leads us into a deeper strain of the Politically speaking, he has a single standard, the good old times, and that can be historically defined. Athens of the Persian War, two, three generations before, the old times, ancestral polity, as the Athenians called that order of things prior to the democracy. Yeah. Where, the upper, where the upper class and the rural population still were in control. But as a poet, his whole glory depends on his inventiveness, on his having novel concepts. Do you see that? I mean, the merely political interpretation of Aristophanes, which is today uh, predominant, uh, is at odds. Obviously, it odds with the simple fact that the comic poet, as comic poet or any poet, is as such concerned with novelty. These such things didn't exist before Aristotle. You can say that is a remedy for later corruption. The victors of Marathon did not need comedy. Only these corrupt Athenians of the time of the Peloponnesian War needed that as a correction. But you cannot help wondering, is not a corruption which requires such a remedy as the Aristophanian comedy uh, not also something good? In other words, if you have rustic simplicity without the life of the mind developed, it's fine. But if you have a certain amount of rottenness, which is the inevitable condition for the mind taking the highest flight, what are you going to do? That's a nice vital question. Nice vital question. Is this, uh, can you simply decide in favor of rustic simplicity if you see that, on the basis of this experience, for example, that a certain dissolution, a certain disintegration, compels the mind to rise to heights to which it otherwise never would have risen. That is a great theme of all the classical literature, and the simple symbol of it is Sparta Athens. For example, in Thucydides' history, we are to Thucydides wisely simplifies in order to bring out the problem. Here you have a, mo a political model, stability, public spirit, and so on, Sparta. And here you have this extremely fragile and assets where the civic spirit, the public spirit, is weakened in many respects, and where old, simple honesty is no longer in control as it was said to be in Sparta. On the other hand, the understanding of all these things was possible only in Athens, where to sit in the throne, and Plato, and so on, and, and all the others. That's the problem. That Aristophanes, uh, that is, uh, one can say, the, the, uh, the problem of Aristophanes, as uh, stated immediately, is this, 
the direct contrast between his pol apparent political objective, the old respectable order, and the means which he uses, the comedy, these novel means that indicates the problem. That Aristophanes enjoyed doing what he did, I think goes without saying. He enjoyed something which was dependent on corruption and which could not help, to some extent, increasing the corruption. Because, uh, I mean, that all uh, listeners to Aristophanes' comedies would have gone home with a firm resolve to be now marathon fighters and not more impressed by these magnificent jokes, John Gross, the best of was not grown. That's anybody's guess. And let us beware of a simplicity which would perhaps do honor to our character, but certainly not do honor to our understanding. So this conflict between the essential novelty of comedy, of all poetry, and uh, the praise of antiquity, uh, we must naturally keep in mind. Now, from this speech of the clouds, it appears that the clouds are much more reasonable than Socrates. They respect Zeus and Poseidon and the other gods, naturally. But very interesting, even these prudent clouds praise ether most highly. They complain that while they help the city more than any other gods, they are not worshipped at all. In other words, the clouds themselves pursue a policy in that play. Yeah? They are involved. Uh, also the moon, capitalized, complains about the insufficient worship which it receives on the part of the Athenians and the allies of the Athenians. I cannot develop this as it, uh, as it should be developed. In, the, in other words, the ether and the moon in contradistinction to the other gods. Now, we need a formula for that distinction. Um, some of you will have it ready, I'm sure. Yes. Cosmic gods. And the? And the yeah. Olympian gods. So, uh, the, you know that in the banquet, in Plato's banquet, so. sure. Even in the speech of the clouds, you know, which was much more prudent than the this antagonism between the cosmic gods, the gods knowable to man as man, and therefore recognized everywhere, and the Olympian gods, i.e. the specifically Greek gods, also appears. Yes. Now, in the meantime, while this scene, it will repeat, there was nothing of, how should I say, crusades of Aristophanes, you know, to improve Athenian morality, but it was only a play made for his comedy as comedy. While this was going on, in the house, Strepsiades was underwent his IQ test on the part of Socrates. What was the result? Oh, he uh, was not allowed to continue any further. No, I mean, uh, first of all, the factual statement oh. uh, about uh, the intelligence I have, no, of Strepsiades. Never by chaos, air, and respiration, <coughs> never, no, never have I seen the clown so helpless and forgetful and absurd why he forgets the court or two, he clean forgets them areas when, why, if he learns the court or two, he clean forgets them and then he them. All the same, I'll call him out of doors here to the light. Take up your beds to societies and cut. So, what is the factual judgment about Strepsiades' capacity? Stupid. He's extremely stupid. Stupid. Yeah. By the way, you see how nice this is with factual statements. You could, of course, say his IQ is, what would it be, 50? I don't know. 50. It's a purely factual statement. But if you know what you are talking about, you say, in effect, he's extremely stupid. Yeah? If 50 is extremely stupid, which I never know. Or do they begin at 1? At, at 0? Mm -hmm. I mean, or do the IQs begin with... with uh, are people with an IQ of 0? 50 is extremely stupid. It's extremely stupid. I, mean, I heard of people who had 130 and 40, so I thought 50 must be pretty low. Uh, so, but you see the beauty about factual judgments. 
an IQ of 50, numerical statement, nothing can be more objective. But every man who knows, as many you all do, knows that he is extremely stupid, which is a value judgment. Yeah? So, so Suez, therefore, does, since a subservient is so stupid, Suez does not even begin to teach him the higher part of his wisdom. That is important for the whole course of the argument later. Why? So, uh, so as teaching consists of two parts, martial science and rhetoric. But, um, if I may use a modern analogy, which is of course very bad, but just for some uh, say humanities. He is too dumb for the natural sciences, but he is good enough for the humanities. And that is, I believe, the judgment of men. And, I mean, uh, I try to reproduce an opinion now widespread, which I'm very far from sharing. So what, what does it mean for the meaning of the whole play? The antagonist of Socrates is someone who has acquired only the external, superficial part of Socrates' teaching, not the center and core of it. Would someone capable to understand that center and core ever have revolted against Socrates? Would Socrates ever have come into trouble through one of the true, true students? As a matter of fact, we find a proof later. Even Strepsiades' son, Philippides, acquires only the external kind of knowledge, yeah, rhetorical knowledge. And he refuses to participate in the burning down of the think tank at the end. All the more someone who had really got, gotten the whole teaching. So the really foolish action of Socrates consists exclusively in not throwing out Strepsiades immediately. Do you know, that had all the consequences. But let us go. Uh, uh, so this begins with more elements, with uh, meter, rhythm, and so on. But uh, Strepsiades is not interested, but after all, if you want to, to deny your debts, you don't have to uh, use meter for that. On the contrary, it might do you harm. <coughs> now, but uh, still, so this goes on in a certain teaching of this grammatical kind, and the first subject which he takes up is the correctness of names, the correct naming. And the main point, do you remember what that was? It is perhaps not so clear from uh, the translation, although he should have succeeded in making it clear. What is the point which he makes clear? The uh, gender. Yeah. In other words, it is. Gender. No. Yeah. So, well, to take the, the, the joke which he makes is this. There are quite a few uh, Greek male names ending in AS. Prasidas, Pelobidas, Epaminondas. Now, they belong to the first declension, as you say, and are therefore, the, and the first declension is generally speaking female. And it is shown in the vocative especially, but also in other cases, it sounds like a female name. And therefore, these ma men whose names end in A-S are really women. And all kinds of nasty jokes about contemporaries are made. You know, this guy is, is a woman for all kinds of reasons. He is a coward or he's a homosexual or whatever it may be. And that's not the point. But the deeper there is a deeper thing, of course, behind it. Names, language, words, this is all conventional, all conventional, yeah? As that we call this table, as the Greeks say, trapezium. Yeah, I mean, it could be the other way around, as it were. There is no, that is, the men's medium convention. So what Sogaris is doing here is to try to bring about an approximation of convention to nature so that the distinction between names of males and females should correspond to the distinction between the grammatically males and, and grammatical males and grammatical females. In, in other words, there is something to do with this distinction between nature and convention of which I have spoken before. You know, Srapsir is also it doesn't prove to be very implied here, and then he is asked to invent something regarding his own affairs. 
Herbert Sulis tries to stimulate his creativity in present language. To do regarding his affairs what Socrates had been doing regarding the <coughs> sun, to move around and to distinguish. <coughs> now, Sulis has only one problem, as we know, to get rid of his debts. What are his bright ideas to get his debts? The first is to stop the moon, because the interest is due at the new moon. Now, if the moon could be stopped, the day of payment would never rise. Yeah? Then he, the other point is to use the sun in some way. And it is not necessary for us to go into the details. <laughs> and as well as things, it's are not so bad ideas. But the last suggestion is to get the simplest way of getting rid of his, his worries is to commit suicide. <laughs> If this is too much for Socrates, he gives up. Why, uh, why he regarded the other possibilities <laughs> to stop the moon and to use the sun is not absurd. It doesn't appear, but apparently it's a simple contradiction yeah, between, uh, after all, he wants to be happy. And only because he wants to be happy is he now unhappy. Yeah, by destroying himself, he destroys, of course, all possibilities of happiness. I suppose that's three. The clouds act again at this point because they are interested in Socrates making some headway. Why are they interested in making Socrates some headway, by the way? They are very practical beings. You see, they are not, they are gods, goddesses, and no one worships them. No one. The whole world. And then they come to Athens, and here they find a soul man who worships Socrates. By help, that is, Socrates is the first customer, we can say, you know. If Socrates' business becomes flourishing, they have an interest. But so really concerned with Socrates' success, they advised Repsiades to send his son instead, in order to learn, because Strepsiades is absolutely hopeless. Let us not forget this. Strapsiades is not and has never been a pupil of Socrates. He has listened to a conversation of Socrates in which Socrates expounded to him his unbelief in Zeus and the other gods. That's all. The only one who has learned something from Socrates is Philippides, the son. And Philippides does not even dream of taking revenge of Socrates. So, so what Aristophanes says uh, to Socrates is that your downfall will not be your pupils, even those who have been pupils only of your rhetoric. The downfall, your downfall will be the people who have heard you talking in general to, and you expressing to them your heterodox views. In this uh, situation, and that confirms on what I said before, the clouds advise Socrates to flee Strepsiades as long as his state of mind lasts. You see, they are practical beings. Yeah? Socrates doesn't think of what the clouds think of it. If Strepsiades had been cleverer than he is, the whole thing would have worked well to the benefit of the clouds and at least without damage to Socrates. Now we come to, so Strapsiris, his main problem is now to get his son, Phidippides, to enter the school. Oh God, I didn't know. You see, that's, then. Well, uh, I'm uh, several as a kind of transition. Up to, I mean, up to this point, the, the, the schooling of Strapsiris is over. And as a matter of fact, he has not received any school. That's clear. And uh, the schooling um, will be given to Phidippides, and the trouble to Socrates comes indeed through Phidippides' action towards his father later. But we must stop here, uh, because there are limits to everything. And uh, we will try to uh, conclude our discussion of the clouds next time. And here, perhaps, Mr. Hayes' paper. Papers. I have given papers.
the door to Mr. Strickland, uh, the first half of Baker's apology. And Mr. Steinträger and Mr. Schrock are still waiting for their papers. Now, one of them must take the second half of the apology, and one of them must take the cry to. First come, first serve. And he on the stand, please. He will act hard. That is Mr. Sandringer for the second. Now let us turn to uh, uh, Aristophanes and the clouds. A few, I remind you of a few points we discussed last time. At first glance, the clouds present the conflict between what we would call science and the polis. And this is identical in the context with the conflict between immorality and morality. That science of Socrates is not political or so, it does not include a political or social science because the, the theme of science is nature and all political and social arrangements are conventional and therefore not subject of science. But the Socratic science is connected with rhetoric. And why that is so, we will see later. And the Socratic position is presented symbolically by the two gods whom Socrates worships, either also called vortex, that is due to its function, and the clouds. The either or vertex stands for, phys for natural science, especially astronomy, and the clouds stand for rhetoric, for the reasons indicated last time. The highest part of Socrates' science is astronomy, and it is characteristic of Strepsiades that he is absolutely uninterested in astronomy, whereas for the other fields he has some slight understanding. For geometry, for geometry he is even a considerable interest because it is so important for dividing up the land. Now the occasion, this is much about the uh, overall position of Socrates. The occasion of the conflict is, is the predicament of Strepsiades. He is not a normal Athenian citizen. He is an in-between being, between the upper and the lower class, by virtue of him. He comes, as you remember, from the lower class. He's a rustic, but he married foolishly into the upper class, and therefore he is caught between the devil and the deep sea. But there is a more specific reason apart from his marriage, and that is his indulgence towards his son. Because if he had been a tough father, he could have prevented the, His love for his son brings him into debts and tempts him, therefore, to become unjust, namely to try to deny his debts. And this can only be done by becoming a completely unjust man via Socrates. Now, the series we have seen is too dumb, not only for natural science, but for rhetoric as well. The clouds advise Strepsiades to send his son Pidipides <coughs> to Socrates' school. The clouds, the new gods, encourage an enterprise which is somehow directed against the old gods. You know, Socrates Zeus doesn't exist, says Socrates. Let us turn to verse 833 following in the translation on page 184, middle, where Fidipides speaks to Socrates, yeah, to, to his father. Yeah? Do you have that? You want me to read? Yeah. And now you come to such a pitch of madness as to yeah. put faith and brain struck men. Oh, hush, and don't blaspheme such very dexterous men and sapiens, too. Men of such frugal habits, they never shave, nor use your precious ointment, nor go to baths to clean themselves. But you have taken me for a corpse and cleaned me out. Come, come, make haste. Do go and learn for me. You know, stop here for a moment. You see, there is a link between Strepsiades and Socrates, And that consists in the fact that both are 
thrifty parsimonious. This parsimony is, of course, of very different origin. Why is Strepsiades parsimonious and why is Sogares parsimonious? And we must see. You see, this parsimony is the only thing which Sogares and Strepsiades have in common. Yeah? But uh, all the more important, uh, all the more revealing of the basic difference. Now, what, what is uh, the, co- the cause of Strepsiades' parsimony and what is the cause of Sogares' parsimony? It's not a difficult question, but we must answer it. Well, Socrates doesn't care for such things. They have yes. no worth to him. Yes. And, and they have too much worth for uh, strip yes. Now, there's a, one case indifference, and the other case greed. So really opposite motivations. And that is, of course, connected with the fact that Sugar is, is absolutely disinterested in the payment for his teaching. This we must always keep in mind, and therefore the vulgar notion of the clouds that so that is here presented as a sophist in the vulgar sense of the word is simply not true, because the sophists were famous for greed for money and also for reputation and prestige. So it is completely indifferent to these matters. Yeah. So Strepsiades, then, as, as is indicated by the passage we have been to read, is trying to persuade his son Phidibides to um, become the pupil of Socrates because he, Strepsiades himself, is not intelligent enough for the purpose. In the conversation between Strepsiades and his son, Strepsiades teaches his son, without any preparation, that Zeus is not immediately like that. And uh, Philippides is a sensible young man, regards this as madness. He does go, he is however willing to go to Socrates' school, but only in order to obey his father. The first time in his life that Strepsiades has put his foot down, and he got obeyed, which shows how terribly indulgent he has been hitherto. Yeah. Uh, brings that out uh, still more. And the action is already indicated in this very fact. Strepsiades has been up to now a little crook. He only had the intention of defrauding his status. Then he goes to Socrates, and there the net result is that he becomes completely corrupted. He wants to become completely corrupted, but he does not imagine what he is letting himself in for. He had already accepted the abolition of Zeus as a minor thing. Yeah. But uh, he has no inkling what is going to happen if his son is exposed to this influence. Uh, Phidippides seems to have a premonition that the end would be very bad for his father. <coughs> Just as Strepsiades' indulgence to his son was bad for Strepsiades. In other words, he makes the same mistake in a different way. The father makes the same mistake all over again. Now, then they go both to Socrates, and Strepsiades urges Socrates to teach Strepsiades the two speeches. How does he say, how he calls them argument or logic, which is an impossible translation, logic. It's uh, a right and wrong logic. The so logic yeah, is a wrong lo- I mean, it's, it's, it has nothing to do with logic. There are two speeches, two contentions, two assertions, Two arguments, we would say. A just argument, just not logically correct. An assertion in favor of justice, that's called the just laws. An assertion in favor of injustice, that is called the unjust laws. Now, Subsidius urges Socrates to teach his son the two logos, the two assertions but above all the unjust logos. Naturally, because he wants to win the lawsuits by the fair means of power. Socrates says that Phidippides will learn from the two logoi, from the two assertions themselves. Socrates will be absent. Socrates does not teach injustice. Please note this. He only exposes these young men to these logoi, to these do- assert these arguments themselves. Well, and if the unjust argument is 
stronger. It's not so as for it. Is so. This, uh, um, that is very, uh, the, the appearance of these two robots is very interesting. The unjust teaching is not the teaching of Socrates. See, these teachings have a life of their own. They speak themselves. They act themselves. Now, this is very common in the Platonic dialogue, that the Logos is presented as having a life of its own. For an extreme case in the Phaedo, so what is the phrase, the Logos might die. Yeah, the Logos might die. Or, or Logos moves as it sees fit, and we follow it. Logos is the leader. This is not a platonic invention, as you can see. If it is, has been invented by anyone, uh, I, one could say it has been invented by Aristotle, who presents this movement of the two logos. Now then we come to what, in a, what is, in a sense, a central scene of the clause, namely the argument between the two logoi, between the <coughs> two, you can say between the two theses, if you want to, the just thesis and the unjust thesis. You cannot say the right and wrong uh, uh, logic, as, this, uh, as Rogers translates. Uh, two points which must be mentioned. The unjust logos is the weaker logos. And the just lovers is a stronger lovers. And therefore, the claim of Socrates is that he can make the weaker lovers the stronger one, and vice versa. Why is the unjust lovers, the unjust thesis, called weak if it is so strong? And why is the strong lovers called strong, the just lovers called strong, if it is so weak? There must be a reason for that. Yes. The just uh, is based upon emotional ties to tradition. What it do you is, mean? It takes its strength from its uh, listeners' uh, predilections and, and biases. Well, can, you know, let's, let us say it is strong with the people, yeah? and the other is weak with the people. Perhaps that is sufficient, we must see. Now, the argument begins, is started by the <laughs> unjust law. <laughs> And its assertion is very straightforward and clear. Right or justice is not, just as Sugaris had said, Zeus is not. Why is right not? Why does right not exist, according to the first argument? There is an, uh, and part of the argument is suppressed. Right obviously doesn't exist with men. Yeah? read the daily papers. So if it exists anywhere, it will exist with the gods. But does it exist with the gods? No. The highest god is Zeus. And what is the ground of Zeus' rule by virtue of what does Zeus, the guardian of right, rule? State here. Do you remember? It's important for the whole following argument. What makes Zeus rule? Parasite. Um, yeah, uh, he bound his own father, and uh, he committed the most unjust action. So, justice is no basis. You know that these points are, you must not take this as mere jokes. You know how important it is later on in the Republic, Plato's Republic, that the new argument for justice, and an atrociously new argument, is necessary because the traditional notions of justice are based on the traditional views of the gods. And these traditional notions contradict the very justice which they claim to support. So that is, uh, is very serious. This, in a way, settles it. The highest authority for traditional morality contradicts traditional morality. What can you do? The, the argument is very powerful and is shown by the reaction of the just logos. The only reply of which it is capable are insults. But then the just logos goes on to say that the moral decay of the city is a consequence of the unjust logos. 
its face in right is destroyed by some naughty men pointing out the contradiction between traditional morality and the basis of traditional morality, the actions of Zeus. And that leads to the decay of the city. So that issue is not settled with that. And now we go on. Up to now we had no, hardly more than scolding between the two logoi. And we owe it to the clouds, these powerful goddesses, that they bring about a debate as distinguished from mere exchange of insults. In a sense, the clouds are more sensible than the two logoi. They seem to be impartial and concerned with the true argument. And the clouds say, uh, expect, they, they want to find out which of the two logoi will be the best speaker. The question is, can justice defend itself by speech? Justice might be, have a stronger case than injustice, but perhaps not in the element of speech. Is this thinkable? That something might be higher, truer, and yet not be able to defend itself in the element of speech. That is a question with which we are confronted here. And so the debate begins, and each of the two logos states its case. The just logos proves its case by praising the austere system of education of olden times. That system of education which led to the victory of Marathon. Parallel in, from uh, this country would be the American Legion or some, you know, I, I say this without any criticism or with any, uh, but something uh, standing for the greatest, uh, for the recollection of the greatest achievements of the nation. Now, what were the characteristic features of this old education? Physical training, gymnasium, not rattling on the marketplace. Connected with that sense of shame in every respect. The young are heard but not see, uh, seen but not heard and this kind of thing. The new education makes what is base noble and makes what is noble base. A certain kind of impudence which was regarded as base by the old school is regarded now as a sign of courage and so on and therefore regarded as noble. You see, the case is not between an evaluating morality, an evaluating teaching and a value-free teaching, but two, in this modern lingo, two opposite systems of value confront each other. Part of this modern and wicked system is, as appears from the indications, homosexuality. Now, the clouds, who are superhuman beings and therefore can be assumed to be more intelligent than we are, and therefore we must listen to what, how they react, the clouds are impressed by what the just speech says. Up to now, we are, things are fine, but then the unjust speech comes up and contradicts everything the previous, uh, the, the just speech had said. He explicitly contradicts, quote, the laws and right, unquote. Meaning, laws are as such bad. Right is as such bad, nothing short of that. And he boasts that he will win with the weak, in spite of its weakness. There is, however, one common ground, and that is important, between the two speeches. There is one thing which they praise equally, as though the meaning is somewhat different, and that is manliness, Andrea. And that is an, a, a part of the argument in 1045 following, where the unjust logos shows that manliness is achieved 
precisely by the means condemned by the just speech. This, this means is not very important for our purpose. The means happen to be warm bath. They were despised by the old fashioned people and used by these newfangled people. But the, the real, uh, the power of the argument comes from the fact that the end is the same, manliness. And the argument is given by a Heracles who used warm bath and no one was as manly as Heracles. But throughout uh, his speech, draws, uh, draws the speech, draws, uh, the unjust speech, <coughs> appeal to precedent, Homeric and other ones, which favors the new form of education. And this is, of course, of a certain general interest because, and that is one of the weaknesses of what is called conservatism. If I may mention this complicated thing in passing, uh, conservatism always refers to tradition. But traditions are never unambiguous, that's the trouble. They are complicated. And you can find in any, every tradition some arguments against the over overwhelming sense of the tradition. That's the difficulty. But that is where the just logos is called. The unjust logos can find precedents in the traditions which favor the newfangled proposals. But to come now to the main point and where the opposition becomes very clear, the unjust logos rejects moderation or temperance. That's the key point. They agree as to the fact that manliness or courage is a virtue, but they disagree as to the status of moderation or temperance. Moderation is, uh, that is akin to a sense of shame, moderation, temperance, sense of shame. This is regarded as the most important virtue by the old education and is regarded as a vice by the new education. Here you are. Contemporary parallels abound. In the same breath in which he rejects moderation, he praises rhetoric that goes together. This goes together, this cleverness in speech, the smartness, the flexibility, over against the dignified inflexibility, adherence to principle, and so on in the old education. We can uh, perhaps uh, state it as follows also, to, uh, and, and that um, uh, those of you who have studied Plato uh, will know that on parallels to that. The virtues which are admired by the new time, by the, by the unjust law, are manliness and cleverness. Now the common Greek word for cleverness is the same as that for wisdom, Sophia because that is then a more subtle distinction, the distinction between uh, wisdom in a, pro, in a stricter sense and the cleverness. So let us say manliness and wisdom. For example, in Caliclas, in Vedus Gorgias, what are the virtues which he recognizes? Author Asimakos in the first book of the Republic. Manliness and wisdom combined. Justice and moderation, and moderation are no virtues. The just logos, puts a much greater store by moderation plus justice than on manliness and wisdom. But what is the basis of the rich? We, we must go gradually to the deeper presuppositions. What is at the bottom of the rejection of moderation? Uh, turn to page 193. Uh, of the translation. And then she cut and ran away. For nothing so engages a woman's heart as forward warmth, old shred of those dark ages. Or take this chest of the young man, shift it inside and out. Count all the pleasures, all the joys. It bids you live without. No kind of dames, no kind of games, no laughing, feasting, drinking. Why life itself is little worth without these joys, I'm thinking. Well, you I see, in other words, the old morality is austere, is ascetic, yeah? Well, I must notice now the wants by nature self-implanted. Yeah, literally, yeah, literally, the necessities of nature, literally. 
You love, seduce, you can't help that. You're caught, convicted, granted. You're done for. You can't say one word. But if you follow me, indulge your genius. Yeah, that is not. Uh, if uh, uh, conversing or being together with me, you, employ, you use or employ nature, where it says indulge in your genius. Yeah? Yes? Laugh and quack. Hold nothing base to be. Why, if you're in adultery court, your pleas will still be ample. You've done no wrong, you'll say, and then bring Zeus as your example. He fell before the wondrous powers by love and beauty wielded. And how can you, the mortal, stand where he, the immortal, yielded? Yeah, so, you, you, in other words, the, the principle to which he refers is nature. The new morality is in accordance with the nature. The old morality is against nature and is based only on convention. All themes with, uh, which uh, come up time and again in Plato. You see also the appeal to the model of Zeus himself. Yeah? The old morality preaches, condemns adultery. And adultery is a great crime. And the guardian of right is Zeus, but Zeus does exactly the things which he condemns. But the argument is not quite sufficient. So granted then that one should follow nature without any regard to law or convention. Still, the law exists, and as appears from the sequel, there is human punishment for adultery, in spite of the very strong case for adultery implied in Zeus's behavior. What about that? What about that great difficulty? Yeah. Someone who pays the addict that unjust lovers is caught and punished. What's your argument? How can the addicts, the unjust uh, lovers, maintain this on this basis? What would you say? The unnatural morality r rules the law courts, and that is something. How can the, so the, the just lovers win? But how can the unjust lovers get around the law courts? Part, yeah, rhetoric. But still, rhetoric is not omnipotent. There is something else which we have to consider. Law courts are unjust. Okay, yeah, but, but they exist. And, and he, uh, no one cares for justice here particularly. You know, justice loses its basis. But laws can be changed. As long as the citizen body believes in these conventions, of course it is powerful. But the, the citizen body may change its mind, it may become enlightened, and then the laws will be changed. That's the end of it. Since these practices are based only on convention, i.e. only on opinion, a change of opinion destroys it. A, a change of opinion cannot destroy the fact that we must have food, for example. We may opine about it, what we wish, we still need it. But things which depend entirely on opinion are changed by a change of opinion. At this point, the just logos itself admits its defeat and goes over to the opposite camp. That is, in a way, the high point of this comedy. Not Socrates. Socrates doesn't do anything. Justice itself, we can say presents its case and is unable to defend it. Just as itself goes over the law. Well, what do you say to that, to the argument up to this point? What was the meaning of this debate? What was to be established by this debate, according to the clouds who were in charge of the debate, and they brought it about in a way? Was it to establish who is right or who is wrong? But who can win the speech? Who is the best speaker? And who is the best speaker? So the unjust logos has proved to be the best speaker. That does not yet prove that he is right. But let us assume, as I hope we all assume, that the unjust speech is wrong. Is it then not possible to state its case in speech? Must it not be possible to state the case for justice in speech? That is, by the way, the great theme of the Republic. The great theme to state the case for justice in speech. According to Socrates, 
No one has ever done that before him. That's the first time. What is so strong, what is so difficult for speech to establish so that the unjust logos wins? What is that? The argument here, the subject matter discussed here at the end was adultery. Why is the argument in favor of adultery invincible, as it seems here? What does any argument in against adultery presuppose? That is very simple. And we cannot go on before I, but someone of you has an answer to the question. Some kind of harsh follows justice. <clears throat> that would apply also to theft and uh, murder and any other any other case. Maybe just in terms of adultery. Yeah, sure, because that was the subject, yes. Well, let's say stresses which cause social disharmony. Yeah, but uh, it, or, <coughs> if you look at it from a purely uh, detached point of view, you can say it also establishes social harmony, and we begin to adult, but <laughs> that is too general. <laughs> the scientific family, the family of the family. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Absolutely, that's the one. Uh, it's the sacredness of, marriage, of the marriage bond. Yes. But that is the question, is this not the difficulty for the logos? to establish that marriage is, is sacred, or to use the term which is here more urgent, because the basis of the argument is not sacredness, but nature is marriage a natural institution, is marriage by nature. That is the question. But we must see, we have not yet all the evidence together to see uh, with what, what the specific difficulty is. Now, the decisive thing has been done. The unjust logos has proved to be stronger in speech than the just logos. Serpsiades is not uh, deterred by this terrible event. He is as enthusiastic as he was before about his plan of having his son educated by the unjust logos. Imagine such a father. His son, on the other hand, still does not like to stay in school. You see, this is this foolish playboy is more sensible than his father, his his common father. How strange, uh, Mr. Gilden. Um, I don't understand. Why does the final overthrow of the uh, just logos take the form of showing that everybody is an adulterer. Or is the translation misleading? Uh, you mean the verse which we just read? It's at the very end, yeah. Where are they? Who are they? They're adulterers. Who are they? They're adulterers. I see, yeah, but well, now that, I mean, surely that is a, is a comic exaggeration, you know, uh, playing to the audience, yeah? You, what uh, kind of closets, uh, of uh, skeletons do you have in your closet? Yeah. But uh, stated non-comically, it simply means that if the citizen body does not believe in the wrongness of adultery, then it's no longer, they, they will not condemn. And that is what I said. So if prohibition against adultery is based merely on opinion, then opinion can be changed by, by enlightenment, yeah, by, by uh, well, uh, I, you, uh, everyone who reads uh, takes the trouble of reading the chapter on American mores in the Tocqueville's Democracy in America and uh, looks around and sees that an enormous change has taken place in the last hundred years, I believe people better informed say in the last 30 years, and uh, that shows what opinions can do. I mean, uh, uh, what, for example, the spread of psychoanalysis has done to change the whole uh, position. At this point, the clouds express for the first time the suspicion that Strepsiades or Socrates will regret what has happened before long. So that since the clouds are important characters in this play, why is this change of opinion on the part of the clouds? What has happened since their last 
approving remarks, and encouraging remarks, answer the victory of the frank and clear victory of the unjust laws. The crowd's divine that the victory of the unjust laws is bound to have bad effects on everyone. If you turn to the translation, page 195, um, the speech of the, cloud, of the chorus there, yeah? uh, read that, please. Go. But in us, the thought is strong. You will repent of this ere long. Now we wish to tell the judges all the blessings they shall gain if, as justice plainly warrants, we the worthy prize obtain. First, whenever in the season ye would fain your fields renew, all the world shall wait expectant till we pour our rain on you. Then in all of all your crops and vineyards, we will take the utmost care so that neither drought oppress them nor the heavy rain bear. <coughs> but if anyone amongst you dare to treat our claims with score, Mortal he, the clouds immortal, better had he ne'er been born. He from his estate shall gather neither corn nor oil nor wine, for whenever blossoms sparkle on the olive or the vine, they shall all at once be blighted. We will our slings, ply our slings so true that, and if ever we employ, behold him building up his mansions new, with our tight and nipping hailstones we will all his tiles destroy. But if he, his friends, or kinsfolk, should a marriage feast enjoy, all night long we'll pour, our, pour in torrents. So perchance he'll rather pray to endure the drought of Egypt than decide a miss today. In the reference to Egypt is not uninteresting because the clouds are, of course, powerless in Egypt. Egypt is watered by the Nile irrigation. Doesn't need the clouds. The clouds are powerless in Egypt, and which means turned around. The opposite of the clouds is most powerful in Egypt. In Egypt. What is that opposite to the clouds? In the simplest formula. Yeah, but that does not correspond on the moral practical level. The old, the ancient. And that is, of course, a theme which goes through Herodotus and Plato. Yeah. The most ancient thing and the most the greatest admiration for antiquity as antiquity is a form in Egypt. So you see that I mention in passing. But to come back to our point, the clouds divine that the victory of injustice is bound to effect, have effects on have bad effects on everyone. The clouds desire to win. Now, that is on two levels. As goddesses, they desire to win recognition in Athens, because now they are not recognized. As uh, representatives of the play, they desire the poet to win. That's what they speak here. But they can win only if the judges are just, as they say at the beginning. But the judges will not be just if they do not arrive profit from being just. If the clouds cannot really give all these benefits which they represent here, and, and if they don't uh, derive profit from being just through honoring the clouds, and if they do not derive harm from being unjust, i.e. from not honoring or despising the clouds, the clouds naturally presuppose it is just to honor the clouds. Yeah. It's the base of the argument. But the city of Athens intends the ancestral political and social order does not honor the clouds. Old Athens is unjust. Therefore, the clouds must sympathize with the adequate thesis, with the unjust laws. Yeah. Because the just Logos doesn't recognize the clouds as goddesses. That is, shows the difficulty in which the clouds are. The clouds cannot wish a simple victory of the old school, because that doesn't recognize them. On the other hand, a simple victory of the new school would also not be good for them, and therefore their ambiguous position, which throws also some light on the problem of justice.
One thing appears only to, to which I would emphasize, the need the cloud sea that is necessary for anyone, sooner or later, to appeal to justice. Perhaps God knows why, but that is a fact. And therefore, think, don't believe so easily in those who say justice is a mere word. So the, the issue is decided in favor of injustice, apparently. The consequence is that in the secret, Strepsiades treats his creditors with incredible impudence because he is so absolutely sure that uh, he can talk himself out of any debts. Phidippides, his son, does nothing of the kind. That's quite interesting. And the argument uh, against the creditors is not interesting. Let us turn to page, in the translation, page 200, bottom, in the yes, verse 278. Well, then, tell me, which theory do you cite that the rain falls fresh each time, or that the sun draws back the same old rain and sends it down again. Is that it? Yeah. Well, I'm very sure I either... Is that the creditor, yeah? Hmm? It's the creditor. It's going to say the creditor. Now, what does the creditor say? I'm very sure I neither know nor care. Yeah. Not care. Good heavens, and do you claim your money so I'm unenlightened in the laws of nature? Yeah, but that is not right. Uh, yeah, how, uh, how then are you right? Do you, uh, do you have the right to claim money if you know nothing of the heavenly things? Yes. If you're hard up, then pay me back the interest at least. Interest? What kind of a beast is that? Yes, the Greek word for interest, tokos, means uh, progeny, progeny. And has therefore the, a certain ambiguity which it doesn't have in English. Yeah. What else then, day by day and month by month, larger and larger, till the, still the silver grows as time sweeps by? Finally and nobly said, what then? Think you the sea is larger now than for the last year? No, surely it is no larger. It is not right that it should be. You see, it's right, yeah. Go on. And do you then, insatiable grasper, when the sea receiving all these rivers grows no larger, do you desire your silver to grow larger? Come now. You prosecute your journey off. Here, fetch the whip. And so on. In other words, you see, he is not quite stupid. He uses the rudiments of natural science which he has gained in order to prove the injustice of interstate. And someone should get, something should get bigger and bigger and bigger, so there is no natural limit to that, whereas every natural being has limit. That is quite. In this discussion with the creditors, as I say, Sophilis is incredibly impudent, but it remains unclear, because other things happen now, whether Strapsiades would have gotten away with his impudence to the creditors, in other words, whether he would have won for the civil uh, court. At this stage, uh, after uh, this incredible conduct of Strapsiades, the clouds are now absolutely opposed to Strapsiades. They know he can't bring them or anyone else any good being such a fool. Now, what is then the scene in which the whole thing culminates? To our great regret, we cannot know what would have happened uh, to the debts. Something much graver than any question of debts comes. Phidippides beats his own father. Phidippides hadn't taken any interest in winning lawsuits, in defrauding creditors, beats his own father, which according to all natural notions is a graver crime than um, uh, some minor cheating. Strepsiades is obviously shocked by this fact. He tells the story how it came to the beating that you find on the top of page uh, 204, in the middle of the speech of Strepsiades. Yeah. Um, they have a, have a controversy about uh, which poems are good or bad. And uh, Strepsiades is in favor of the old classics. 
in an old-fashioned man. And his new, his son, his, uh, how do you say, sophisticated son, is in favor of the modern Eurybius. That's the context. Now, what does he say? When he said this, my heart began to heat extremely fast, yet still I kept my passion down and said, then pretty you sing one of the, those newfangled songs with modern striplings do. And he began the shameful tale Euripides has told, how a brother and a sister lived incestuous lives of old. Then, then I could no more restrain, but first I must confess, with strong abuse I loaded him. And so, as you may guess, we stormed and bandied threat for threat, till out at last he flew and smashed and thrashed and thumped and bumped and bruised me black and blue. Yeah, that's it. So, what, in other words, a terrible thing which led to the beating of the father by the son is Euphidibides defending incest, incest of brother and sister. Satyrus abhors it. Philippides defends it. But the question is now no longer incest of brother and sister, but beating one's father. The clouds encourage Philippides to defend why he's beating the father. And then Philippides proves that a son may beat his father. He proves it to his father's satisfaction. That we must trade. Page uh, 205, remember, uh, verse 1408. Uh, Peace, I will now resume the thread where I took off. Yeah. And first I ask, when I was young, did you not strike me then? Yea, for I loved and cherished you. So solve me this again. Is it not just that I, your son, should cherish you alike and strike you? since, as you observe, to cherish means to strike. But must my body needs be scourged and pounded black and blue, and yours be scathless? Was not I as much freeborn as you? Children are whipped, and sires, and shall not sires be whipped? Perhaps you urge that children's minds alone are taught by blows. Well, age is second childhood then, that everybody knows. And as by old experience, age should guide its steps more clearly, so when they err, they surely should be punished more severely. But law goes everywhere for me. Deny it if you can. You know, as Tapsiris appeals now to the nomos, to the convention, whatever may be uh, true by or right by nature doesn't count. Convention law forbids that everywhere. What does Phidippides say? Well, was not he who made the law a man, a mortal man, as you and I, who in old times talked over all the crowd? You see, like you and me, the, the legislator, he's no authority. He may be wrong. And in addition, he lived in the old times, in the dark ages, in the benighted. So the chance that we know the truth uh, it's much better, how much better, yes? And think you that to you or me the same is not allowed to change it so that sons by blows should keep their father steady? Still, we'll be liberal, and the blows which we've received already we will forget. We'll have no ex post facto legislation. Look at the game cocks, look at all the, at all the animal creation. Do not they beat their parents? I. I say then that in fact they are as we accept that they know special laws and act. You know, they have no conventions, you know, no, no laws based on, on decision, but otherwise they are what nature is, pure nature, we see much better in the rules because they have no convention. Why don't you then, if always, where the game card leads you follow, Ascend your perch to roost at night and dirt and order swallow. The case is different there, old man, as Socrates would see. Well, then, you'll blame yourself at last if you keep striking me. How so? Why, if it's right for me to punish you, my son, you can, if you have got one, yours. Aye, 
But suppose I've none. Then having held me, you will die, while I have been flogged in vain. Good heavens. Good friends, I really think he has some reason to complain. I must concede he has put the case in quite a novel light. I really think we shouldn't be flogged unless we have the right. So, in other words, just as a unjust, as a just lovers has admitted its defeat and has gone over to the opposite camp, Strepsiades, in his own case, as a father, admits that his rebellious son is right. <clears throat> Let us consider the arguments brought forth by Phidippides. All men are by nature free. Yeah? I was born as free as you. Hence, every human being has the same right to be another human being as anyone else has. Yeah, but uh, sure, but uh, that is true, but what about father and son? That's not just two uh, chance human beings. Why does a father have the right to be his son? Because he exercises authority in the interest of the son. There's a form of caring. Beating is a part of caring. And this beating and caring are connected with the fact that the son is the child, is lacks understanding, and the father possesses understanding. Yeah, but if that is the reason, if the son is of age, has reached the age of discretion, and the father is stupid, perhaps even senile, but the same the, then the son must beat his may beat his father for the same reason. If lack of understanding is the reason of for the for the objection, old men are frequently less wise than their children, and the children should beat them. Yeah? If the only title to authority is intelligence, then the intelligent man must rule the unintelligent. Yeah? And ruling is sometimes not separable from compelling, physically compelling, and that is beating. Yeah, that's it. Then the third argument, which Phidippides brings forth in reply to his father, Strapsiades has said, yes, but there is a universal nomos, a universal law, which favors the fathers beating their children and not the other way around. Phidippides says, well, that nomos can be changed. That was made by some human legislator, a fellow like you and me. That is, doesn't impress me. But if you speak of universal law, let, let us look at the true universal law, at the law which all living beings obey. Let us look at the cocks and at the dogs and what have you. And there is the, the, the true universal law is that to which all living beings are subject. And these other li li uh, living beings beat their fathers without any hesitation. Then Strepsiades gives a reply which is not too bad. Uh, perhaps the only sensible thing he said in the news. <laughs> the man is not a brute. Yeah. After all, he, he took the example of the cocks. You don't live life like a cock. You, you differ from them in so many other respects. What does Phidippides say on this occasion? What does he say? That's crucial, because that is, uh, as I said, the only sensible thing said by Strepsiades here too. What does he say? He appeals to Socrates. Yeah, in other words, he doesn't, uh, doesn't give a reply. He defers to the authority of Socrates. So that is a point which we must keep in mind for not only today, but for every discussion of the subject, that we must consider in all such cases the specific nature of man. That was really the key point in the teaching of the revered Socrates, if I may use your phrase from last time. I mean from Plato's and Xenophon Socrates. Yeah. Yes, but what does this imply? That a reference to the nature of man as distinguished from the nature of brutes. What does it mean? There is a difference. The difference, uh, 
However, whatever the difference, however it might be defined, there is a difference about what kind of a difference. What kind of a difference? That man is stronger than the brutes or, or what? It's also a difference. For me. Yeah. That, yeah, but what kind of a difference is when you refer to reasons, this connection? You see, there are various differences. For example, there is a difference between this book. A man is capable of changing his actions. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, so you know, well, it's not a good example. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me do it very simply. What's the difference between this and this? Quantitative difference. Or difference of degree. It's one kind of difference. And so there is another kind of difference. Well, let us say essential difference. So that's, in other words, what Aristophanes implies. That doesn't spell out. That is what the later silver is spelled out, is that the, the whole case for justice cannot be made if we do not consider the essential difference between man and the brutes. And this is more generally presupposes that there are essential differences. That there are essential differences. This is a decisive step taken. The simple thing is a decisive step taken by Sokol. No one prior to Sokol spoke of essential difference. People implied them. But the very term essential difference, which everyone uses today, even our positivistic friends all the time, doesn't exist before Socrates. The discovery of the fact that there are essential differences presupposes that there are essences, whatever that may mean. And that is what the word is meant. And that is a problem to, to which Aristophanes, not understanding that properly, leads us. Except in the case where he judges uh, society, where Socrates shown as interested in man's nature in this? Not at all. No, you are perfectly correct. The Socrates was, is the, don't see the truth. They cannot see the truth. The truth is seen by the poets to which Socrates or Plato replies. If the philosophers go about it in the right way, they and they alone see the truth, and they see it better and more clearly than the poets. That is a later story. Yeah. Here we, we are still far removed from this kind of philosophy. And uh, then the last argument, fifth argument, is this. By, Stratina says, if you accept beatings from your father, you acquire the right to beat your own son. There's a kind of claim going on. But to which Phidippides replies, if I do not have a son, I have accepted the beatings from you, and I never have an object which, which I can beat. That's unfair. I shall never have the opportunity to pay back. This is good as far as it goes, but the, the really crucial argument is a fourth, which I mentioned before, to which Philippus uh, doesn't have to reply. Beating is just a form of caring. I mean, otherwise it's, otherwise it's just uh, brutality. And sons must be their fathers. Beating is an enjoyment of the beater at the expense of someone else. That's the implication of the last argument. Hence the beater Beaten must have the right to beat his son. But he'll have, if he has no son, then he must pay him back. He can't go on in the chain. He must pay back. And so that is, of course, mere fun. Now, what happens immediately thereafter? Let us read uh, what uh, happens immediately after we left off. So, to, uh, but keeps this in mind. So Theodos admits that his son was right in beating him. And uh, so the Socratic teaching, this immoral teaching, has won not only in uh, the fight of the two logoi, the two theses, but he has won again here. And now we come 
It's the last step. It's the last straw. Yes, Look to the fresh idea. <coughs> You'll be my dead thy vow. Yet then perhaps you will not grudge even what you suffer now. How? Will you make me back the blows which I've received today? Yes, or I'll beat my mother too. What? What is that you say? Why, this is worse than all. General Esabi, hear that sound. Beating the father is all right. Beating the mother is impossible. Now, what, what is that? This what? is worse than everything else. And this is the last straw. And at this moment, that alone brings about the revolt of Strepsiades. Nothing else before. So the nine of the gods, <laughs> even beating the father, okay, but beating the mother, that's unbearable. How come? I read in one commentary a suggestion which flabbergasted me. Uh, maybe that this is connected with the fact that the mother is in this particular case such a fine lady from the upper crust. And, the, and I think there is not the slightest reason to suppose that it's true because uh, uh, Sotiris has long been cured of any admiration for his upper class wife, as you have seen. So that can't, but what is in the reason? But what if, as I proved the other, by the same logic I can prove his right to beat my mother? Aye, what indeed, if this you plead, if this you think to win, why then, for all I care, you may to the accursed pit convey yourself with all your new learning, new, your master and your logic, too. You know, let me stop here. Yeah. And Stopsiris absolutely refuses even to listen to the argument supporting the assertion that the son may beat his own mother. So that, what, why is he so intransigent for the first time? When this subject comes up, he has always been open to reason up to this point. What's that? What is, what is so wrong in beating one's mother? What is not wrong in beating one's father? Well, there's a physical difference in strength, usually. Sure, but the considerations of Shiva didn't play any role in that. Well, up to this point, it didn't for them. Uh, he proved that he could beat his father because his father weaker in uh, reason. With all due respect to the fair sex, could not a mother also be inferior in understanding to her wise son? But I think this is a... a, a or a wise daughter, for that matter. I think there's a difference which Strepsiade is a course to women and, the, and he doesn't expect them to be equal. You mean he takes, he believes that they are, generally speaking, inferior intellectually to men or what? That's what I would say. You know, all the greater reason for beating the mother. Why don't you take a, a daughter and her mother and uh, let us, uh, uh, then uh, there would be the same. No, but I think he has accepted this and then uh, enshrined it anyway. Yeah, no, that won't do. What? I mean, let us go back. Why did Phidippides beat his father? Why did he come to that beat? <laughs> no, no, that was a, a reasoning later on. But why did it come to that uh, beating? What uh, disagreement between father and son led to the beating? Incest. Incest. And the incest issue was, was overlaid by the beating issue. Now the beating of the mother comes, yeah? And the beating of the mother comes up and that bring, reminds somehow, and quite rightly, of the incest issue before. If a son can beat his mother, where is the limit? May there not also be incest between mother and son? That is the point, and we must later on try to interpret it. But let us first... Let us first uh, continue the external action. At this moment, after all communication, all, all discourse between father and son has been destroyed, Strepsiades complains to the clouds that they have misled him, and they simply reject his accusation. 
They did what they did, they claim, in order to prepare Strepsiades' punishment so that he shall learn to fear the gods. He, they are rather hypocritical. He realizes that his original motive to treat his creditors was wicked. He wishes to punish Sogates for having misled him. He can't punish his lords. His son, Phidippides, however, is grateful to his teacher, Sogates, and refuses to join his father, Strepsiades, in the action of revenge which follows and which consists, as you have seen, in burning down Sogates' think tank, Frontisterio, a term now applied in vulgar language to the Center of Behavioral Studies in Palo Alto, but which is really a good little translation for the term used by uh, uh, Aristotle. The alleged main reason, now you see what a, what a crook Strepsiades is, the alleged main reason why Strepsiades burns down the think tank is that Socrates commits acts of hubris, of insolence, against the gods, or that he is unjust to the gods. Those gods whom he, Strepsiades, had sold down the river a long time ago and for whom he didn't care. He was reminded of the gods only when the peak of criminality, namely beating one's mother with its terrible implication, uh, came up. He had no objection to any injustice to the gods until he saw the consequence of that, beating one's own mother, incest with the mother, the implication. Without gods, no effective prohibition against incest. And what does this mean for the play as a whole? We have seen that the crucial thing in the fight between the two logos, the just logos and the unjust logos, was that the, the just logos could not defend itself by speech, by logos, by argument. And the, the example there was adultery. And, the, and every argument in favor of adultery presupposes that, that marriage is natural, a natural institution. We must link up this point with the end of the book. There is no logos, no reason argument which can account for this prohibition against incest and therefore which can account for the sacredness of marriage. There is an essential limitation of the logos, of reason, and therefore, uh, but that does not settle the issue. Marriage is necessary. Prohibitions against incest are necessary. But where do things necessity, how can we account for this necessity? Logos appealing to nature, to physics, cannot account for that. Let me first try to give a summary of the, of the play. Of, I mean, the, main, the points most important for our purpose. First, what is Sogaret's position and what light does it throw on the origin of political science, our theme here? Socrates is not the Socrates we know from Plato and Xenophon. He is a pre-Socratic, a student of nature in the of nature. And this implies that he is guided by the distinction between nature and the merely conventional, the merely arbitrarily established by men, nomos. And from this it follows that he has no interest in political things as such, because political things are all based on nomos, on human arrangements which could also be different. The only interest which Sugaris, this Sugaris can have in political things is to use the political things, such as law courts, for the purpose of what is 
prime nature. The individual human being is a natural being. The use he can make of the political things is rhetoric. Therefore, rhetoric is identical with political science. That's the phrase which Aristotle Arist- uses toward the end of his Nicomachean ethics, that the sophists had practically identified political science with rhetoric. That is the deepest reason for it. If all political things are conventional, if they have the cognitive status of stamps, yeah, no serious adult would devote his life to the study of political things. I mean, you can do it as a hobby, and like as you can collect stamps, but not more. But still, you can uh, you uh, uh, can make some use of them for your benefit as a natural being, as a Now, this Socratic position is opposed to the old opinion, which is characterized by piety, moderation or sense of shame, and silent deed. The new education, akin to Socrates' teaching, is caressed by hubris, no fear of the gods, obeying nature, which in itself means dissoluteness, follow one's inclination, and cleverness in talk. Nothing is sacred since nothing sacred can withstand logos, the examination in the light of nature. The polis city has its base in the family, in the oikos. And what is the basis of the family? That's the theme here. And a taboo, to use a modern term a taboo which cannot be justified, which is just there. But could one not say that man needs the police even if he does not need the family? Is not man so constituted that he cannot live except in society? Even if it were true that he does not need the family, there is one great work which all of you have read, I am sure, which proposes this thesis. Man needs the police, but not the family. Do you know what do you do? The Republic, that's a simple, obvious theme of the Republic. Man by his nature so constituted that he needs the police, but not the family, the family is a body. You see how close the themes of Plato are to those of Aristotle. And uh, needless to say that this is not Plato's last word on the family, because when Plato spoke practically on the subject, namely his laws, but Plato in the public Plato discusses theoretically the problem of human society, and there he busts the case wide open, and he's not afraid of very shocking things in order to say. But still, so, but what about the policy? Men must cooperate with, with one another if they are to live well. They are in need of exchange of goods and services, as no one can deny. But w- once you have such, uh, admit such an exchange, the need of such exchange, you must insist on that exchange being fair. People would stop exchanging goods and services if they knew all the time that they would always be cheated. Part of that is the law punishing men for defrauding their creditors. That's part of that simple fairness. So that it would seem to be a good basis for justice. But what is the difficulty here? You see, they were very tough and did not leave one stone unturned. So why is not Socrates, Aristotle and Socrates, compelled to admit the necessity of justice, since he cannot possibly deny the need for human living together, for human exchange, and therewith for justice? What's the difficulty here? It is a very terrible thing, but it must be said. 
Uh, and it's also necessary to say to show the essential deficiencies of all utilitarian art, because that is a simple utilitarian art. The fact that men must live in society and exchange good and service, and therefore have a certain form of justice, does not imply that everyone be just. Does not, do we not have wonderful exchange of good and service, and though there is a lot of crime going on? We take that in our strides, can afford it. Even a smaller and poorer society can afford some of this kind. A certain amount of clever injustice, of injustice which is invisible to the law courts and even to everyone else, is not destructive of the police. Therefore, the practical question is, for the individual, will you be one of those privileged guys who can exploit the police for his own selfish purposes, or will you be one of those average fellows who simply have to be just? The problem is just, as you know, in the, the public at the beginning, especially when Glaucon describes this possibility of a man who is invisible, I can do what he wants, you know, and that, that's the problem. You see how the problems of Plato and the problems of Aristotle are the same. So the Socratic position is presented by Aristophanes, which is not the position of Socrates as we know from Plato, truly implies a denial of the essential necessity of justice. Now let us see what Aristophanes' critique means. What is, I mean, there is a message of the play as a whole, a very simple one, which everyone looking at it or reading it will see immediately. Well, what is it? I mean, Sugarness has a teaching which is Im irrefutable, which is stronger than any other teaching, any other post teaching. Well, what happens? What happens? His teaching is so is strong, stronger than the other. And he was not strong, huh? Yes. The result of his teaching is to destroy uh, the well, the polis, that is, it destroys the regulations of the community, fuck, yeah, but that's... which would forbid uh Stratides from burning down the think tank. Yeah. And let us think um, uh, let us uh, stick only to a part of what you said. The doxa, the opinion of Strapsalis, in this case, is stronger than Socrates' logos. That is so. This, Socrates is defeated, is defeated. But this brings up another question, and I hope I will take care of what the other part of your statement, if not, you remind me of it then. Does this mean that Socrates is a wicked man? And that is, after all, the first impression one gets from reading the play. Does Aristophanes attack Socrates as an enemy of the polis and hence as an enemy of the human race? Socrates is defeated not by the polis, but by strepsiades. Not a legal action, strepsiades does it. The character of strepsiades shows the limits both of Socrates' effectiveness and of Socrates being and being a danger and being himself in danger. Socrates has no effect on anyone except these starvelings who look at the stars together with him. The only non-cognitive man, non-philosopher, non-scientist, whatever you call it, whom he affects is Strepsiades, no one else. Strepsiades is a fairly innocuous crook. And it is an accident that he comes into connection with Socrates, and the accident is due to his in-between position between the upper and lower class, which may partly explain his unusual indulgence to his son. Only people like Strepsiades, this rather abnormal type of citizen, can possibly be corrupted by Socrates. One little implication in passing, not types like Azibayas, not types like Azibayas. It's very interesting that he's such a, a 
simple tongue. Not, you know, later in the accusation against Sugaris, much was made of what Sugaris did to Alcibiades. Of course, Alcibiades was still very young at that time, that's true. Sugaris' doctrine destroys not the polis. Polis is strong and firm. It destroys him, Sugaris. Sugaris' vice is not injustice, which has to do with greed, but lack of understanding that Sugaris is in a way a fool in spite of his very great cleverness in measuring the jumping of fleas and in observing the motions of the stars that you know sometimes even today you will see famous natural scientists who are amazing and clever in their scientific work and then they sometimes step out and make pronouncements on political matters and so, and there they are not so impressive, to put in mind. This is an old story, by no means uh, limited to modern time. So it is lacks prudence in the full sense of the word, practical wisdom. He lacks self-knowledge. He does not know, he's unaware of the context in which he operates his think tank. He's extremely short-sighted. He's a plaything of forces which he does not comprehend and not control. Presented here by the clouds. The clouds are not defeated. The clouds are very clever. They want to enter heaven and to be worshipped by heaven. There is only one little entering wedge, and that is so that is the fellow who dares, the innovator, who might, uh, who is willing to worship new gods. So they bet on Socrates, but they are prudent. In the moment they see that Socrates' lack of understanding in cooperation with Shakespeare's lack of understanding is going to compromise the case of the, cloud, uh, the clouds, they switch sides. They come up as defenders of the police. They are sitting pretty. So what is it? We can also, um, we must also mention the following point. <clears throat> Socrates, Aristoteles Socrates, does not distinguish between the accidental and local laws, yeah, which are really uh, rather arbitrary, and a law obeyed by all men, the universal. A law which all human beings, or at least all civilized human beings, comply with, is somehow natural, somehow based on man's nature. Man's nature, the essential difference between men and brutes, is not considered by Socrates. I mentioned one point in conclusion of this day. What is to understand better the whole thing? Sophias and Sugaris have something in common, naturally, otherwise they could not cooperate. And this was identified at one point of the play as parsimony, but an ambiguous parsimony because uh, it means indifference in the case of Sugaris and greed in the case of Sophias. Now let us look a bit more close and uh, let us look somewhat more closely at Sophias. <coughs> What is his motive? What is his, uh, Strapsiris' ultimate motive? What sets the whole thing, what uh, um, uh, causes the whole movement? What is his ultimate motive? Yeah. Preservation of his own. That is very good. It is too good for my present purpose. Now, I mean, uh, first, obviously, he's in debt. But what is behind uh, the debt? He's love of his son, yeah, love of his son. And he doesn't love his wife. I mean, that's, the silence uh, is very uh, clear, and the references to the wife are, do not show any love. But he loves his son, and that goes through his whole life. This love is not required. As you put it, what his motivation is love of his own, his son as love of his own. 
one can say the father and his son have nothing in common except that Strepsiades is a father of Phidippides. Strepsiades doesn't admire Phidippides because of his horsemanship, because of the elegant company he keeps, and so on and so on and so on. But what is decisive for him is this is my son, yeah. his own, nothing else. This is, one could say, a natural design which all broods have too. The tigress fights for her cups as much as the human. Now this natural love for his son as his own brings him into debt, into injustice, into impiety, and so on and so on, and it culminates in this atrocious suggestion <coughs> of his son that he may beat his own mother, you remember. Confronted with this possibility, Strepsiades indulgence to his son ceases. Why? He grants his son everything, everything, even that he may beat him, but not that he may beat the mother with the implication of incest. The prohibition against incest is the basis of his own, Strepsiades and any other man's own in this sense. Why? The sacredness of the family is indispensable in principle for the no, for, for Strepsiades is knowing that Phidippides is his son. Strepsiades is natural love for his son as his own presupposes ultimately nomos, the law. And therefore his whole life is based on a self-contradiction. Socrates, who is presented there as uh, without any love of any of his own, as you see, I mean, there's no, 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 no allusion to his seven children, that's, that's different. I think that is um, ultimate, uh, the base of the difficulty of Strepsiades. The question is, uh, of, to which we do not get it now, now why does Aristophanes defend family and the polis? Here he shows only that the defense by means of logos is not possible. Must be some other form of defense. That is the reason why we will turn, not now, unfortunately, but next time, to the birds. Because the birds deal with the same problem as you have seen that. Yeah? The birds deal with the same problem. Have you seen it? There is a great variety of opinion as to what the birds deal with. That's one. Yeah, that is all this. Uh, I don't believe there is a great variety of opinions. I think, as far as I know the literature, there is one absolute preponderant opinion which tries to say that it is linked up with a certain political situation in Athens. Yeah? Well, there are at least two variations of that. What would you say? Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps you present us, we, we go to, but I can only say, what my impression is for some time, that the, that the birds deal with the interesting proposition to have a polis erected on the basis of Socrates. I mean, of Socrates' teaching. Let us see, I mean, we will discuss that. And, and don't, don't give in to me in any way, of course, follow your own understanding. But it, it, the, the theme of incest, beating the father, is written very large, as you must have seen. Yes, but the connection between the incest theme in the birds and in the clouds is a little bit obscure. Yeah, well, we must try to, to make it clear. Now, is there any point uh, you would like to bring up now a few minutes after that? Yes, again. Uh, are you suggesting that the reason the clouds don't put out the fire is because they change size? 
You're sure they have changed that before, before, right? They have changed, I mean, the first sign of the change of size occurs after the victory of the unjust laws. And that is connected to, is they are practical beings. They know that uh, if, uh, if justice is simply rejected, uh, that's bad for everyone. And uh, that's they know. Yeah. Mr. Johnson. The birds were uh, 421 or 22 or something. Uh, the, the crowds. The birds were uh, after 413. No, he must be older than that. Because if this was the case, it would seem it's kind of a strange criticism from a man so young or someone who starts out No, this was not. I, I, I don't know now the extent the, the, what is supposed to be the date of birth of Aristophanes, but I would assume of him that there was no greater difference in about 10 years in the age. And uh, some people are, how should I say, very mature at a very early age. We have some uh, examples in maybe in, in modern times of They have there's no difficulty in that. Yeah, that I think yeah, well, we must try to, uh, but uh, of course we cannot become entangled uh, in the question of Aristophanes' own position because then we would have to read all the 11 plays and uh, that is absolutely impossible. Uh, we, we read it only in, with the view to the understanding of what Socrates said, revered Socrates, stands for. And here uh, the statements of Aristophanes are particularly valuable. One could as well read to see this history, for example, yeah. to see this history for understanding the pre-Socratic thinking about society. But Aristophanes has a great advantage that so he speaks of Socrates himself, you know, so we get a first, an earlier version of Socrates' teaching itself. And, and in addition, uh, I think that there is no writer of this epoch, of the classic Athenian epoch, who was used so much by Plato as Aristotle. The, one cannot understand the subtleties, and the most important subtleties of Plato's Republic, without uh, having studied Aristophanes. There is one way which we cannot read for the simple reason that's not available in the selection. And that's the assembly of women, which is quite clearly the model for Plato's Republic. It's the same theme, communism, and uh, uh, equality of the sexes, as a matter of fact, in their preponderance of the female sex, but abolition of the family, that is uh, all there, and uh, there are literal agreements between the Plato's Republic and the assembly of women, and so on. We can't do that. Uh, because we, we must uh, get some notion of what uh, uh, Socrates uh, or Plato stand for. Uh, is there any other point you would like to make, Mr. Uh, Kendrick? Well, why did the beginning of the college mention the Prodigies? It's also a wonderful name. That seems to be so, that of all these famous sophists, I mean, the most famous of them were Prodigies, Protagoras and Hippias. You see, one must make a distinction between the teachers of rhetoric and the sophists. That is not the same. For example, Thrasymachus is a, is a rhetorician. Gorgias, and the Gorgias is a rhetorician. That's not quite the same as sophists. But the, almost, the three most famous sophists in Soviet time were the Protagoras, Prodigoras, and Hippias. And Hippias was the most stupid of them. And Prodicus apparently was the one whom Socrates respected most highly. That we know also from other sources. There was some connection. 
so far as uh, well, he is frequently ridiculed, uh, but he is uh, uh, surely in, in Plato, but he is much less ridiculed than the others. So there must have been some connection between Sovaris and Prodicus. Uh, and there is also some reference uh, to that in one of the in one of the dialogues, I forgot in which, that there was some connection with the two. But Prodicus was apparently uh, was sensible. Prodicus special preoccupation was correctness of words, you see, and uh, that's also alluded to here, yeah. in the clouds, you know. I was wondering if there was any connection between uh, the choice of Heracles for the Prodicus was famous for the Yeah, that is Prodicus, yeah. Uh, speech of here. In which way? The choice of Prodicus as it were being on and coming, a substitute for the choice of Heracles. I don't get it. And well, for those who do not know as much as Mr. Kennedy knows, I would like to say the choice of Heracles, that's a story told by Sogades in Xenophon's memorabilia, where Sogades presents the case of for virtue in the form of a story of the choice of virtue by Heracles. Yeah? And this goes back to Prodicus. I think there is a reference to Prodicus there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Prodicus. Now, all right, but I don't see... I mean, Heracles uh, is, chooses virtue against vice. Yeah? And what does Phidippides do? Well, he chooses the university. I see. Uh -huh. In other words, that would be Xenophon's reply, that Sogades teaches just the opposite is what uh, he's made to teach. Yeah, that makes some sense. Yeah, but there is a more... Also the reference to Heracles. To the, use, the use of Heracles in the unjust speech seems to point of that connection. That's possible, yeah. But there is a more obvious connection, and that is that in Xenophon's Economicus, the hero, the perfect gentleman incarnate, his commonplace, uses literal a verse from the clouds, something which Phidippides says in the clouds, you know, roll the horse and bring it home, bring it home, yeah? Literally. Sure, there are some connections, it's not bad. Plato and Aristotle, surely, very generally speaking, and very, in fact, that is very general and very simple, is this, that Plato and Xenophon turn it around. Socrates, so far from being a defender of the unjust speech, was the first to set forth the virtues of just speech. Yeah? But that is a bit too simple because, as I indicated last time, the case for rational morality which Sogares makes is not a case simply for traditional morality. Certain things are changed. Yeah? Certain things are changed. And not because Sogares was a wicked man, but, but there is a problem in traditional morality. So, next time we will hear your paper and Miss Hill. Marx, beginning with your reference to God, you retracted what you had said in the first part. But uh, that is perfectly intelligible. You, you simply are doubtful. You are attracted by the Polygian interpretation, but you are also doubtful whether it works. I do not blame you for that. Uh, and it will certainly not dispense me from a brief discussion of this over issue. You have said there has always been the tendency to present Aristophanes as a political player. Always. What does that mean? Since Aristophanes' time, or since the early 19th century, as far as my knowledge goes, since the early 20th century. And that is, uh, uh, gives the whole thing a different complexion. It has something to do with tendencies in the 19th and 20th century, peculiar to these centuries, to put this emphasis on the political. Now, on the other hand, if you, one says instead of political, a playwright, one does not necessarily improve the situation because what is a playwright? A playwright today and a playwright in uh, the fourth or fifth century is an, uh, uh, is an entirely different thing. And one would have to know what, raise the question, what is a play? What is a drama? 
what is a comedy in particular. I will turn to that later. You, uh, in the first part of your speech, you said the, the political place and political in the narrow sense, topical uh, affairs of the moment, in all ten plays, with the exception of the birds. That's, of course, not true. What about the Plutos? What about the assembly of women? What about the clouds? What about the testimony for your Sousa? That is not so. Allusions to contemporary things occur everywhere, even in the birds, as we have seen in the Salaminia. Yeah? I was speaking rather fast, uh, and possibly I said what I did not mean to say, but I did not mean political in the narrow sense of allusions to contemporary events. I meant, I believe I said specifically political or social, or political in the sense that it was used in Greece, meaning social. And I think on that but basis, what is, excuse me, if that is not contemporary politics as a Sicilian expedition in 414, I don't know what it is. I'm sorry, I didn't understand. I mean, you, you, you try to link up between the birds and the Sicilian expedition. That is surely contemporary politics at that time. Yes. So this is what I meant. I mean, what does political mean if it is not political as contemporary politics? Then you would have to say a, a very, a very, for example, historical thing. When Shakespeare writes his history, uh, he presents a political problem in a way which has no immediate, or at least not immediately visible connection with the contemporary politics of Elizabeth and, and uh, James. I would prefer the comparison not to Shakespeare, but to say Bernard Shaw, who uh, does not necessarily refer to immediate yeah, but the contemporary okay. events. But uh, just the same, I think, can be called a political playwright. Uh, perhaps, I don't know. Uh, but uh, that something is surely to, uh, true in the case of, of uh, uh, Shaw. But uh, the, I would like to come to a broader issue. Now, when you say the parabas is, uh, the birds, is non-political, and nowhere else, that's not true. It's the clouds, for example, as we have seen, is entirely non-political. <laughs> I mean, I don't think I said all the others were political. Uh, not all of them are. I think yeah. only about four or five of them are political. Well, all I meant to say was that in this case, this is surely not political. Yeah, but the, also, the clouds and the Tesmorchus for your suicide and the Christian suicide and the Plutus are as surely that simple as not political. One point I would like to mention only immediately. Whatever may be difficult regarding the, the name of that city founded in the birds, it surely has a connection to clouds. Arasunis wrote a play called The Clouds, which would already indicate that there might be some connection there, to say nothing of other considerations. But let me put the question of a broader basis. I said there is a general tendency of critics in the 19th and 20th century to emphasize the political character of the place is connected with the, with the spirit of the 19th and 20th century, with a prevalent spirit, a prejudice which we can call for a political prejudice and which finds its most well-known expression in Marxism, that you have to understand a, a, a work of poetry ultimately, and that alone can give you a true understanding, in terms of the political social problems of the time. And we have seen traces of that, and this is of course not limited to Marxism, but only Marxism is the most uh, well-known and extreme form of that. For example, the emphasis which people put in the interpretation of Plato's political works, the laws and the republic, on his affairs in literature. There was were centuries, millennia of Platonic interpretation, and no one had paid any attention to Plato's affair in Syracuse. In the 1920th century, the Syracusan affair became so famous that it overshadowed the substantive issues of the Platonic dialogue. I'm sure that one can understand the Republic and the laws as a whole without any difficulty, without even thinking of Plato's 
adventure or misadventures in, in Syracuse. When Plato, who after all was interested in politics as we know, presented Aristophanes in one of his play, in, in, of his uh, dialogues in the banquet, there is hardly any allusion to Aristophanes as a man being concerned with politics, much less than other characters he presented there, like Bosanius. So that Aristophanes, I mean, there is to begin with no extraneous evidence at any rate in favor of the view that Aristophanes should be emphatically political. Surely, politics occurs everywhere, but the question is why? The safest thing to start from is that Aristophanes' verbs are all comments. No one can deny that. Now, what is the, the, what is the purpose of comedy? According to what Aristophanes himself says, now he says that the poet should make man, the citizen, just, and be a teacher of justice. But that would apply, of course, to every dramatic poet. That's not characteristic of the comic poet. What is a comic poet to do in addition to be a teacher of justice? I think everyone of knows that, but I want someone of you to say it. What is a comedy a comic poet supposed to do today and at all times? And uh, we have Aristophanian evidence to this effect, that he wants to bring about this well-known effect of comedy. <laughs> Make people laugh. True. So ridiculous as ridiculous is the theme of comedy. Now then, of course, the long question arises, what is the ridiculous? Now let me take a slight roundabout way. Ridiculous means very different things for different people. You know that very crude and vulgar people find laughable things, which, which more than refined people do not find laughable at all, and vice versa. Now what, uh, if we take now the two extremes, <coughs> the grossly ridiculous and the subtly ridiculous, what is the primary theme of the comedy as, Aristot as Aristophanes meant it? The grossly ridiculous or the subtly ridiculous? The primary theme, the most obvious. The most grossly um, the grossly ridiculous. Sure. Because it's after all a popular presentation where is a, uh, where all males, at least, could be present. Sure. So the grossly common, the indecently common. Now, indecency is in Greece as well as in our time, on all, at all times, has to show itself in, um, has to do with, with sex, but not only with sex strictly understood, but also with other affairs of the body which are not mentioned in decent society, which have to do with the digestive process to which many references uh, are made in terms of a comedy. But then there is something else which, uh, again, I appeal to a common experience. I made this experience first in another country, but I believe you could make this experience also in this country. And the ladies must forgive me for the slight indelicacy of this story, but it is really not unimportant. There is a very vulgar place where people of the male sex express indecencies. And these are public toilets. Now, in public toilets, you find two forms of indecency most common, at least in another country. But I believe uh, in uh, given conditions, it could also be in this country. First, of course, cross-sexual indecency. But the second, that's much more interesting, political obscenity. Political obscenity. In Germany, where I had the occasion to observe this, you saw all the in inscriptions you found in such places where either Nazis or communists, never of the respectable classes. And the reason had to do, the and you know in, in our present uh, language, we, you speak also of political obscenity. That is not a bad usage, it indicates something. What Aristophanes stands for politically was, of course, the view, politically, it was, of course, the view of the nice people, of the gentlemen. There's no question about that. It's, you know, the, the squires. But this was the unorthodox politics in Athens at that time. This was not 
Yeah, I mean, all the leading men, the famous men, Pericles, Cleon, and Lachman, and Amachos, whoever they may be, uh, even Nietzsche, yes, they, so that the respected men in the foreground, they were all ridiculed, and, and in a way in which they could not well be attacked outside of this privileged sphere of the comic stage. But that is still much to now. Bodily obscenity, so to extend it beyond sex, that's one kind. But the bodily ridiculous, that's one. The politically ridiculous is another. But that is, there are at least two other great themes which characterized all Aristophanian comedies, apart from politics and sex. There are two other themes which are treated with in an indecent, in an in a ridiculous manner. Yes. Religion. The gods. The, yeah, the gods. Blasphemy goes through the whole place. And blasphemy is another form of obscenity, of indecency. And then there is a fourth subject, which is treated to some extent improperly indecently. And we had a good example last time. We will also see some specimens of that in poems, specimens of that in the birds. But there is also an other play across the indecent play, by the way, the Tesmophoria Susa. I don't know how to translate that title, in which Eurybius is presented in the most ridiculous fashion. Let us call it, using a word used, employed by Aristotle himself, wisdom. Wisdom, and of course, wisdom has various forms. There is this kind, of, this kind of wisdom which is represented by Socrates. There is also the wisdom of the poets. And what Aristophanes presents especially is, in the Testament of Fusa, for example, the wisdom of, of Euripides. Now, to mention just one point, externally, and at first glance, Euripides is for the old fashion, in favor of the old fashion. And Euripides is a new kind of poet. And the opposite number is Aeschylus. You know, the venerable poet of the Persians and so on and so on. And there is a play in which Aristophanes presents a contest between Aeschylus and, and Euripides, which ends in favor externally, in its action, in favor of Aeschylus against Euripides but on a purely external political ground. Who is willing to accept Alcibiades, Euripides and Aeschylus? And only Aeschylus is willing to accept it, and so he gets a prize. Not on grounds of superiority of his poetry. There is one third great tragic poet who does not enter the contest at all, and that is the noblest of them, Sophocles. And Aeschylus talks like Billingsgate, and so does Euripides. In other words, they are all, Aeschylus too is presented indecently. The only one who could not be presented indecently was Sophocles. That's a compliment to Sophocles. So uh, the general formula is, uh, I mean, the word indecent is a bit harsh, and I'm sure retracted. But I have to use it. So the theme of Aristophanes is the ridiculous. And the ridiculous in the most important and most powerful uh, forms, and these are the three, four things which I've mentioned. One could go into that and should go into that more deeply and see how these the four themes which I mentioned, politics, sex, gods, and wisdom, are connected one another. Uh, that, uh, that would be a true understanding of Aristotle, but if one would succeed in understanding their intrinsic relation, then one would have understood the Aristophanian comedy. Uh, you see, the problem of the Aristophanian comedy is quite different from that of the Shakespearean comedy, or that of Moliere, or Plautus, or whatever you might think of, but this is surely the problem. The political plays a part, and a very important part, because it is as massive and as massively obvious to everyone as sex.
but to say it is more important to the Japanese comedy than, quote, sex, unquote, would be wrong. And one would have to understand this relation and what we have been discussing last time in this, is this question of beating the father, which is a very a relatively decent way of putting the question of the foundation of the family, of the foundation of the household, the question of incest, which is, obvious, which is the point where obviously the police and its laws meet with that institution which has a primary purpose of procreation. Now, this much uh, in order to indicate the general approach, which I believe is absolutely necessary. Surely one must be aware of any generalization. One cannot possibly start from a general notion of comedy, of which one does not know whether it is applicable to Aristophanes. One has to find this, to listen uh, to Aristophanes himself. And Aristophanes, in contradistinction to the tragic poets, speaks in the parabasis in his own name. And so we have it really straight from the horse's mouth. What does he want to do? And there are two claims, or three claims, which come up all the time. One is the teacher of justice. B, to make people laugh. And three, that he has novelties, what now would be called creative that he has a conceit, a new conceit, conjecture, which nobody had before. And that is the basis for the beginning of any possible understanding. Before we um, turn to the birds, I would like to say a few more words about the clouds, which I believe will help a bit for the understanding of the birds. I remind you of the main point. A man is made aware of the badness of injustice or impiety in the clouds. We have to raise two questions. First, what kind of a man, or what is the motive of his injustice, and B, how is he made aware of the badness of it? Now, this man is Strepsiades, and his chief concern is love of his son as his own. And this love of his son is stronger than his love of right or justice or his love of the police, because right and justice and police are, in a way, the equivalence. There is a difficulty, because the police demands subordination of one's own, of love of one's own, to the love of the common, of the koinon, of the common. Even the sacrifice of one's own to the common. The clearest case, of course, is war. This very difficult story in Genesis about Abraham and Isaac, where a man is commanded to sacrifice his only son whom he loves. And this is a very difficult and profound story. But a part, if you purely humanly speaking, part of the story is the problem of the community and the individual, which demands that of every father who has son in the war. And only if the Bible brings this problem back to the most radical formulation. But good. Now, this love of one's own by itself, taken merely by itself, would lead to unconcern with right or justice. And it leads, therefore, to a questioning of justice, and this is brought out by the discussion between the just and unjust speech, in which the weakness of the just speech is revealed. The ultimate consequence of this te tendency is the acceptance of the son beating his father and his mother, and more radically stated, of incest. But this would render impossible that a man could say of a younger man, he is my son. So Strepsiades' own and love of his own is itself somehow based on the polis, on the nomos, on the law, which he contradicts. Strepsiades would not contradict himself if he did not respect the prohibition against incest. 
he would not have gotten, gotten into trouble into trouble if he had acted like his own son Pidipides, who did not have a son. Do you remember that? And did, or did not and did not passionately love his son. So Pidipides remains consistent after his conversion. Strepsiades cannot remain. The crucial question then is what precisely constitutes the weakness of the case for justice. Answer, in the first place, a contradiction between the rules of justice and the conduct of the guardian of justice, Zeus. You remember? Zeus binds his father. Zeus commits adultery, things which he forbids to me. Yeah. That, what do you say to this argument? One could say, well, some people would perhaps say, oh, well, it's very Greek myth. And therefore, Greek morality had the great misfortune of being built on myths which contradicted Greek morality. But what is the root of What is the reason in the myths? Were these myths mere brutal facts of Greek life? Was there not some human thought invested in these myths? Now, if we assume that, we see immediately what the reason is. The guardian of right. The founder of the order of right is not subject to the right which he founds. The problem is which you are all familiar in a much more restricted form from the modern doctrine of sovereignty. The ultimate maker of the law can also unmake the laws. The founder cannot be subject to his normals, to his law, and therefore Though subject to the law, can only obey the legislator. They must not think of imitating the legislator. If we return to the language of myth, men must obey the gods, but must not imitate the gods. That is one point which we see. But the whole argument up to this point makes is based on one presupposition. The rules in question, let us simply say it's a provision against incest and all is implicated, that they are merely by virtue of law, by virtue of establishment, by virtue of say so. But is the family, the oikos, which stands in force by the prohibition against incest, not manifestly natural or rational? That's the question. Now, what is implied in the argument of Socrates or his unjust logos regarding the natural character of the family? What's implied? Or if you want to take a simpler example of beating one's father, you, it would appear there. Is it not so that a society stands and falls by paternal or at least parental authority, bringing up the children who are completely unable to take care of themselves, who do not know right and wrong, black and white, left and right? Well, let us again look at the Bible, because the fundamental problems are, of course, all the same there. And let us look at incest in the Bible. Do you, do you remember some, some stories of incest there? How is the procreation of the human race possible in the early age, assuming that all men descend, descend from one and the same couple, except by incest at least between brothers and sisters? So then only of the story of Lot Lot and his daughters and so. Think also of the story of Oedipus in Greece. What, I mean, you remember the story. What would be our moral judgment about Oedipus if we were suddenly confronted with such a case in our world? Who would say he's blameless? That was a chance. And? That he was blameless. Why? Chance. Yeah, but more, more, more precisely. Why is it named? Well, that's uh, that's the rule of thieves, but not. No, no. I mean, why would we say Oedipus is blameless? He does not know. He did not know. 
Yeah, but the, 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 the deeper implication of the myth is, of course, it is incest is a terrible violation of a sacred order, regardless of whether you know or not. That is the point. And there is something behind it that this has, is by itself, terrible sanctions. For example, the offspring must be terrible. Now look at look at the offspring of Oedipus and Jocaste. There is at least one exception to that rule. At least one. I think there are two. But if Antigone is not a noble woman, I don't know who she is. And even her sister is many. So there's a problem. What is the basis of the prohibition against incest? Is this a rule which is universally valid? Universally valid. And the mere fact that it depends on knowledge is a very brave point. The conclusion, we cannot say much more because Aristophanes in the clouds leaves it at a few indications. The foundation of the policy is a household. And the foundation of the household is the prohibition against incest. This is a sacred prohibition, not a utilitarian rule. And this sacred foundation of all society cannot be defended by the logos. There is a conflict then between the polis and the logos. Now, this season itself is today trivial. It is only usually not brought out, but it is implied in what you learn in almost all classes in this building. How would people call today such things as prohibitions against incest or uh, beating one's father and uh, similar things? Convention. The convention they rarely say today. They had this. But taboos. Taboo is a more, yeah, from the big logic. But uh, they, I think the two the terms which would invariably occur in such a discussion would be myths or values. Now, what does uh, uh, official social science teach regarding myths or values? That every society stands or falls by a value system or by a basic myth and that this value system or myth cannot be defended rationally. I mean, every defense would be merely ideological. It can only be accepted or rejected, but it is not subject to rational validation. So this premise is really very well known today. The most, I mean, a simple reader, and we all must always return to the stage of simple reader if we want to understand such a word. What if I limit myself entirely to Strepsiades now? Strepsiades ought to have loved justice and the police more than his son. That is what we all would say, I think, as decent people. But still, why? This question must be permitted in the classroom, if not in the marketplace. Why should he have loved justice and the police more than his son? Uh, the love of his son was ultimately dependent on justice, according to the plan. Yeah, because the police, we can say, is a condition of his son. He could not have a son, a sick son, without the police. Yeah, but that is, of course, not is precise enough because the heir also is a condition of his son. And one can't say a man should love the heir more than his son. So it we must be more precise. The, the policy is a condition in a much more important it's much more than a mere condition. Yes? The policy is um, a condition which would not be present if men didn't somehow rather work to preserve it. Which is not true of the air as a condition. Yeah. And therefore, it's more important that men love the police because if they didn't, it would be destroyed, whereas this isn't true of the other condition. That is good. But I think that but it is a tiny little bit too analytical for me now, although keep it in mind. 
What comes first to sight uh, on prior and analysis is the connection between the police and right or justice. A Strapsilis ought to have loved the police more than his son because the police is the embodiment of right or justice. That is a higher claim of the police. All human dignity depends on political society. That is, the one can say, that is elementary. The whole argument of Plato has presupposed at every point. Here a question arises, which we as theoretical men are compelled to raise. Is this true? Is the point the embodiment of right? In the moment we raise this question, we understand the beginning of the birds. Because at the beginning of the birds, we see two Athenians leaving Athens because Athens is not the embodiment of justice. Provisionally, before uh, going into any details, we can say two Athenians leave Athens in quest for a just city, for a city which is truly an embodiment. That is the same problem as in the Republic, as you know. They seek justice, and they know that justice is has its home in a polis, can be seen more clearly in the polis than in the individual. All right, they are in a polis. Look at Athens. No, no. Athens that is, has many flaws. Sparta, even Sparta has many flaws. And any city of which they know has many flaws. So they have to found a just city to see how a just city looks like. Something of this kind is implied in the birth. But now let us turn to the birth itself. Two Athenians, one is called Euelpides and the other is called Pisteteros. Euelpides, that is derived from the words uh, men of good hope, the men of good hope. And Pisteteros is from the reliable comrade the library company, something of this kind. Follow two birds. To follow birds means, of course, in Greek, also, same word, obey two birds. You see, it begins, really, as the play opens with the rule of birds. Birds were famous omina. You did what the birds told you to do. So it begins with the rule of the birds already. And they are on the quest for a human being who has become a bird. They run away from the city of Athens, which makes life unbearable because of the constant lawsuits, the, a theme which uh, we will find also in the West from a different point of view. And they seek a place where they can live quietly. A, a, a city which is not a busybody, a city of busybodies. By the way, you see here also some connection with the Republic, because in the Republic the definition of justice given there, justice means minding one's own business. That is only a different formulation for being not a busybody in ordinary language. A man who is minding his own business, he is the opposite of a busybody. So they seek a city uh, which is not a busy body. And they don't know whether that such a city exists. But they think they can find out the location of it from this man who has become a bird, Terius. Why such a man, such a creature, now a bird, once a human being? Because being a bird and flying around all countries, he might have seen it from above a kind of area of reconnaissance, you see. And since he is of human origin, he will understand these humans, so that he's chosen with absolute sensibility. Having almost despaired of finding their way, they discover that they have arrived at the place where Terrius lives. What first comes to sight is a servant bird of Terrius, of uh, a slave bird. And that's strange, because uh, we will see there are no slaves there. Well, and we hear immediately that he, this fellow 
has a slave bird only as a relic from his human life. This was his human slave in his human day. The birds have no slaves. Once they see this strange bird, they get frightened and they let their birds escape. So they can't find their way back. The way back to civilization is closed. They have to find a way to live where they have a lifetime. Let us turn to verse 85 following, which is on page three, page eight of the translation. Go on. Oh dear, oh dear, my heart went good and my dog's gone too. Gone? Oh, you coward, you. You let him go. So this, is this the point? Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, didn't you fall down and let your crow go? No, I didn't. No. Where is she then? She flew, she flew away herself. You didn't let her go? You're a brave boy. Yeah, no, but let, no, this little uh, interlude is not uninteresting. They did exactly the same thing. Out of fear, they let them fly. But they put different constructions on the same action. Who is cleverer of the two fellows, from a very simple point of view? Pistideros or Uelpides? Yeah, sure. Now that is the first indication that he is a hero, you see. At this point, he is cleverer. And the first indication. Now, uh, Tyrios, this, um, uh, the, uh, the hoopoe, uh, has become completely a bird now. And there is this passage also we should read on uh, page 9, bottom, in the translation. They are asked, what do they come? And they, uh, they are human beings, of course, There's, uh, the two men from Athens. No? Go on. You were a man at first, as we are now, and had your creditors, as we have now, and loved to shirk your debts, as we do now. And then you changed your nature and became a bird, and flew round land and sea, and know all that men feel, and all that birds feel too. That's why we are come as suppliants here, to ask if you can tell us of some city, soft as a thick rug, to lay us down within. Seek ye a mightier than the crane in town? A mightier? That's no. Happens, yeah. A more commodious? Yes. Aristocratic? Anything but that. I loathe the very name of Selma's son. What sort of city would you like? Why, one where my worst trouble would be such as this, a friend at daybreak coming to my door and calling out, Oh, by Olympian Zeus, take your bath early, then come round to me, you and your children, to the wedding banquet I'm going to give. Now pray don't disappoint me, else keep your distance when my money's gone. Upon my word, you are quite in love with troubles. And you? I love the like. But tell me what? To have the father of some handsome lad come up and chide me with complaints like these. Fine things I hear of you, still bonnetes. You met my son returning from the baths and never kissed or hugged or fondled him. You, his parental friend, you're a nice fellow. You know, let us stop here. That in this comical and rather gross thing that the, the translator was very decent. So now what do we learn from that? Do, do we have a, a match? And what do we see here about the motivation of the two men? Thank you very much. What do we learn? I mean, common as well as uh, the difference. What do they seek? I mean, not an aristocratic city. It's very important and that is one part of the proof that it's a democracy which they seek, but not such a troublesome democracy as Athens, a pleasant democracy. That's clear, a pleasant democracy. But there is a slight difference between the tastes of the two fellows. Yes. First, one said, an easy material life. Yeah. Yeah. He wants things. Uh, he wants to get the necessities of physical existence uh, through no effort of his own. Yeah. You know, he wants to get things from others. Yeah. And doesn't want to do anything for them. <coughs> say that is what some people say the welfare state is. Yeah. But that is, of course, he doesn't think of the welfare state, but just a very, uh, 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 that is presented more clearly in the assembly of women. 
and in other way in, in the Plutus, you see, a, a city where men have every living abundance. That is what a communal life. But what is Pistadero's interested in? Well, he doesn't want bread and circuses. He wants uh, he wants a uh, an existence free from the moral strictures of others. It's, it's, it's very delicate what you say, but we cannot afford an extreme delicacy in a matter of such importance. Well, he, he, this is a... What is his taste? He's a pederast, sorry. Sure, 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 sure. That is not... Uh, so that's important. This is a clever pederast. Uh, that, uh, that is not unimportant because if the question of the household comes up and the family, that includes the prohibition against pederasty itself, according to the Greek view too. It's an irregularity. But here we see a problem. And in, when Plato presents Aristophanes in the banquet, there is, uh, Aristophanes presented as giving an edge to the pederasts. Yeah. <laughs> to say nothing of other people. Now, then uh, Tereus proposes a maritime city, and at the request of Euripides, Greek cities. The proposals are all turned down. No human city will do, of which they know. And then Euripides asks, what about the life with the birds? We don't have to live with humans after all. And then Tereus praises the amenities of birds' life, they need no money, and uh, so on. At this point, Pisteterus comes to the fore, and then he will be in, at the center for the rest of the play. With, he comes to the fore with a big scheme. The birds should found a city. Should found a city. And they do not go on in a non-political life as hitherto. That is, you help it, this didn't go higher than that. He said, there is a massive of police. And he adds one more thing, which is absolutely crucial. They should form a single city. The democracy suggests, sketched here is a universal democracy of birth, universal. So no one should say that the notion of a universal state was wholly unknown prior to the time of the Stoics or anyone else. Yet what sort of a polis? Now let us read on page 12 of the translation, verses 180 to 193, to which Mr. Head had referred, because they are really crucial. And that is Pistero speaking, the long speech of his, the very long speech of his, yeah? Mm -hmm. What do you see? I saw the clouds in the sky. Can you see the clouds, yeah, which we know already? Yes. And is not that the station of the birds? Station. As one would say, their habitation. Here, while the heavens revolve and the ground great dome is moving round, you keep your station of the hill. Make this your city. Fence it round with walls, and from your stations evolve your state. So you be lords of men, as now of locusts. A million famine shall destroy the laws. How? The air betwixt the earth and the sky, and just as we, if we would go to Plato, must pray for the grand passage from Hutia, to even so... Boosha, Boosha. Pardon? Bo Boosha. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. That's my English. Yeah. Even, even so, when men slay victims to the gods, unless the gods pay tribute, we in turn will grant no passage for the savory steam to rise through chaos in a realm not theirs. Yeah, let us stop here. That's a good point. Now, what kind of a polis? And surely a pun is made, but any pun worth being written down must be more than a pun. <coughs> it is an etymology in the first place. Polis, it will be a thing. Comes from, that's of course wholly unfounded as a assertions. Polos. And polos means an axis. An axis, primarily. Pole, the two poles is derived from the primary meaning axis. The pivot 
on which anything turns. And therefore, deliberately the axis of the celestial sphere, and then finally the celestial sphere itself. What does this mean, this stroke? The polis of the birds is the key polis. It's not a chance location which has these or that advantages and hence also disadvantages. It's a key polis. Its site is the bond between heaven and earth, between God and man. It is three plays, three loc locus, fit for universal rule. For the rule not only over men, that's not universal, but of God and of our gods as well. The best polis cannot be on earth. Does this strike ring a bell? Forgive me for bringing up these anticipatory questions, but uh, that saves us time later on. The best bodies cannot be on earth. Did you ever hear that? Yeah, End of the ninth book. Somewhere in, the model is laid out in heaven. Now here it is not exactly in heaven, it is between heaven and earth, but still, it's a reminder. Um, now, this is, in other words, it is, we are anticipating a later expression, but let's miss the point. When we speak today of idea, of an ideal city, we don't speak in the language of the Greeks. There is no Greek word for ideal. The Greek word is the city according to nature. Now, that means also its place must be by nature most fit for a perfect city. And that place is in the air. The, the bond between heaven and earth. Heroes <coughs> is enthusiastic about the clever conceit and he is willing to found the police together with Pisteteros, provided the other birds agree, naturally. I mean, he is only a constitutional king, you could say. And he demands, therefore, that Pisteteros explains to the birds the new scheme. Now, it is clear, Pisteteros is the man, he is the hero. We learn in passing also that he is an old man. That comes up time and again. An old man who has an inventive man of novel thoughts, who attempts novel deeds, something unheard of. Now, it is not easy to get all the birds together. It is also not easy to convince them that the two human beings are not their enemies. After all, they know them only as, up to now as bird hunters. The birds wish to rent them to pieces. Now let us turn to translation page 18, bottom, verses 339. They are in real danger. The birds want to rent them to pieces, both. Yeah? And then Oyel says, do you have it? You alone? Do you have it? Wretched man, twas you that caused it? Yeah. You and all your cleverness, why you brought me, I can't see. Just that you might follow me, just that I might die of weeping. What a foolish thing to say. Weeping will be quite beyond you when your eyes are pecked away. Yeah, let me stop here. You know, we learn one point. The real instigator from the very beginning was peace to so, uh, or yet it is, is a secondary figure. So, they, they can be compared uh, to such couples as Don Quixote and Sancho Panza in Don Quixote, or perhaps also to uh, uh, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. You know, they are so famous couples, a clever leader, a bit strange. You know, even Sherlock Holmes is very strange, you know and a normal man who has faith in that superior, extra, and, and abnormal man. 
In the Prague also. And? In the Prague also. That couple. I don't believe that this is, but I don't know. Dionysus. Yeah, Dionysus is a god. I mean, that superiority is given to that. Yeah, that's a different story. The name, Pistetiorus, by the way, what does name mean? His name indicates reliability. Yeah. Pistos. Perhaps, uh, is he so reliable, so unusually reliable, because he's so unusually clever? That could uh, be an explanation. I cannot swear that this is the case. Let us turn to the top of page 20, uh, when Euripides says, you most wise men do everything. What a skillful neat contrivance. Oh, you clever fellow, you, in your military science, Nicias, you far outdo. You know, that, again, uh, only to show the position of the two men, Euripides recognizes his ascendancy without any, any hesitation. And a bit later on, on the same page, Euripides is speaking again. Do you have it? Uh, no, I don't think he really speaks again on that page. No, it, it, is, it, it is epochs, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, if they are by nature enemies, they are, he, he tries to sell the two Athenians to the birds assembly, yeah, and says, they are by nature enemies, because men and birds are by nature enemies. But as regards their mind, they are friends. Do you have that? Enemies I grant by nature, very friends in heart and will. Here they come with kindly purpose, useful lessons to instill. What, they come with words of friendship? What, you really then suppose they will teach us useful lessons? They are father's father's foes. Yet to clever folk a foeman, very useful hints may show. Thus that foresight brings us safely from a friend we ne'er should know. But the truth is forced upon us very quickly by a foe. Hence it is that all the cities taught by foe and not by friend learn to build them ships of battle and their lofty walls extend. So by this a foeman's teaching children home and wealth defend. Yeah, so in other words, that's a very good political point. Yeah? You see that it's perfectly imitated, a deliberative debate. Yeah? How can you, uh, that's appeasement, words say. And then is a poli- is a po- uh, giving a very good political argument. You can and must learn from that. Now we learn in the secret, where, or, the birds were barbarians until some time ago, theorists had said. They still believe in the ancestral and in ancestral en- enmity to their natural enemies. And the birds have to be enlightened. It is a problem. They are ordinary citizens with an ordinary city and prejudice. They have to be um, uh, liberated from them. Uh, page 22, top, one of 18. But wherefore is he come? Yeah. What is he seeks to com- what is it he seeks to compass by his visit? Think you he's got some cunning plan whereby alive with us he can assist a friend or harm a foe? What brings him here, I'd like to know? You see, again, a very natural distrust. He's a foreigner, an enemy foreigner. Why not what was he must have some selfish advantage. And therefore his selfish advantage cannot be ours. They behave uh, um, in a, uh, absolutely like this. Now, after more preparations into which we cannot go, Pisistratus makes his speech in verses uh, 465 following, uh, which is in the translation, page 223, bottom. And let us read uh, a few of these verses at the beginning of this. Because you're, you've a blind and inquisitive mind, and accom- unaccustomed on Aesop to pour, the lark, the lark had her birth, so he says, before earth. Then her father fell sick and he died. She laid out his body with dutiful care, but a grave she could nowhere provide. For the earth was not yet in existence. At last, by urgent necessity dead, when the fifth day arrived, the poor creature contrived to bury her sire in her head. 
So the sire of the lark gave me leave to remark on the crest of headland lies dead. If therefore by birth ye are older than earth, if before all gods ye existed, by the right of the firstborn the scepter is yours, your claim cannot well be resisted. I advise you to nourish and strengthen your beak, and to keep it in trim for a stroke. Zeus won't in a hurry the scepter restore to the woodpecker tapping the oak. In times prehistoric, tis easily proved, by evidence weighty and ample, that birds and not gods were the rulers of men and the lords of the world. For example, time was when the Persians were ruled and by so on, that is, uh, the And we don't have to read that. The main point is this. How does he convince the birds? By asserting and in his way proving that in the oldest time, the rule of the universe belonged to the birds and not to the gods. You see, that's again very political. He has a novel scheme, a novel, something which never existed before. But politically, that can be accepted only if it is proven to be in harmony with tradition, as we would say. But here in old times, if it is really the oldest, the revolution, most revolutionary must be a restoration of the oldest. That is, uh, that it is not a restoration of the oldest, perfectly clear, because the birds never ruled. And even in this case, we see the birds can't rule and need a human to rule them. But uh, as a political argument, the birds, having the ordinary citizen spirit, can only be convinced of their right by being proven that their rule was the oldest. Originally, birds ruled everything, and especially all men. Different birds ruled the Persians, the Greeks, and the Egyptians, Phoenicians. They have taken the division of mankind, which you may know from Herodotus. Uh, it is, however, not quite clear whether these, each bird ruled one province or whether they ruled all men jointly. That is not quite clear. The birds are persuaded that they ought to recover their kingship. One universal policy is established. That a universal democracy. But, and of course, as a ruler, that's the difficulty. It has a human from a different species, and we put it here, the ruler is the most. But how will men be induced to recognize the birds as gods? And how will the birds be able to supply men with riches? And that, of course, must be cleared, and that is being done to the satisfaction of everyone. The worship of the birds will be much less expensive than worship of the gods. You don't have to bring these expensive sacrifices and other arguments of this nature. Pisistratus becomes the ruler of the birds. Let us look at page 31, line 3 to 6 on the bottom. Uh, what one must do with strength, yeah? Uh, so all that by muscle and strength can be done, we birds will surely do. But whatever by prudence and skill must be won, we leave altogether to you. That, that I think is clear. Pisistratus is a ruler. Is there, uh, well, if we, there are certain intermezzi which are not uninter by no means uninteresting, but we cannot go into everything. Now, then, if we come to the parabasis, but we, I see the time is not sufficient to make this. So therefore, I would like to mention only one point. Then there is a paralysis in which the birds are presented as having accepted the story of the original rule and presented in a very poetic way. But then the founding, the formal founding of the city takes place. And on this occasion, Five different individuals appear and want to be present. The first is, of course, a priest who is to do the sacrificing. Then there is a poet. Then there is an oracle um, fellow. And fourth, Metto. Five, an inspector, and sixth, a seller of decrees. 
The only one who has a proper name is Metto. Met, the others are all not identified. Metton was an astronomer. Is this scene with regarding the astronomer is of the utmost importance, as we shall see later. I'm, I will mention only one point. The city is founded and its fame spreads throughout the world. Everyone, every, all human beings wish to become members of this wonderful city. Three come and are shown to us. A man who wants to strike his father because he has heard there is a city of birds who can strike your father. Then Kinesias, a poet, and finally a sycophant, a crook. Again, there is only one mention who has a proper name. This time it's a poet. There is the connection between the astronomer, the man with proper name in the first set, and the poet, the man with the proper name in the second set, is of crucial importance for understanding the meaning of the play. And this is connected yeah, to, uh, to bring or show only the connection with the clouds in a few words. The poet is accepted, the poet is treated best among the first set. Metto, the astronomer, is thrown out, and he is even thrown out with beatings. It is not quite clear who beats him, whether Pistaterus beats him or whether the birds beat him, but surely if Pistaterus beats him, he would do it in the spirit of the citizens. He would not do it in his own accord. He says explicitly, I love you. I would keep you, but I can't. And there is a nice connection between that and Stryker, uh, the man who wishes to strike his father. Pistaterus contradicts himself there, and we have to discuss that. In the first place, he says, yes, we birds are permitted to strike our father. And then he speaks of an other law, also stemming from birds, according to which one may not strike one's father. The play ends with a victory, with a complete victory of Pistaterus, the gods are starved, and they have to give up their rule to this clever Athenian. Because since he is the ruler of the birds, not the birds rule, but Pistaterus rules. So Pistaterus becomes, takes the place of Zeus, and he marries kingship with a capital K, the daughter of Zeus. He means completely. So the gods can be disposed of. They are expendable. But that certain things are not expendable. You, also the police in the ordinary sense. We have now a universal police, no longer a police limited to a special locality. That's, the police as a closed society is expendable. Two things are inexpendable. A is the prohibition against beating one's father and B, the prohibition against the admission of astronomy. These are the absolute limits. You can, I mean, you, you can have a wonderful police, a most convenient and satisfactory police for everyone, and most pleasant and enjoyable, and no gods and wonderful. But two things cannot be tolerated beating one's father and astronomy. That's the link with the clouds. Because in the clouds, what the, the, uh, among the many uh, things which are ascribed to Socrates, the most peculiar and most strongly emphasized is astronomy, the science of heaven, the heavenly bodies and their motion. And the heaven is a vault comprising the whole, therefore it is the whole. This science of the whole would is somehow connected with rebellion against the most fundamental authority, the paternal authority. These are the two things which are incompatible with human society. 
Pis de Gerus loves the astronomer, Mac. But as a founder of a city, he has to show him out. And therefore, there is a sub, it's an important substitution. The only, in the first set, the only man mentioned by personal name, proper name, is the astronomer. In the second set, set the only individual mentioned by proper name is a poet. So poet can be tolerated by the city. He can. There is, if the city needs it, but not the philosopher. You see, just the opposite. In Plato, you remember, the philosophers are the rulers, ought to be the rulers. And the poets are sent away, just as here. The, the astronomer who stands for the philosopher is sent away. That is, is a fundamental problem, is the same, and therefore the name of that city, the Cloud Cookie City, Cuckoo City, or we might have said that, never a cookie here, uh, is, uh, shows very clearly the, uh, the connection with the problem of Socrates. So there is a fundamental disproportion between science, philosophy, whatever you call it, and or the logos and the polis. The logos would make it under questionable the foundation of society, and therefore it cannot be tolerated. The poets know what the philosophers know, there's the implication, but they don't say it in a way which destroys the city, and therefore they can be tolerated. Now we have to go into some details, into the details of that next time, and, but still, let's, you will have prepared your paper next time. Okay? Mr. Haven, because I, uh, we, uh, we haven't talked for some time, I will write your name down here. And now let us come to the next. Here we have only three people among the immigrants. Two are nameless, and the central one has a name, a proper name, just as in the first case. In the first case it was an astronomer, now it's a poet. Now, what is the, what does the poet say? On the lightest of wings I am soaring on high, lightly from pleasure to, from measure to measure I fly. Bless me, this creature wants a pack of wings. And ever the new I am flitting to find with timorous body and timorous mind, with clasps Senesius, man of linden wit. Why in the world have you whirled your splay foot hither? To be a bird, a bird I long, a nightingale of thrilling song. Well, stop that singing. Prithee, talk, speak in prose. And more literally, stop singing, but tell me what you mean. <laughs> no, no, it's at least singing is not telling what was mean. Yeah. Well, give me wings that I may soar on high and pluck poetic fancies from the clouds, wild as the whirling winds and driving snows. What? Do you pluck your fancies from the clouds? Why, our whole noble trade depends upon the clouds. What are our noblest dithyrams but things of air and mist and purple gleaming depths and feathery whirling wings? You shall hear and judge. No, no, I won't. By Heracles, you shall. I'll go through all the air, dear friend, for you. Shadowy visions of Wings spreading, air treading, taper neck birds, steady there, bounding along on the path of the seas. Fain I would float on the stream of the breeze. Oh, by the powers, I'll stop your streams and breezes. First do I stray in a southerly way. Then to the northward my body I bear, cutting a harborless furrow there. Nice trick that, a pleasant trick, old man. Oh, you don't like being a feathery whirlwind, do you? That's how you treat the cycling chorus trainer for whose possession all the tribes compete? Well, will you stop and train a chorus here for Leo Throfies, all flying birds, straight opinions? 
You're Jerry me that's plain, but I won't stop to be sure of that until I get me wings and peregrate the air. So let me stop here. The last phrase is not realistic. Peregrate the air. The, and the earlier, uh, um, earlier it used the similar expression. What does it, does it remind you of something? He runs through the air. He walks. He walks, the way he walks on the air. Well, so can this. There is a kinship between Kinesias, the poet, and Socrates. The poet takes the place of the astronomer, as is also indicated by the fact of the proper name. He wants to take new songs from the clouds, also so pleasant. For the poet's art depends on the clouds. So it is. Pisteteros invites him to stay. He is acceptable. Meton was not acceptable, the astronomer. But the poet doesn't rubbish to. He only came to get wings. He didn't wish to live there. He wants to live in a simple place. And as I say, his last words, the mind of Sugares walking on the air, I robate. The polis cannot tolerate astronomy, just as it cannot tolerate beating the father and, and or incest. It's connected. The city of birds is a universal democracy. It is a city of birds. A human society could not be universal. Hence, a human society would need local gods, not this universal gods, the birds. And the Olympian gods are, of course, the simplest Greek example for local birds. But even if a human society could be universal and hence get rid of the local gods, it could not get rid of the prohibition against incest plus beating the parents. And hence it could not get rid of the prohibition against astronomy. They are to go together. Why? Why do the doubt of the prohibition against incest and astronomy go together? The gods, with all their grandeur and power and importance, are not the most fundamental phenomenon. This uh, father beating or, and or incest is much more fundamental. That is from where we must start if we want to understand the gods. Now, what is the connection between the prohibition against astronomy and the prohibition against father beating? That I think is, we must uh, answer that question before we can go on. But it was implied in, in almost everything I said. Uh, I wish someone of you would help me. But what does the astronomer do? Well, neither of them help the poles. That's too general. But what does what was he positively do? The astronomer is interested in the things which transcend the polis, which should be on the polis, outside of the sphere of the polis. You're all right, but you have also <coughs> people who do all kinds of things which are not terribly necessary for the police and you tell you to tolerate them nevertheless. I mean, there are, in every society, I imagine people who do rather useless work. Yeah. But one could find them in all walks of life, I imagine. And uh, they are not uh, regarded as a danger to the city. Wouldn't the astronomy attempt to the world, which follows with some sort of natural... That's it. The astronomers pray into the secrets of heaven, the seeds of the gods. Yeah, that is uh, one formula which one can say. But more fundamentally, they deal with the highest, most comprehensive natural things. And by laying bare nature, they lay bare the distinction between nature and convention. And therefore, they show that the foundation of the police is the convention.
Astronomy is the essential for that human effort which destroys the sacred, which destroys the sacred by recognizing the conventional character of the sacred. Poetry, which is tolerated in contradistinction to astronomy, defends the sacred. Here, Aristotle does it all the time, of which it knows that it is not sacred, but it defends it. Poetry defends the sacred, of which it knows that it is weak as far as its logos, its foundation is concerned. Yeah? You know, it's so in the clouds, the uh, unjust logos was the strong logos. The just logos was the weak one. The poet knows that, and yet he takes it so. The poets very externally present the gods here. You, you, you say Zeus is not, when he appears, or at least his brother, Poseidon, appears on the scene. Think of a platonic dialogue. There are never any gods yeah, who appear on the scene. The poets present the gods. They make the gods speak. And that they make them also doubtful is true, but the philosophers never make them speak. The Olympian gods seem to be expendable. But given the need for of the prohibition against insects, some gods are needed, be it only the birds. But there is a terrible secret behind that. The birds are the gods. The birds rule all humans in the whole universe. Who rules the birds? Who? Well, to what species does he belong? A human being ultimately controls the God. Yeah, by a superior fellow, obviously. Not everyone could do that. Not as Rousseau said occasionally. Not everyone can make the God speak. Pisodorus, in his way, can do that. In an entirely different context, something of this kind occurs in Plato's Republic. There is the famous symbol of the cave. The cave is, among other things, the polis. It is something, a world in the world, universe within the universe, with its basic opinions, which constitute it. In the language of Venice Republic, the noble lives, which constitute the polis. And then there, are, there is a little wall in the high. Yeah. Yeah. Above the, above the cave, and statues of beings of superhuman size are carried around the gods. But they are, they are carried. And who carries them? Not the gods, but some human. It's a legislator. And therefore, it, uh, the, one, the, the platonic conclusion is one has to seek for the true gods, for the gods which are not gods by convention. The cosmic gods is one expression for that. The last speaker, uh, the last of these um, potential immigrants is a sycophant, who is simply a dishonest fellow, a, a quite vulgar crook. And he is just thrown out. I know that's where it's the first one. This very gay, grave man who doubts whether one should not beat one's fathers is an honest man. Yes, an honest man. The sycophant is a vulgar crook, and no excuse for that. He, he cannot only be sent away, but he must be sent away with disgrace. Let us look at page 60 in the middle, verse 1433. What can I do? I never learned to dig. You know, that's yeah. what <coughs> Mr. Luciano, I believe, also was saying, if you know, or is his name not coming at you, that he is now the most famous man in this field. Some time ago, Mr. Hodge. But you know, there are such people still around. Yeah. Only they are no longer called sycophants. Yeah? Go on. Well, but 
By Zeus, there's many an honest calling whence men like you can earn a livelihood by means more suitable than hatching suits. Come, come, no preaching. Wing me, wing me, please. I wing you now by talking. Whenever he wants wings in order to exercise his dirty business more efficiently, yeah? I wing you now by talking. But by talk can you wing men? Undoubtedly, by talk all men are weak. All? Have you never heard the way the fathers in the barber shops talk to the children, saying things like these? The Atrophies has winged my youngster so by specious talk, he's all for chariot racing, chariot driving. Aye, says another. And that boy of mine flutters his wings at every tragic play. So then by talk they are winged? By speeches would be providence. Men are winged by speeches. Yeah? Does it not make sense? Men are induced to, to move swiftly by speeches. Yes, go on. Exactly so. Through talk the mind flutters and soars aloft and all the man takes wing. And so even now I wish to turn you, winging you by talk to some more honest trade. <laughs> but I don't wish. How then? I'll not disgrace my bringing up. I'll fly the trade my father's father's fly. So wing me, please, with light, quick darting wings, falcons, or kestrels. So I'll serve my wrists abroad on strangers, then accuse them here, then dart back there again. Yeah, I understand. So when they are they come, they'll find the suit decided and payment ordered. Right, you understand. And while they're sailing hither, you'll fly there and seize their goods for payment. That's the trick. Round like a top I whiz. And I understand the whipping top. <coughs> and here by Zeus I've got a fine for Syrian wings to set you with it. Oh, it, it's a whip. And then you let it stop here. You see, there are two things which make men which make men winged. Speeches and whipping. The logos and sheer compulsion. That is a, 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 a trite verity, but a very important verity. That is where the logos is too weak, accidental. The, the man has a good uh, substitute for that, and this is which makes me think. The sycophant, just as a beater of his father, is given a lesson in justice. But the sycophant refuses to accept it. The father's beater is honest. Just as Philippides in the clouds was honest. Never forget that. His father was a crook. Philippides was not dishonest. The clear and simple use, a case of dishonesty or justice. Needing the nomos, because the sycophant couldn't exercise his, his uh, <coughs> profession without a law making possible it. Obviously, how can you blackmail a man if there is not a law which makes certain crimes crimes? No? Yeah. So, so this is an ordinary group of men who needs a law and transgresses it. All these gangsters need the law, if not exactly that law which they transgress, another one. That is a simple self-contradiction which has no leg whatever to stand upon, and these people, uh, they don't see it, but they must be made to act, they must be winged by whipping. The simple injustice cannot be cured by speech, but only by whipping. Yeah, if this is so, what then is justice? From this it would seem to follow that justice means respect for speeches. Yet for consistency. And that is not bad at all, and that is part of, of Socrates' teaching. The man who respects the logos is a respectable man. And the, the, the dishonest man is the one who doesn't listen to, to logos at all. But there is here a difficulty. If the logos itself happens to be weak, as was suggested in the clouds, a difficulty arises. Is there then not a need for some 
ultimate weeping behind the empirical weeping going on all the time by no cause, some ultimate force, some ultimate violence, simply lay, laying down the law as though no, no proper locus for it can be given. That's the question. And that is the meaning. If they are ultimate, if the basis of society are conventional, then only uh, the, then the ultimate base of society is some force. Now a few more uh, points. The scene goes a bit later, but um, yeah, um, perhaps we can read this point briefly, immediately afterwards, the chorus where we left off. No, um, after the figure punt was driven out, yeah? yeah, comes the chorus. We've been flying, we've been flying over sea and land, espying many a wonder strange and new. First, a tree of monstrous girth, tall and stout, yet nothing worth, for it is rotten through and through. It has got no heart, and we heard it called the Cleonimus tree. In the spring it blooms gigantic, fig-traducing, sycophantic, yet in falling leaf time yields nothing but a fall of shields. Next, a spot by darkness skirted, spot by every light deserted, lone and gloomy we describe there the human and divine. Men with heroes mix and dine freely save at even time. Tis not safe for mortal men to encounter heroes there when the great Orestes looming, vast and awful through the gloaming. With their right a stroke delivered, leaves them palsied, stripped, and shivering. But his Orestes was a robber. He was a robber and who appeared like a hero, like a revenant in some out-of-way places, also something of which you may know something from the daily papers uh, here in Chicago. And uh, the other one mentioned first was a sycophant, you see. The birds describe what they see flying around the earth as they see injustice of various kinds. And that seems to be very trivial. But we have to think for one moment to see why it is not trivial. The simple thing is they see it. They do not do anything about it. Just like the Olympian gods. Now, here's the final scene where the embassy from the gods appears. No, first Prometheus comes, afraid of Zeus. And he's greeted by Pistateros as a friend. Pistateros takes up the cause of Prometheus against the Olympian gods. There is also an, an, a reference to that, by the way, in Plato's banquet in the in Aristophanes' speech. Is there? The new and successful Prometheus is Pistateros. What's the difference between Pistateros and Prometheus, apart from the chronological difference? Prometheus is frightened stiff, and Zeus is the terrorist, isn't it? Yeah, but what is, yeah, that's true. But what is, of what, uh, to what species does Prometheus belong, to what species does Pistadeus belong? Prometheus was a man, Zeus and Terrorists is a member of the new race of... Prometheus was not a man. He was a titan. He was a god. So a human being, the, the new and successful Prometheus, is a human being. And that means taking into consideration the end of the whole story. That means that the gods have to give in. They have been starved to death and must give in. That the successor to Zeus is a human being. Propistadirus, via the birds, rules everything. And one point which is not of a general importance, which is of importance in, uh, not in the play itself, but in the broader context, in the translation page 66 bottom. And that is verse 1606 following. Piece of theirs? Yeah. I say so. Why, we'll be mightier far, ye gods above it. 
birds bear rule below. Now men go skulking underneath the clouds and swear false oaths and call the blood gods to witness. But when ye got the birds for your allies, if men swear by the raven and by Zeus, the raven will come by and unawares fly up and swoop and peck the perjurer's eye out. Yeah. You, uh, do you remember this the discussion of this problem with the clouds? There was also one kind of a, a crucial argument between Socrates and Strepsiades. After Socrates said this post of the gods as causes of rain and other things, there still remained one preserve of the gods. This is not a Striking the perjurer. Here's again. The gods don't do it, but the birds might do it. And that only to confirm, imagine this is a very close connection of these two. What is the connection with this in that last speech of the chorus that the birds saw but did, did nothing about what they saw? Pardon? And the birds saw... Yeah, that's an argument, but the birds could do it. There is a difference. In fact, they don't do it. That's a difference. Because the gods are only by convention. They are not. The birds are living beings. One point I would like to mention, in this scene where the birds, which seems to be mere lyrical poetry inserted, yeah, which has, of course, a meaning, what the birds sing in the particular case has its meaning. For example, this passage which we read, the lyrical passage, where it is shown how they see the injustice on earth, yeah, but don't do it in people. There is a parallel um, there where they see not these two crooks, uh, Orestes and the other fellow, but they see Socrates and Chalifon, who are also ridiculed. But it is very important. Socrates and Chalifon belong to a different pedagogy than the crooks, which we know anyway, yeah? uh, which is a minimal lesson we have to draw from them. Did you want to say something? Yeah, uh, the birds seem to have a very good case. The only thing that troubled me was their claim to deathlessness. That seems simply preposterous. Yeah, no, they have to claim that if they want to be gods. I mean, that follows. I mean, uh, the man simply would not accept to worship a mortal being. That is, I mean, once you, that similar considerations apply to purely political considerations if you want to. If someone wants to be, uh, uh, say, the absolute ruler of a society, he must raise certain claims, whether they are true or not. Mm-hmm. Yeah? I think that is. The political, by the way, what is invested in simple political shrewdness in the Aristotelian place is absolutely amazing. And that, of course, can come out only in very close analysis. For example, I mentioned only that example at which I saw it first. It's the assembly of women. You know, the, again, an, a utopia. This time, Athens submits to the rule of women, and with a certain amount of communism, so it's really very close uh, in many respects to what is going on in the Republic. And there are all kinds of difficulties there, you know, uh, seeming contradictions, and you have really to think about it. And there is a discussion, uh, it is, uh, as you know, Aristotle is not perfectly free from levity, to put it mildly, and there is one straight rule. Yeah, the, the family is abolished. Every man may have intercourse with every woman and vice versa. That's equality. But nature asserts itself. You have abolished all conventional inequalities. All are no longer rich and poor. But there is a natural inequality in this respect. Some are attractive and some are unattractive. Some are young, some are old. So here the normals, the convention has to come in and to equalize the condition. And therefore the rule is made, the unattractive ones have priority. You know what nature denies them, the normals, the law gives them. And that leads, of course, to very comic scenes of an old hag who asserts her priority and uh, with great um, uh, discomfort to everyone. <laughs> but if you raise one question for one who benefits from that law? 
who really benefits from that law because that is not very, uh, this is not a very nice scene for the old hag to go down and to have a fight and to make herself entirely ridiculous. And then you reach one conclusion. A young woman who married an old man, she has complied with the law of her. It has given priority to the underdog to the, by nature, under, underprivileged, and then she doesn't commit adultery by having relations with a man of her age. Such a woman is a heroine. So the whole play is dramatically based on this notion that in every revolution you have to raise the question, who benefits from it? And that you have to do, especially in the case of the leader of the revolution. Now, that is in no place brought out, simple reflection, but it is underlined only. And so that is in, in the other place too. There is always, I mean, whenever the subject has anything to do with the police, a political reflection is underlined to play. I don't know how I came to that. Okay. Someone of you raised that. Deathlessness. Pardon? Deathlessness. Yeah, it's political. You have to, to think of it. By the way, in the assembly of women, there is a famous contradiction. She speaks first of the, in the assembly of women. Uh, no, in a private assembly, she speaks of the absolute novelty of her scheme, this uh, leading revolution. And then in the assembly of women, where they take the vote, she appeals to antiquity that always the women were really the rulers. Well, same thing in the political argument. The appeal to precedent. Antiquity is essential, it goes through. And one must take this into consideration, not take this as... Uh, as that is, uh, in this sense, the place are political, all of them, including the political. So, who, who will that ever convince? I mean, and that they can, that they can do all kinds of wonderful things for crops and so on, that's fairly plausible, but who will they ever convince that they never die? Am I being too literal? Uh, no, there is a famous American saying from Abraham Lincoln, which all of you have heard more than once. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Now say it. You're going to fool some of the people all the time and all of the people some of the time. Yeah. All right. L let us forget about the conclusion, which Aristotle would admit. But all kinds of food. I mean, what is the meaning of propaganda, as the word is used today? Except. I mean, I'm sure that if it were not massively incompatible with any form of Marxism in the most extreme interpretation, I have no doubt that you could... What they did with the brain of Lenin in Moscow, yeah? uh, you know, that uh, this famous exhibition there, and uh, what they did with this Lysenko business, that's a beautiful example. It is sure that the Soviet government can uh, sell the idea that Lysenko's biology is right in the course of years. I mean, as Plato in his wisdom says in the Republic, uh, in, in a discussion with Glauco, when the Nobel Laureate is under discussion, Glauco says, yeah, but people won't believe it, won't believe the Nobel Laureate. And he, then he goes on to say, but later generations, might. And Socrates very delicately says, I understand more or less what you mean. Meaning, well, time has, uh, has, a, has a terrific power. If people hear that for generations, uh, things sound different. And we, we must, in addition, I would say, in fairness, one must grant, especially a comic poet, the right to exaggerate a bit. Yes. After all, let us not forget that birds cannot speak, and that this preposterous impossibility is, of course, the basis of that legitimate comedy, yeah? a legitimate comedy. Now, uh, do we have a few minutes to state at least your problem, and I'll see whether we can discuss it. State your objection. Well, first I have to be sure I understand exactly what you said. Uh, you have been doing. Yeah. Uh, as I understand, you are certainly first that there is a connection between the birds and the clouds in the both the 
of them deal with the nature of the forest of the community. And there are some he is making propositions about nature of the forest. Sure. That is, that, is that, that was my conclusion. First of all, I say he tells a story about birds uh, being induced by a Indian to take uh, on the rule over the birds. Not, but uh, if we think about that and go back to the underlying uh, view, then we are right. Yeah, sure. Well, first, I object to the connection between the clouds and the birds. Well, I'll start at the very bottom. I object to the whole idea that Aristophanes is saying something in either of these plays beyond what can be read on the surface. Sure, be absolutely correct. But the question is only if you take the whole surface, meaning every speech, and then, uh, yeah, then and you must account for every speech and for a uh, conceit which makes every speech meaningful without uh, having recourse to fantastic assumptions. Well, let me get at that word meaning. I, for a while, the first few days here, I couldn't make up my mind whether you were using plays of Aristophanes as an illustration for your own opinions on the subject, or whether you meant to say that Aristophanes meant the conclusions that uh, you drew from his plays. Right? I can set your mind at rest on this one very easily. It would be criminal of me if I were to impute my opinions to his dominance and say they were a uh, I Sure, I believe in that. And when I have, would say that this train of thought, which is not my opinion, but this train of thought I learned from others as one part of the great argument going on, classical times to which Socrates, Plato, Marcus, Doctrines is a reply. Well, as I started to say, yeah. uh, this was just uh, the first few days I want to go to to uh, how you put it. But I don't uh, believe in this. I find it very difficult to believe that Aristophanes deliberately set out to illustrate or to compress a position in the given way. I think the illustrations of various positions or ideas or philosophies may appear in these plays, but they are there almost by accident. I think as a playwright, Aristophanes' first consideration was to present a picture of contemporary happiness, a mocking, uh, ridiculous picture, but that his first consideration was, is this true of Athens? That is, of course, an assertion which is, uh, I believe, not provable. But if you say his first consideration was to make people laugh, I grant you that, I, I, I believe I said this last time, that is surely true. But the question is simply, there are, I mean, playwright or, or dramatist or comic poet, these are general concepts which cover a very great variety of phenomena. There may be a man who only likes to use a kind of uh, uh, um, makes a kind of buffoonery. Yeah? I mean, for example, when you see George Gobel or uh, Roger Marx or other individuals of this kind, you have plenty of opportunity to laugh. They do want nothing but that. But there are also uh, comic poets who want more. Now, and my uh, starting point of any argument would be what, since the comic poet by Aristophanes, given the conventions of that time, was free to speak in his own name, in the paradise. 
of what we were doing. We have to start from that. In the case of the traffic poets, it's much more difficult because they never speak the language. Now, and there Aristophanes says he wants to do two things, to make people laugh and to teach them justice. And any argument on Aristophanes, which is no, wants to be solely scholarly, scientific, has to start from that. And, and, and no further, and the fact that constant reference to contemporary Athens occur must be understood in the light of these two principles, ridiculous and just. To teach justice by ridicule, or to uh, make people laugh by means of presentations of the problem of justice, that is not desirable. By the gentleman said that the way. And uh, one can, uh, one, um, I mean, if this kind, it, it is perfect, everyone is free to believe or not to believe. Uh, and uh, that is, is uh, not the point. But I think one must simply, uh, any argument which is valuable is one which enters into the details. I mean, I don't claim to have understood the whole Aristophanes. Uh, we have today a good example where Mr. Hebele, who has read Aristophanes less than I, I believe, yes? much less, much less. Uh, he found something which I overlooked and of some of the importance because it, it, it clears the great difficulty. And that happened a lot of time. But I, would, uh, I can only say this of the interpretations I have read or heard. I think that. The overall view I suggest is more explains more than the alternatives do. What I do not know and what I have to find out by hard work is whether it explains, at least in principle, everything. Because you see, our belief and non belief depends to a considerable extent on our earlier opinions, on our preconceived opinions. And that is, of course, as you must admit. Not sorry. So if you don't show me a given point where I say something, where I interpret a certain speech wrongly, then I would be delighted and uh, immediately embody it into my interpretation. But this is too vague to many people. Uh, that's an excellent criticism. I hope I won't bog down the glass in uh, a verbal swamp of trivia, but I have a list of things here yeah. that I object to. I object to them on the grounds that I gave before, that I think Aristophanes put them in as a playwright. From two points of view, either as jokes or simply because they represented contemporary Athens. That is, uh, there are ideas that he attacks in his play, but I think he put them there not because he was mounting a concentrated attack on a, a well-knit philosophy, but simply that he was plucking ideas out of Athenian life and attacking them. He's but they still they must make some meaning. I mean, when, when you take the clouds and you have here the quite externally, sugar is a certain at, or at least a betting, a Trojan thing, and meeting at Caribbean end, that can be understood and must be understood at first glance as a critique of Socrates. Something was wrong with Socrates. Otherwise, it would not be ridiculous, you know, it's a simply good and noble act and a simple and noble, a simply good and noble way of life can never be ridiculous. So, in the end, I think it's generally admitted that the clouds are something like an attack on Socrates. The question only is what are the best terms of the attack. Here, in this play, you have an Athenian who is, has only one uh, quality which would, according to very severe notions of that time, even be regarded as a blemish, I mean, his pederasty. But otherwise, it's presented as an absolutely sensible man. You see, for example, the scene with a father beater, and the scene with a sycophant, and a man who has sensible moral principles. He does something out outrageous to the gods, and he succeeds. <coughs> he succeeds. Must be a bitter. 
I mean, uh, Pizzadeiros is not held up as a, as a wicked uh, destroyer of, of the paternal order, of the ancestral order, on the contrary. And similar concerns apply to the peace. They also had a kind of rebellion against the gods, a man, an Athenian, ascends to heaven and brings peace to Hellas, whereas if Zeus had been right, the war had gone on and on and on. I mean, to say merely that Aristophanes was in favor of peace and against the continuation of this fratricidal war is true, but he is linked up here with the assertion that Zeus is very inactive and the human being has to do it. The human being, had, uh, that one can show uh, by the name of it, is really the comic poet himself. And uh, the co so the comic poet will do what uh, Zeus himself will not do. You have to take these things into consideration. In addition, I mean, all the words which you use are really in need of reflection. For example, ideas. Uh, when you take a man like uh, like Bernard Shaw, and there were uh, writings around, say, Bergson, and he was influenced by them, uh, then we understand more or less what that means. A playwright or a novelist, for that matter, happens to be influenced by the theoretical man of his time, and uh, he partly, really, partly believes them, and partly also he uses them without believing in them because he can uh, use them for characterization and for characterizing his characters. Yeah? That is one way of doing it. Whether and to what extent Aristophanes merely used these opinions in the end for characterizing individuals and to what extent he himself accepted these views is a question. You cannot leave this question open because the alternatives are limited. I mean, if he believed in the Olympian gods, yeah, which means he, if he rejected this new kind of things altogether, that would show these uh, presentations do not make much sense as the work of someone who believed in the Olympian gods. I disregard, uh, uh, I disregard here completely another consideration which I do not regard as trivial, but one could object to the monster sense of economics. We have a presentation of Aristophanes' work as a whole in four pages in Plato's Bank. Now, Plato knew everything about the contemporary scene, infinitely more than anyone can know today. I mean, this kind of thing is uh, clear. But I can only say that without having paid any attention to the Platonic analysis, the Platonic presentation, uh, I came to a view which, which I was surprised to see is born now by what Plato says in the banquet about Aristophanes. But the only concrete way is concrete argument. This is not that particular point, and you have to consider uh, both the individual speeches, uh, and uh, naturally also the chorus, as well as the action and the meaning of the play as a whole, the plot as a whole. Well, it is this meaning of the play as a whole that uh, I object to. I, I said, in summary... Say the plot. Say the plot. In, in summary, my position is that you're attributing too much consistency with Aristophanes as a proponent or point of view. Page, on page 48, in the speech of the chorus, uh, listen to the city's notice specially proclaimed today, Sirs, the Agoras, the Melian, whosoever of you slay, shall receive reward one talent, and another will bestow if you slay some ancient tyrant dead and buried long ago. Yeah. Now, uh, I got my notes right, but I'm so fast. Uh, you said that this contained the proposition that heresy and tyranny are not allowable. Yeah. in the ideal city. Yeah. Uh, and if I understand the way you're approaching this topic, you mean to say that he put that proposition in there specifically? He meant specifically. Yeah, he must, must, I mean, even, I would say this. If 
such, such actions were taken by the Zirya Bhattu. If he ascribes these acts to the city of birds, it must make some meaning as an act of the city of birds. Of course, he could be a silly buffoon who just makes jokes, whether they may have meaning to call it or not. But as far to the extent to which I know Aristophanes, I think he was a very thoughtful man. So it, it, he did not make, it was not so that he merely could not repress a joke, but it must have some meaning in the context. It makes a perfect sense in the whole of the play that however different this new city of the birds may be, it still has certain features in common with all cities of which we know, and the prohibition uh, against tyranny as well as the prohibition against atheism applies equally there. Well, I mean, that uh, it, seems, it seems to be confirmed by the whole. They are, after all, new gods, so there is no atheism. Well, first of and tyranny goes without saying that democracy, and, and even an aristocracy, cannot tolerate tyrants. There are good many of these uh, points in here that you bring up, and some that I object to, where I can't say that what you draw out of them is wrong. For example, about the father being a leader, being a law-abiding man. Yes, he is, and is presented as such. Still, I just object to the idea that this was intended. Now, in this yeah, but why streets of the course, the, why should he do uh, present an, uh, an individual <coughs> regarded by the normal man as obnoxious, just as a sycophant is obnoxious, and a sycophant he presents as one would expect it, as a crook. And it is, it is a despicable individual whom he treats as a despicable individual. But here he has another kind of crime, beating the father, and he treats him as, or a man desires to beat his father, and he treats him differently, and this fellow proves to be different. What do you have of poetry, I would say? What? I mean, is a poet a thoughtless man? No. Must he be a poet? I don't know. There are some, so. but no good poets. Uh, I don't believe Aristophanes was a thoughtless man. I'm not saying that he is. Yeah, but then he I'm would saying be that thought. there are dramatic reasons, reasons why Aristophanes, the playwright, yeah, What does dramatic reason in concrete terms mean? In other words, how do you interpret this particular passage? What does, I mean, that's a, a general word. Tra if you say dramatic reasons, meaning there is a certain plot, a certain overall idea, and this has in itself consequences which explain a given thing. And you don't have to refer to anything else. That may be so, if you call that a dramatic reason fun. But you cannot give such a granting that it was necessary to show the city as an attraction and therefore potential immigrants. He still had to stop the question, what kind of immigrants is he going to choose? and how will they be treated, and uh, to whom he will give a proper name, and to whom he will not give a proper name. These were new decisions, special decisions, which must be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think in each of these cases, I can give a dramatic reason why he chose this way of putting it. May I make this suggestion, because you must not finish for many of these reasons. Can you put them down in writing and hand them to me next time? Good. And then, these feelings get on as a cause of events. I'm sorry to say. What is it a player is a The apology of Sokrates and the cry to. And these are the two, probably the most popular writings of Plato. I mean, popular in the sense, most widely read. Yeah. Now, first, let us remind ourselves for a moment before we begin, Mr. Hayek and I begin our free for all of our general problem. The cause is entirely the origins of political science. We started from the fact that in our time, rational thought is undergoing a crisis. And the question arises, is this crisis due to reason itself, or is it due to a certain interpretation of reason, the modern interpretation? 
In order to clarify, we return that we return to the origins of political science. Now, what are the origins of political science? What is the original conception of political science? I would like to say a word about that, although the, 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 most of you will know that, but it doesn't do any harm if it is restated. Now, the original conception of political science in its fully developed form is accessible in Aristotle's politics and one can say only there. Their political science is a practical science, and that means the perspective of Aristotle as the author of the politics is identical with the perspective of the citizen or statesman. He looks farther afield than the statesman does, even the best statesman does, but he looks in the same direction. And Political science in the Aristotelian sense is not a theoretical science. It is not an attempt to look at political things from the outside. Uh, if we could get some. If this is political life, and which has a certain direction, there are two ways of looking at it. One is from here, and this is the person following the direction of political science themselves as a citizen of the states of us and as others serve as a political process. But there is also a way here to look at it from the outside, just as we look at the movements of fishes or of leopards from the outside. We do not participate in the environment. That would be a theoretical attitude to a political life, that is characteristic of present-day social science, of course. Though they use the participant observer in a certain role, that is subordinate to a fundamentally theoretical approach. And if it is practical, it is practical in the sense of an applied science. Do you remember the distinction between applied science and practical science of which I spoke on the former occasion? There are certain political science, and by the way, that is true not only of Aristotle, it's also true of others, but Aristotle only develops this in a classic manner as a model of everyone who lays up else who follows his approach. Now, by virtue of this practical character, the guiding theme of Aristotle's politics is the question of what is the best order of society, the best regime. It also deals with the imperfect regimes and with the question of how this or that kind of imperfect regime can be managed or improved. But this management of the imperfect regimes and its principles can only be understood in the light of the best regime. Because any improvement presupposes a standard for the improvement and the fully developed standard is the best regime. One can also put it this way, the doctrine of the best regime is a physiology of politics, whereas the doctrine of the various imperfect regimes is a pathology and therapeutics. That is a, 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 a permissible comparison. Now, the premise of this whole political doctrine as developed in the politics is the answer to the question of what is good, what is the human good. And the human good, the core of the human good, is human excellence, virtue. And this is developed in Aristotle's ethics, which is inseparable from the politics and uh, the other uh, and uh, vice versa. Now, Arist Aristotle's political work, which is the politics in, and together with the ethics, gives us the fullest development of the Socratic study of political things as political things. Which means that what Aristotle does is not identical with what Socrates did, or with what Plato did. But if Socrates or Plato had been concerned with a relatively independent science of politics, as they were not, they would have said what Aristotle said. Why they were not concerned with such a relatively independent treatment is a long question to which I cannot go. 
But if we approach the whole problem by, from our present assumption that there is a possibility of a relatively independent political science, Aristotle's work is the most immediately relevant exponent or exposition of that. Now, but behind Aristotle's political ethics, there is somehow Socrates. Socrates turned to the political things, which means in Socrates, philosophy turned to the political things as such. Prior to Socrates, political philosophy was not concerned with political things as such. What then was philosophy originally prior to Socrates? One way to answer the answer question is the study of Aristophanes' clouds, which presents Socrates himself as a representative of the pre-Socratic view of philosophy in the form of a comedy, and it must be read judiciously, that goes without saying, but nevertheless. Here in the clouds, in this pre-Socratic form of Socrates, philosophy is purely theoretical. The spirit of the philosopher is akin or identical to that of the mathematician. Self-forgetting contemplation of the principles. No self-knowledge. Just as a mathematician is as a mathematician not concerned with the question, what is mathematics? What am I doing as a human being engaged in mathematics? But he's concerned with mathematical object. The same is true of the philosopher in his presentation. This is roughly speaking correct, but it is not literally true. Because the disregard of the political things by this philosopher in the clouds has a reason. The reason being that the political things are essentially conventional and therefore you cannot learn anything from them about the nature of things. You understand from here why the beginning of Aristotle's politics is so eminently apt. The beginning being the assertion the polis is by nature, man is by nature a political animal. Convention comes in only in a very secondary place. If the polis is natural, then the philosophic understanding of man is, uh, implies, includes understanding of political things. But I said there is a deep harmony between Arist Aristotle's politics and Socrates, but there is no identity. And that is indicated by this little point that Socrates never said the polis is natural. He took it very seriously, but he never said it's natural. What this means is a question which we will clarify to some extent by our later study of uh, Plato. Before we can begin to understand Socrates, we have to arrive at a better understanding of the position which Socrates attacks, against which political science came into being. And this position which Socrates attacks is presented to us by Aristo in Aristophanes, among others. But Aristophanes has great advantages of which I have spoken more than once. Aristophanes' claim can be put as follows. The poets, in contradistinction to the philosophers, are open to the phenomena, to some phenomena, to which the philosophers are blind. But the poet understands the political sense. By the way, this is also intelligible today, um, immediately, because uh, I think I mentioned this simple observation before, that uh, today uh, you find sometimes a novel which gives you a deeper understanding of political things than many volumes of political science, handbooks, textbooks, and periodicals. You know, but it had a particular bearing uh, this, uh, in, in these early times. The poets are open to phenomena to which philosophers are blind. Therefore, Socratic philosophy, as it came with the revered Socrates, Socrates we know from Plato and Xenophon, is directed both against an earlier philosophy and against the poets. The Socratic philosophy tries to 
do philosophically what according to Aristophanes could be done only poetically. So that the fight against the philosophers, which is so well known from the Republic, is an absolutely essential part of the beginning of political science. Now, I would, in order to, uh, that we understand a bit better what Aristophanes is dealing with, I would like to read you a passage from Plato's Laws, page 690. This is the third book somewhere, 690. I read it to you from the similar section. What and how many are the agreed claims in the matter of ruling and being ruled? Alike in cities and in households. Is not the claim of the father and mother one of them? And in general, would not the claim of parents to rule over offspring be a claim universally just? Certainly. And next to this, the right of the noble to rule over the ignoble. And then, following on these as a third claim, the right of older people to rule and of younger people to be ruled, to be sure. The fourth claim is that slaves ought to be ruled and masters ought to rule, undoubtedly. And the fifth is, I imagine, that the stronger should rule and the weaker be ruled a truly compulsory form of rule, says the interlocutor. Yes, and one that is very prevalent among all kinds of living beings, being according to nature, as Pindar, the poet, once said. The most important claim is, it would seem, the sixth, which ordains that the man without understanding should follow, and the wise man lead and rule. Nevertheless, my most sapient Pindar, this is a thing that I, for one, would hardly assert to be against nature, and the rule of the wise, but rather according to nature. The natural <coughs> rule of law without force over willing subjects. In other words, the implications here meant that law is the embodiment of wisdom and therefore yes, most uh, correct. To be favored by the gods and to have good luck marks the seventh form of truth, where we bring a man forward for a casting of lots and declare that if he gains a lot, he will most justly be the ruler, but if he fails, he shall take his place among the rulers. Now, these are the seven claims. What Plato, or, or this, uh, what Plato implies is that in any actual polis, these seven if it is not, uh, yeah, in any act of policy, these seven claims are somehow embodied. And of these, the most sensible is the rule of wisdom. But this is not the only one. There is, for example, also the claim of mere strength. And the reason is clear, because the wise cannot compel the unwise if they do not have the support of much strength supplied by unwise people. And there is also the claim of the old, the mere old, to have a higher right than the young. And in the first place, of course, the parents. Is just. That is a, a sketch of the political problem. The political problem consists precisely in this, that in that political government is for all practical purposes never the rule of wisdom as such, but other, lower, harsher elements are added to it in order to make it political rule. So Compolis combines these different types of which have very different weight. That is the problem of Compolis, this mixture of heterogeneous elements and yet, uh, which must be accepted if we are to if we want to accept the police. This applies also to the household. The parents have a right over their children. As Plato makes clear by his distinction, 
the rule of the parents is not the rule of wives as such. And yet, what is the title of the parents, if not wisdom? That's a difficulty. In one way, of course, it is. We, we, uh, why do parents have the right to boss around, to guide, to command, whatever you call it, their children? Because we assume that being older, more experienced, they can take care of the children better as the children themselves can. But two questions arise. Do, they, do all parents necessarily care for their children? As birds, mother birds care for their offspring, you only have to read the daily papers and what is going on in certain uh, social agencies to see that human mothers are not as dependable as swallow mothers. But even granting for one moment they would care, that would not be of very great help because caring combined with stupidity is practically as bad as non-care. What do we see here? We see a legal assumption that very generally and crudely speaking, it is better if the young children are brought up by the people who generated them than by strangers. But that is a, a crude legal assumption uh, based on very tough things, for example, as the unwillingness of other people to take care of other people's, quote, brats, unquote. And uh, so the law simply says, no, you have to take care, whether you are fit or not, that's your business, and if you prove to be grossly unfit, you will be sent uh, to jail in addition to all other considerations. This problem was discussed at very great detail, as at least at relatively very great detail, by the way, by John Locke in his, uh, the first part of the civil government, where he discusses the great question, where does paternal power derive and what is its meaning? And where he, for example, makes a sudden distinction because his opponent, a fellow called Filmer, had said the mere act of begetting gives a man the right to respect and being obeyed throughout his life by the individual he has begotten. And Locke says that doesn't make much sense if he's not at the same time the one who brings up that child. And then he goes on into more subtleties of this question. And needless to say, here also the question arises of, you know, of whether a given man who is a father according to law is in fact a father. The Napoleonic civil code has this famous uh, 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 prescription, la recherche la paternité est dit. In, in the case of an, uh, of an illegitimate child, it is forbidden to make any inquiries as to the identity of the father. Napoleon needed soldiers. And uh, uh, this is one side of the matter. The, to, but to come back to the main point, we find here at a very brief inspection a legal assumption, a legal assumption on which the whole social order is based. This legal assumption presents itself, however, and for very deep reason must present itself as a sacred law. Now, what the problem with which such people as Aristoteles is concerned is to say, I mean, if they would not overstate it for reasons of comical effect and some other things, you, the police, transform a tolerable rule of thumb into a sacred law. And that is... In, I mean, the rule of thumb is all right as rule of thumb because as rule of thumb, it admits exceptions and deviations. But the sacred law does not admit exceptions. And you can make the application to the somewhat harsher question of incest by yourself. Now, since we have seen some discussion of that in uh, the clouds, and this is taken up again in the birds, and I remind you only of a few points before we go on. Two Athen the action of the birds, two Athenians leave their city in quest for a perfect city. 
a city where everyone can live by himself, can live, is left alone, can devote himself to his pleasure. Such a city doesn't exist, neither now nor ever. They have to found that city, just as they have to found a city in Paris Republic for somebody to please, please. please. But this city, this perfect city, apparently is not possible as a city of human beings. It is possible only as a city of birds. Only a city of birds can have the perfect place which a perfect city must have. The perfect place being the most strategic place imaginable between heaven and earth, uh, controlling the traffic between gods and men. This perfect city is, as subtly necessary to say, a universal city. Because if you say a particular city, you say war. Yeah, so at least a possibility of war, and that means that war. So only universal city can be really pleasure. And it is also, of course, universal democracy. No harsh distinction between classes. No slavery. The man who founds a city who found this city is the Athenian Pisteteros, which the name would translate Pistos. Pistos means reliable, faithful, and Heteros means comrade or friend. The name is, uh, is of course, a coinage by Aristophanes, and I have no better explanation of it than that. In the earliest comedy, which has been referred to as the Arcanians, the hero is called Dikaiopolis, which is also a very strange name for a man. That means just, and that means city. Just a man called just city, the hero. I believe that Pisciteros is somehow uh, modeled on that name. The first part, this, means a faithful life, but as uh, one could uh, prove, this, this word, uh, faithful, reliable, has in a way even a broader meaning than the word just. The thoroughly tender man. And Polis is replaced by heteros, by comrade, by friend. It is not quite a Polis, which he found, as we see from the fact that the only humans who are clearly members of it are these two Athenians, all others are birds. But this is a mere guess, and uh, I mentioned it in the past. Now let us turn to the point where we left off. This is an did your objections to my interpretation reach a point where you could say they or should be not rather any. I would prefer that. Yeah, I think that's it. All right. Now let us turn to the left off. Um, let us turn to the bottom of page 33 in the translation, which is verse 676. Will you read that? O darling, O tiny throat, love whom I love the best, dearer than all the rest, they made him partner in all my soft legs. Thou art come, thou art come, thou hast dawned on my gaze. I have heard thy sweet note, nightingale, nightingale. Thou from thy flute, soft, softly sounding canst string, music to suit with our songs of the spring. Begin then, I pray, our own anapestic address to essay. Yeah, let me stop you for a moment. You see, the, the, of the chorus are here birds, but the, per, the birds speak verses. The poet refers to the kinship of birds to the poet, and that is one reason why the birds have been selected. Sweet song is what they share. What is the exception in the case of men, sweet song, is a rule in the case of the birds, at least of certain birds, especially the nightingale. The question is, is there not also a kinship of the poet with the clouds 
in the comedy called Clouds, I mean with the clouds here, surely the imitative character of the clouds, you remember, which connects the clouds with the poets. Now, then let us uh, read the immediate secret. Here we left off. Ye men who are dimly existing below, who perish and fade as the leaf, hail, woe begone, shattered thy spirit that spoke, light of feeble and wingless and Frail castings in clay who are not in the day, like a dream full of sorrow and sighing. Come listen with care to the birds of the air, the aces, the deathless, the blue flying, in the joy and the freshness of ether, are wont to, to muse upon wisdom undying. We will tell you of things transcendental, of springs and of rivers, the mighty upheaval, the nature of birds and the birth of the gods, and of chaos and darkness primeval. When this ye shall know, let old Prodicus go, and be hanged without hope of reprisal. You know, Prodicus is his famous man mentioned in the clouds, who will all be young so that this was connected. The birds are here presented as immortals, as beings that are always, as, it, as ethereal beings, who which teach a feminine man the truth about the heavenly things. The nature, the coming to being of birds, gods, and rivers. Now, this, of course, they have already undergone. They, they were simple fellows, the birds, before. But our clever Athenian had taught them that they were the gods and the origin of everything, and they act on that. You see, they are quick learners, in a way. Yeah? Go on. There was chaos at first, in darkness and night, and Tartarus vast and invisible. But the earth was not there, nor the sky, nor the air, till at length in the bosom abysmal of darkness and egg from the whirlwind conceived was laid by the sable plume of night. And out of that egg, as the seasons revolved, sprang love, the entrancing, the bright. Love brilliant and bold, with his pinions of gold, like a whirlwind, refulgent and sparkling. Love hatched us, co-mingling in Tartarus wide, with chaos, the murky, the darkling, and brought us above as the first things of love, and first to the light we ascend. Now let us stop. You know, the, bird, the birds give now a cosmology. They are the gods. They must be the first beings. Literally, this cannot be true, because in all the organies there was something before, maybe heaven and earth or whatever it was. We see here they are preceded by arrows. Those who will remember a Plato's banquet will not be surprised by that. Yeah. Arrows is, in a way, arrows, love, desire, is the first of all beings. At least he is the first of all bright or shining beings. The first who brings things to light. Does this make sense that arrows is, a is that is a first because it's the first which brings things to light? Generate, all beings are generated, let's assume. And generation presupposes the act of generating, i.e. arrows. To be means to be, that is the implication of that. To be means to be something. To have a character. There is not a being which merely is. It is always this or that. To have a character, a limit, a setting off this from that, and nature. And that limit, to be means to be limited. And as a limited, it is distinguished from any possible source of all beings, which as a source of all beings is unlimited, infinite, that's the, that's the same word, unlimited and infinite. An infinite where you cannot make any distinction. Poetically expressed, night or something like night is the origin, chaos. They are mixed and out, but perhaps one chaos, one unlimited will not do because you cannot understand the difference that there is only one such principle. Perhaps you need more. And that was a more common view. The elements, 
They are four elements, for example, out of a general group. But these elements are not things. They are the sources of things, not things. These elements must be brought together. They must be mixed. They must be united so that there be things. But that which brings different heterogeneous things together is, in the wider sense of the word, the uniting principle, Eros. That is the doctrine behind uh, this bird's cosmology. Now let us read the next two verses where we left off. There was never a race of immortals at all who loved and the universe blended. Then all things commingling together in love, there arose the fair earth and the sky, and the limitless sea and the race of the gods, the blessed who never shall die. Yeah, let us stop here. Now that is, you see, you see the mixture. There is a mixture of heterogeneous elements and that presupposes a mixing principle and that is called Eros. And out of that the gods came and uh, the, of course here according to this uh, is the birds. The birds are the firstlings of Eros and therefore the givers of the greatest things to the mortals. The birds appeal to uh, birds uh, appeal to men for recognition as gods, just as the clouds did in the clouds, you remember? But there is a difference. The birds try to take the place of the Olympian gods, whereas the clouds only do demanded to be recognized in addition to the Olympian gods. The clouds were much more modest than the birds are. Hence, the action of this play is much more daring than the action of the clouds. Hence, it takes place not in Athens, but in a faraway place. So that makes sense. Now let us see what we learn about this life of the birds in the sequel. We turn to verse 753 following, which is the third paragraph on page 36 of the translation. Uh, let someone else read. Do you have it? You are our, our uh, because you have, you are uh, a notarized reader. Yeah. Is there anyone amongst your spectators who would lead with the birds a life of pleasure? Let him come to us with speed. All that here is reckoned shameful. All that here the laws condemn. With the birds is right and proper. You may do it all with them. Is it here by law forbidden for a son to be his sire, that a chick should strike his father strutting up with youthful ire, crowing, raise your spur and fight me? That is what the birds admire. Come, you runaway deserter, spotted o'er with marks of shame. Spotted falcolin will call you. That with us shall be your name. You who style yourself a tribesman, Phrygian pure as Spintheros, come and be a Phrygian linen, with filaments breed with us. Come along, you slave and carrion, exorcistides to wit. Breed with us your hoo rears, they'll be guildsmen apt and fit. Son of Theseus, who to outlaws would the city gates betray, come to us and be a partridge, cockerel like the cock, they say. We esteem it no dishonor, knavish partridge tricks to play. Yes, let us stop here. Now you see, that is a simple and I think perfectly clear description of the perfect city as Mr. Taylor sees it. The overall formula, pleasure. The things which are disgraceful by convention are noble with the birds, namely because they are noble by nature. That is in fact the birds society is a natural society. Beating the father, of course, if you you know, you have again examples in the daily paper. The boy is told he shouldn't do that, his mother nags him. According to the law, he has to obey. According to nature, he can hit back. Yeah? 
And even he, I think if he kills her, according to a certain interpretation of American law, he will be regarded as uh, well as in need of, of psychiatric treatment and not as someone who has done something disgraced. No slave, nothing wrong with cowardice. He has a harsh duties of civic life. They are out. No distinction between citizens and foreigners. It is a hardship for the foreigners. No such distinction. Why? Because it is a universal state. A, a completely pleasant society must be a universal society that is, is said today and that was already known uh, to Aristophanes and some foreign men. So we have now, I think, a clear picture of what happens. At this moment, or shortly after the founding of the city begins, the first question is how it should be called. Uh, perhaps we read that. That's in the translation, page 338, bottom, verse 809. Yeah? Uh, where visitors and well, speaks, yeah. Speak. yeah, first we must give the city a, a, pure, a great and splendid name, yeah. yeah, and then we must sacrifice to the gods after that. That's the plan of the forest, yeah. Well, that's, uh, first we must give the city some grand big name, and then we'll sacrifice to the high gods. That's my opinion also. Well, then let's consider what the name shall be. What think you of the grand Laconian name, Sparta. What, Sparta for my city? No, I wouldn't use a Sparta for my caliph, not if I'd courts by Her Heracles, not I. Well, how shall we name it then? In you see, just as he rejected aristocracy in the earlier stage, yeah, when they wanted a good city, they reject now the very name of Sparta. That's all, yeah? How shall we name it then? Well, there's been some fine, ma maniloquent name drawn from these upper spaces in the clouds. What think you of Cloud Googleberry? Oh, good, good. You have found a good big name, and no mistake. Is this the great Cloud Googleberry town where all the wealth of Ascrinis lies hid and all of the Agenes? Best of all, this is the plain of, Fledg of Fledra, where the gods outshot the giants at the game of brag. And so on. Now, and then there has to be a, a found a protecting god in particular, and that you, uh, that's of course a bird, and in this case a cock. And then, after these most urgent questions have been settled, one must sacrifice, because that is a sacred action, the founding of the polis, to the gods but naturally to the new gods, yeah, to the birds, of which Pisteterus is now the ruler, that is a beautiful inversion, you know, the ruler of the bird sacrifices to his subject. And a priest has to be called in to sacrifice to the new gods. This uh, pious man has no trepidation to sacrifice to the <coughs> heirs to the Olympian gods, but he is sent away, not because uh, of any orthodoxy of his, but because he invites too many birds, i.e. gods, and so not sufficient remains for these new gods to feed on. And Pistadarius himself will bring the sacrifice, but is interrupted by another individual, namely by a poet. The poet takes the place of the priest. The poet lies, as would appear if you would read it, and as would not surprise you, because that was a common Greek saying, the poets lie much. They tell many stories which are not true. In high Pindaric lyric poetry, he asks for presents, which he receives. They are garments taken away from the priest's assistant. You see that the poet is in every respect the successor to the priest. He receives his presence because he may bring evil on the police if he is not satisfied. How could he 
a poor poet brings evil on the body. I mean, he has no, he ain't got no machine guns as a poet. You know, I have to say what are atomic bombs, but what are they? Atom. Yeah, and how does it work to the detriment of the police? Could it work to the detriment of the police? By persuasion. Huh? It can persuade them. The fame, the fame of the, the poets are most powerful regarding the fame of individuals and cities, and therefore they have to be respected. It is, Epistadelus says explicitly here in verse 947, one must benefit or help the poet, that's the principle. But he's also sent away, but not quite just as the poets are sent away in the Republic, but in a much more friendly spirit. Then there comes the Oracle Man, and he is thrown out with other disgrace. He begs for a present as a poet. But in color distinctions of poet, the basis of his begging are holy texts. The poet didn't a poet beg. And he had, ho- had beautiful songs. But there was no direct connection. But he begs on the, on the basis of holy divine texts, and he doesn't receive anything. He's a boaster. Yeah. The things which he says are not true. And then we come to another individual who is most important to us, and that is Meton, in translation on page 45, verse 992. Now read that. I've come amongst you. Yeah. There's some new misery, this. Come and to the work. this is fellow Meton, yeah, yeah. What's your schemes for an outline? What is, what's your desire? What buskins on your foot? I come to survey this air of yours and meet it out by acres, heaven and earth. Whoever are you? Whoever am I? I am Maton, known throughout Hellas and Colonus. And what are these? Oh, they're rods for air surveying. I'll just explain. The air's in outline like one vast extinguisher. So then observe, applying here my flexible rod and fixing my compass there. You understand? I don't. With the straight rod I measure out that so the circle may be squared and in the center a marketplace. Head streets be leading to it straight to the very center, just as from a star, though circular straight rays flash out in all directions. Why, the man's a Thales. You see, that was a very, uh, as in some circles today, the man is an Einstein. Yeah, or Newton. <laughs> Meton, by the way, he was an actor, the uh, man who actually lived in Athens, certainly know a little bit about him. Yes, go on. Meton, yes, what? You know I love you, Meton. Take my advice and slip away and notice. Why, what's the matter? Well, as in Lacedaemon, there's stranger hunting and great disturbance and blows in plenty. What, a revolution? No, no, not that. Then what then? Well, they're all resolved with one consent to wall up every quack. Yeah, all uh, boasters, all boasters. I'd best be going. Hey, I'm not quite certain if you're in time. See, see the blows are coming. Oh, murder, help. I told you how it would be. Come, measure off your steps some other way. You, know, so you see, it is by no means certain, as uh, the commentators apparently assume, that Pisteteros is, speed, is speeding him. Huh? It could very well be from the citizens. But even if the question is undecidable on the basis of the text, uh, if Pisteteros speeds him, he would not do it on his own accord. He says, I'm not speeding. But the police doesn't stand for that kind of thing, what you do. Meton is the only one with the proper name of these five people, because they're, they're of the other people, some other people. Meton, and that is something else which reminds us of, we had already met one astronomer in the clouds. So that Meton does not ask for anything. He just wants to, to do something there. You see, it's a, a combination of uh, Astronomy with town planning. (laughs) 
but the police does not tolerate any of them. And he is beaten. Yeah, he is beaten. And it, it, it is important. You see, the city is in a way meant to be followed. Yeah, geometric, geometric. And this, uh, these regular cities. Well, in this country, the best example is, of course, Washington itself. You know, in the 18th century, these kind of cities were rather common. Yeah, in, also in Europe, in the in the age of reason, people built rational cities, and the most rational forms seem to be one center. In Paris, you have also an example in the Etoile, those of you who were there, and there are some cities of Germany uh, from the same age and the same kind. And the source of that, if you can say that, is a remark in Descartes' a discourse on method, where he just makes a opposes the old cities, where people just build houses and they saw fit. And later on, it's a complete mess, a medieval city, you know, and uh, the old upper stories uh, obstructing a light and uh, all kinds of things. And then, on the other hand, a planned city with perfect order. That shit. That is not an interesting example. That is the 17th age, age of rationalism. But the same thing existed in Greece. And we know this from a passage in Aristotle's politics about such a town planner called Hippodamus. And Meton is the same kind of fellow. Yeah? An astronomic founder of a city who tries to establish the heavenly order on Earth, yeah. also a Platonic thing. In Plato's Critias, there is a city of this kind described, which is a perfect order in Atlantis, uh, which has something to do with Syracuse. However, the, the main point is the only individual coming to that sacrifice, uh, who has a proper name, is, is an astronomer. And he is a, plays a very special role because he is loved by the founder. But the founder cannot tolerate him for the sake of the police. The other fellows who come afterward are not very interesting. There is one uh, inspector who is also beaten by Pistateros, uh, but there is no reference made that this has anything to do with the sentiment of the citizens. And it's the same applies to the six individuals, the seller of the Greek decrees, who is also beaten by and the stand away by the Pistoleros. And at the seventh and last place, the inspector and the seller of decrees together. So from, if we count in the way which I suggested, a metal would be in the middle, which is, uh, I believe, what the poet means, the central figure. The police cannot tolerate astronomy. We know that there are different clouds. Now, we let us, in some further aspects of the, of the city of the birds come to light in the secret. If you will turn in the translation to the middle of page 48, which is verse 1071, yeah? I mean, some, it's the first, the basic ordinances of the new city, yeah? Listen to the city's notice, specially proclaimed today. Sirs, Diagoras, Emilian, whosoever of your slay shall receive reward one talent, and another will bestow if you slay some ancient tyrant dead and buried long ago. You see, now, the other is of, of Milos was a fellow accused of atheism in Athens. Yeah? And he's, of course, also intolerable for the perfect city. Yeah? Atheism and tyranny are the two things which are incompatible with a good city. Tyranny opens oppression, and atheism for other reasons. The next two words, three words, yeah? We, the birds, will give a notice. We proclaim with right good will, sirs, Philocrates, Sparovian, whosoever of you kill, shall receive reward one talent, if alive you bring him four. Him who strings and sells the finches. And so on, that's only one. What does this show? This, this, this uh, ordinance. The difference made between alive and dead. Bring in alive and dead. 
for conclusion, I mean, when you see this in Western movies, they, no difference, alive or dead, but they uh, make an enormous difference here. What does it show? You pay much more, it's brought in alive. Or do you think that's a sufficient reason? Yeah, but why are they so eager to have him alive? And vindictiveness, yeah. Vindictiveness. That is not unimportant, the theme of the vindictiveness of the police. police. Uh, I mean, we, the, the individual must not be vindictive. That is clear for every decent man. And was clear to every decent man at all times. But the police needs a certain kind of vindictiveness. That is, as you will see, one of the themes of the Wasps. The comedy to which we have made. In the sequel, we learn of the progress of the war against the gods, which, after all, the, go the gods have not yet been defeated, and the new gods have already founded their city. So we get all, uh, some information from time to time about the war against the gods. And let us read a characteristic scene at the Top of page 54, which is verse 12 and that's certain. You cannot read everything. I, from the Father to mankind, I'm flying to bid them on their bullock slaughtering hearths slay sheep to the Olympian gods and steam the streets with sabre. What do you say? What gods? What gods? To us, the gods in heaven, of course. What are you gods? What other gods exist? Birds are now gods to men, and must men must slay victims to them, and not by Zeus to Zeus. That's true, yeah. By Zeus to not not by Zeus to Zeus. That's true, I don't say it, yeah. Yes? Oh, fool, 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 spur not the mighty wrath of angry gods, lest justice with the spade of vengeful Zeus demolish all thy race, and fiery vapor with Thy Simonian strokes incinerate thy palace and thyself. Now listen, girl, have done with that bombast. Don't move, a Lydian or a Phrygian is it? Do you think to terrify with words like those? Look here, if Zeus is an enlightened man, he cannot be impressed by these old stories. Yeah? If Zeus keeps troubling me, I'll soon incinerate his great Amphion domes and halls of state with eagles carrying fire. And up against him to high heaven, I'll send more than 600 stout porphyrian rails, all clad in leopard skins. Yet I remember when one porphyrian gave him toil enough. And as for you, his waiting maid, if you keep troubling me with that your outrageous waves, I'll outrage you, and you'll be quite surprised to find the strength of an old man like me. Oh, shame upon you, wretch, your words and you. Now then, be gone, shoot, shoot. The Arax attacks. My father won't stand this, I vow he won't. Now, Zeus of mercy, maiden, lie you off, incinerate some younger man than I. So, in other words, uh, that, uh, the, uh, the gods are absolutely calm for nothing. Yeah? In the secret, then, the old man, the, the fame of this new, perfectly happy city spreads to all men, and all men are filled with arrows, with longing for the city of birds, and they wish to immigrate to that happy state. Again, this all precedes the victory over the gods. I mean, you know, the risks which these poor fellows take. Yeah? After all, if the Olympian gods win, they will be uh, exposed to terrible punishment, but apparently they are not afraid of it. And now we get a scene in which we see the first immigrants to the new city, the people who take that risk. Now, the first is a father's beater. A man, the father's beater. This scene we must read because of its great importance. And you will find it, I don't have the um, reference here, but when you read it, you will find it. For that I might an eagle be, flying, 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 flying over the surge of the untilled sea. Not false, methinks, the tale our envoy told us, for here comes one whose song is full of eagles. 
fie on it. There's nothing in this world so sweet as flying. I have quite a passion for these same bird laws. In fact, I'm gone bird mad and fly and long to dwell with you and hunger for your laws. Which of our laws? For birds have many laws. You see, that's so uninteresting. It is not quite as simple as this new happy life as it seems. There are many laws, you know? Oh, oh. But most of all, that jolly law which lets a youngster throttle and beat his father. Now, uh, if a cockerel beats his father here, we do account him quite a man. That's why I moved up hither and would fain throttle my father and get all he has. But there's an ancient law among the birds. You'll find it in the tablets of the storks. When the old stork has brought his fledgling starklings up and all are fully fledged for flight, then they must in their turn, in their turn, maintain the stork their father. A jolly lot of good I've gained by coming. If now I've got to feed my father too. Nay, my poor boy, you came here well disposed, and so I'll read you like an orphan bird. And here's a new suggestion, not a bad one. But what I learned myself when I was young, don't beat your father, lad, but take his wing and grasp this spur of battle in your hand and think this crest a Gamecock's martial code. Now march, keep guard, live on your soldier's pay, and let your father be. If you want fighting, fly off to Thraceford regions and fight there. By Dionysius, I believe you're right. I'll do it, too. You'll show your sense by Zeus. Yeah, let us stop it. So that was the first scene, you see. Now there is a great difficulty. Did you notice the difficulty? What's the difficulty? Very obvious one. Well, they invited them and now they were coming. Yeah, in other words, it seems to, up to now we knew that the birds can do to their parents what they like. And now this proves to be wrong. And immediately after Mr. Taylor has even said, yes, that's our law. Our youngsters may be their fathers. Then he wholly abruptly and illogically says, we forbid that. And what does this mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah? Does it say that the youngsters, does it say that they can beat their fathers, but they also have to keep their fathers? Uh, I don't know if this is a translation. So they don't have to see. Says, yes, you, uh, we, we allow the youngsters to beat the fathers. That's a good problem. point you make. In other words, you deny the contradiction. Yeah, they also, but they allow them to beat them. They also have to keep them. Yeah, the, the contradiction is only yes, killing only. against killing. That's a very good point. So there would be no contradiction. I was not aware of that. You are quite right. And so he says, you may beat your father, but you cannot what, uh, do what you want to throttle him and get his property. You can only beat him, but you have to feed him. Yeah? That is true. Well, uh, let me first try to uh, set forth my interpretation and, and uh, be corrected then on the basis of your suggestion, Mr. So, he says there are many laws of birds. One could understand this also as follows. Some for the birds and some for the men ruled by the birds. Here the suggestion is made some for, the, for birds in general and others of storks, as he says here. Now, then one would have to go to the question what is the special position of the storks, which would lead to a very complicated argument. The storks are there presented as the special guardians, the guardian birds, and so they are under special laws. And any of them is not the same law for every citizen in every respect. The birds may beat their fathers, even ki- even kill them. Yeah, he says so. Let me see. No, they may not kill them. That was my error. Yeah, they may not kill them. Uh, this, but the uh, assumes that they are. Yeah, he assumes that they may kill them. Yeah. And that's wrong, that's the error. Right. Yeah. No, in other words, you are quite right. There is no contradiction, there is only a qualification. That at least, but still, a contradiction is in this way. Not all birds are obliged uh, to uh, feed their old fathers. Only some birds. And that applies. And yeah. Now, Pistaderus refers him to that law, uh, which commands it. 
Yes, the children uh, to uh, feed their parents. And the interesting point is this. This very corrupt fellow obeys him immediately. Yeah? Obeys him immediately without any contradiction. How come? He is an honest man. He does not break the law. He did not break the law in Athens where it was forbidden, and he only wants to go to a place where he could lawfully do it. When he finds out that he cannot lawfully do it there, he obeys, and he does not complain. That is very important, because later on we will see there is another fellow, a, a sycophant, who is really a dishonest fellow, and who does not obey. So the man who, following the, a principle, even if a wrong principle, yeah, but is at the same time law, I mean, believes in a wrong principle, but is law abiding, that's not. Hold up, hold up, quite a few very important features. Yeah. Your interpretation does not quite jive with the one which I'm going to say. And therefore, implicitly, it contains a criticism by anticipation of what I'm going to say. But I must say, this kind of criticism is really helpful because it is concrete. And we must see whether I can account for everything you said or whether you can account for everything I have to take out. Now, to indicate a few points, uh, you say quite rightly, the attack on Cleon is incidental. I retract my words of praise. You said the Cleon baby is incidental. And that is of, it, it does, it's not the overall theme, that's surely true. But it is not incidental, as is indicated by the names of the two chief characters, the lover of Cleon, abhorrer of Cleo. Yeah? And uh, you know, in a crucial moment, the lover of Cleo and the Dikas call for Cleo to come. They send the boys to fetch him. Yeah? And he seems to be the only one who can save the situation for the Dikas, and Cleo never comes. So the absence of Cleo is a very important feature of the play. But one can say it is a play dealing with Cleon. Uh, but uh, with Cleon's absence, and we must find out uh, what it means. That is one point. The other point, uh, that what you say is perfectly correct, is an attack on the degenerate democracy in the light of the good old times, the old Athens. And uh, the, the Dikas as fighters for Athens, as defenders of Athens, that is unblameable, surely. But the question is whether that is the whole story. You know, the praise of the, and what you said about the last scenes indicates there is something else. This business there, which is introduced as a cure, are all novel things. So, the, in other words, you, the cure for the present decay is not simply a return to the old things, but new remedies are needed. And we have to identify this new remedy. Yeah, that would be our problem. To mention a few other points, uh, you made very clear, and that is crucial for the understanding, that Philocleon, the he hero Dicas, radically differs from his fellow Dicas. I mean, if the word Dicas is familiar, you mean, let's say, juryman. The hero juryman is radically different from the other juryman. You say he is mad. Very good. But the poet is more specific. He identifies that madness. What kind of madness is it from which he suffers? And the last point, which I would like to make now, is this. At the beginning, in the first four or five hundred verses or so, you said Bleon, uh, Bleon, Bleon is restraining his father. I believe that was the word. Uh, but can you spell this out, this restraining a little bit? You laugh, what? You seem to have the answer. <laughs> Don't hold back. What does he do? Well, this uh, sounds a good deal like uh, lost 
stork. No. The stork's laws and the, and the, the birds. You mean in what way? Well, he's restraining by all kinds of uh, devices, but it includes beating his father. It includes? It includes beating his father. I think so. At least he uses force. Well, he does beat him. He yeah, beats yeah, him I down know. the chimney. Even though, sure. though he's taking care of him like the story. Yeah, and even if he asks the slaves to beat the father, it's better not. So that was the point which you uh, omitted, uh, but that doesn't detract from the call of your paper. In other words, we have here another case of this problem of beating the father, or may I suggest the simpler formula, he keeps his father a prisoner. He keeps him bound or fettered. He binds his father. He does to his father what Zeus did to his father Cronus. So the great problem of beating the father, which we have seen in two Aristotelian plays before, plays a role here too. And as far as my present recollection goes, these are the three only plays of Aristotelian plays which deal with this subject. And we have to take a couple. But so my criticism of you, um, of your paper, is this. It was, very, it was a very good and clear paper, and you have seen quite a few important points, but there are other important points for which you did not account. And we must integrate what you have found into a larger framework, which also will account for the things you omitted. Does this make sense as a rule of reading such a but how much can you say in so many pages? <laughs> <laughs> Here, I repeat, your paper was, was very satisfactory, and especially if I consider that you did it at very short notice. Yeah? And, brought, and in addition, it's probably the first time you read the play of Aristophanes, or this play. Is this fair? Yes. Yeah. So there is no... Uh, I mean, you will get a very good grade. You don't have to worry about that. But um, I'm not now concerned with, with this uh, kind of administrative matters, but only because I'm now planning to turn to our general free for all. Well, I, I would just like to make one um, uh, yeah. comment in the light of, of, um, of um, the statement that you made about the um, particular way. I, uh, you said, I don't, I. I, I played Gildy. I picked out what I thought I was going to be And you did very well. Uh, but there are other, I mean, it was impossible to be Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you are perfectly innocent. <laughs> and I'm now concerned not with, with guilt. I'm concerned with an invisible adversary, because Mr. Haight isn't here. <laughs> Also with other invisible persons, other people whom I don't know and who don't know me, and who study such works differently. And therefore I use this opportunity, which you so graciously gave me, uh, for stating one general rule of it, that if you are confronted with a variety of interpretations, that is preferable, which accounts for most, yeah? for, for, for more than another interpretation. And you don't have to worry at all. Now let me uh, come back and be begin and uh, be begin initiate this discussion. Now the first condition for understanding anything, whether it is the American as the preparation for the coming presidential elections or Plato or Hobbes or whatever have you, is open mindedness. The facts, the data in the purity must be seen and admitted and not denied and manipulated. Surely there are different kinds of data. And there is, for example, the observation of how Mr. Miller voted in 56 and 52 and 48 when he voted for the first time, perhaps, and how he's going to vote in 1960. But there are also broader things, how our whole uh, uh, area of the country votes, or a whole uh, professional group votes in this country. Now, in order to apply to our case, the individual speech of a character, here's this one line, or the plot of the character, <coughs> these are both facts, but facts of a different caliber, different point. 
So that is clear, the facts. But then we come to the famous uh, fact that everyone approaches the fact with some previous opinion. He doesn't have to have an opinion about Aristophanes, for example. He may not have any opinion, may never have heard the name. But he has some opinions which bear on Aristophanes before he even opens a book. That is, take such an opinion, a very simple example. Poetry. We, I mean, everyone who opens such a book has heard the word poetry and subsumes this under poetry. And that is a very grave act. An inevitable act, but a grave act. Now, what is poetry? I mean, there are certain innocent things which are safe to say. For example, meter and rhyme, meter and or rhyme. In other words, poetry is non-colloquial speech, not prosaic speech. That is clear. And it is also clear that, uh, given the origin of the word poesis, uh, poetry, poesis, making, something made, something invented, something fictitious. Even in the case of a lyrical poem, where the poet, as individual Mr. Miller, expresses his love for Miss Smith or his mourning for the death of his grandmother, for example, what makes it a poem is that which transcends it being an expression of Mr. Miller's love for Miss Smith. And therefore, there is always something fictitious about it. That is the old meaning of poetry. But today, this has rather disappeared. And instead, we use words like creative. I mean, I know that people uh, regard writing a master thesis as doing, <laughs> or writing a, a social science book as creative work. I have heard that. Uh, but uh, still, the uh, more general usage is to apply to poetry in particular, yeah. or some or the other arts. Or we use the word aesthetic, for example, aesthetic experience. Now, these innocent-looking things contain a whole world, you know, a whole world which may uh, distort completely what we are going, what we are trying to understand. The least we must grant, or everyone must grant, is this. There may be a disproportion, there may be a disproportion between our previous opinion, for example, regarding poetry, and the opinion of the poet. We cannot assume that Aristotle is understood by poetry what we understand by it. That seems to be elementary, but it's not always considered. Now, since what I call previous opinions, is akin to what is now called hypothesis, but not the same. Let us make clear this difference so that we understand a bit the insidious character of previous opinions. What is a hypothesis? I mean, you must hear in many courses in this building sophisticated expositions of what a hypothesis is. I have never heard such courses, but I can figure out more or less what, what they must mean. What is hypothesis? Well, let me uh, make a stab in, in the dark. I would say hypothesis is an assumption which is known to be an assumption, number one. Yeah? Second, its terms are meant to be perfectly clear and distinct. A hypothesis is completely known as what it is. As the question is whether it is true or not, and that there are certain methods by which we validate or invalidate methods. A hypothesis. But what the hypothesis in itself is lucidity itself. As hypothesis I you can imagine that there are sometimes hypotheses which are stated in terms of shocking ambiguity 
and uh, uh, lack of lucidity. But that is a bad hypothesis. The hypothesis as such is of perfect lucidity. But hypotheses, and that is also known in the profession, have a prehistory in every case, or a background. And this, for example, why does Mr. X indulge in this particular kind of hypothesis, whereas Mr. Y in that other kind? Well, and the common answer is, well, you have to know the psychology of this man. So he X and the had an analytical treatment, and Y did not. Yeah, y, uh, y was originally a businessman, and therefore uh, all this kind of thing. So we have, in other words, we have a whole science which tells us something about the only thing which is unclear in our hypothesis, namely their prehistory. The hypothesis is lucidity itself, but it stems from a, from a vague and unclear medium, the soul, as it is called with the word which uh, is so rejected because of its, the murkiness to which it seems to allude. But the trouble is with this psycho psychological explanation that psychology itself <coughs> rests on hypotheses, scientific sense. And then we get again back into this unclear prehistory of the hypothesis. So hypotheses really are very good and satisfactory only in the, and that includes the validation and invalidation of hypotheses. That's wonderful, but only on the foreground. There is a dark background in every case. That is a home of the previous opinions. The previous opinions are deeper and for the same reason murkier than any hypothesis can be. And that makes it so hard and at the same time so important to reach clarity about them. There are certain social scientists who are of an admirable optimism and uh, naivete. They think if they write on, on the page one of their preference, these are my values. Yeah? You know, I know such books. And then they have clarified the problem of the previous opinions. But this is only a very shallow formulation of what they believe they believe. It is not a, not a real understanding of what it is. So, in fact, every understanding is a constant movement back and forth between the data, for example, the verse, or an election uh, campaign, and the presuppositions, uh, presuppositions, uh, the hidden presuppositions. And this constant movement back and forth it is meant to lead to a clarification of these presuppositions, not only to the validation and invalidation of their hypothesis, and possibly, if we are lucky, to correction of our presuppositions, of our previous opinions. Now, that we have to do that with poetry, at least to some extent, and uh, very superficially, but only the first few indispensable steps. And let us really start not be ashamed of being childlike. The older view of poetry was that poems have two functions. To please, never forget that, to please. I mean, you know that there is a certain kind of art now in existence where, which may have wonderful qualities, but of which no one can say that it could please. You know? You know, that's a great change. So to please, but not only to please, but also to be useful. That was an old-fashioned view of old-fashioned people. And for example, Horace expressed that, but that goes back much earlier. To please, that is not quite serious. It's a play, play. To be useful, that's serious. For example, if you learn something about the virtues of patriotism, that's useful, serious. But that we are amused by the antics of an old uh, drunkard who comes out uh, with a flute girl and uh, some uh, dubious prehistory, that's fine, please. But these two elements, to please and to be useful, to be playful and to be serious, are related. They are not just coexisting, they have an inner unity. There is one kind of human activity 
which has this quality of being playful and serious, of being of play and useful together, inextricably. I don't say a cocktail party. Because they are really we are separated. Because a fellow goes to a cocktail party to meet their VIP, it does two entirely different things which happen to coincide. That the VIP happens to drink there, and he can meet him, and uh, that's good. That is one in which they are united. How does one call these things, which are both useful and playful? enjoyable, boon for the senses. Now, this was formerly, is I think still intelligent when we say, something festive. And when you look, for example, at the commencement, where you see the combination of is useful, it's the conclusion of the academic year, the graduation, you know, that must be formally recognized, and at the same time, that is, you know, you don't go there trembling, will you, are you well prepared, and this kind of thing, this festive. Festive, let us say, the festive is the natural union of the teasing and useful. Festive, that reminds us of festivals, festivals, holiday, holidays. Holidays. If we remember the original meaning of holidays, which is in English so very clear, holy days. Holy days. Days dedicated to the worship of the gods. That is indeed, that is pleasing. I'm speaking now, of course, more from a Greek than from a biblical point of view, although even from a biblical point of view one can recognize it. This is the holiday. Therefore, if that is true, the so-called divine apparatus, which we find in Homer and Aristotle and in Scottish poets, is of the essence of poetry. Poetry without a divine apparatus is a problem, not the poetry with it. That is a great question how poetry without a divine apparatus, if you use it, could come into being that required an amazing change, which is, of course, partly implied in what such people as Aristophanes and Sophocles did, but it is not yet there. Now, let us now turn to Aristophanes. That Aristophanes is concerned with, it, with divine things is obvious from the place, but we have, in addition, Socrates' remark to Aristophanes in Plato's banquet that Aristophanes deals with nothing but Dionysus and Aphrodite, the god of wine and the god of love, the goddess of love, wine and love. That is indeed not peculiar. That is a very characteristic of Aristophanes, of a certain kind of poets, not of all. That these two gods, Dionysus and Aphrodite, wine and love, both with the capital letter, are his concern. Wine and love have this in common, the joy of life, the throwing off of all burdens, all restraints. Carnival is the, the closest. Western approximation to what the comic means. Carnival. Throwing off the burdens, not only of work, but even of decency. Decency also can be a burden, as you may know if you have read books on the education of little children. You have you have to be told the most elementary rules of decency of which one could not imagine that man was not born with full knowledge of them. Now let us then look at the, the and here I come back to what I said last time, only training a bit. What are these spheres of indecency, which are so important as Tobinus? Obscenity proper, politics, blasphemies, but another point, which I simply forgot to mention last time, which is also important, parody. Parody especially of tragedy, of solemn tragedy. Solemnity is also a burden, just as a black tie may be a burden. 
It is, in other words, what is uh, what we see in Aristophanes throughout is an exhilarating festivity which is connected with Dionysus and Aphrodite. This work of the comic poet that he exhilarates us festive and not like a mere buffoon. And that this has always to do with recollections of Dionysus and Aphrodite in the years. No women were there, as far as we know. No, only adult male. Now, this work of the common poet is in itself independent of whether the comic poet believes that Dionysus and Aphrodite exist or do not exist. That could be done, I mean, such a work, without going now into any details, but at first blush, such a work could have been produced by someone who thinks Dionysus and Aphrodite are in the way in which they are believed to be, or that he did not believe them. He might be a man who does not even care whether they exist or not. Some upright idea occurs to him, how one can produce this festive exhilaration. And uh, the, the wonderful plot, amusing plot, and all this kind of thing, wonderful scenes, and, well, let others worry about this question. Or he might not do that. He might, in you know, other words, he might be merely a craftsman in this particular craft of comedy. In that case, he would not be a wise man, as the Greeks understood wisdom. The problem I had with Mr. Haid last time turned only around this point. I mean, if it were properly understood, properly phrased, and only around that. Let me, I seem to assume that Aristophanes had worried <coughs> whether Dionysus and Aphrodite, and of course Zeus and Hera too, are or are not, whereas he regarded this as a wholly unfounded assumption. I do not know whether he would agree with my diagnosis of his scenes, but uh, that is my impression. That, that is, however, uh, this question cannot be decided by any fire or, or preference we have to investigate. What we can say on the basis of what we have seen is this. Are two questions. Was Aristophanes aware of this question regarding the existence of the gods and of the importance of this question? Can are we here in a position to answer this question on the basis of what we have read? And if uh, whatever you say uh, gives you reason. Can we answer the question that Aristophanes was aware that this is a question whether the Dionysus and Aphrodite exist or do not exist, and that this is a, is a question of a grave question? What would you seem to say? What? Well, I think he was aware of it in that he is constantly talking about the people's criticism of God, of desire, for instance, as in the birds, to establish new gods or to be in a society where the gods are not observed in this manner or do not exist in the same way, to, uh, and also of the, uh, he seems to be aware, at least we seem to have said that he is, that uh, the God is a creation of man. We've yeah, said this that, again and again. Yeah, does he say that? He doesn't say it, but it's implied, I think it's... Yeah, no, that is already, that you see there, because we, as we learn from the wasps, we must hear also the other side. In this case, the invisible Mr. Hayden. Yeah. And we must take up his position, in fairness to him and to ourselves. Now, I would say, is there, can you quote chapter and verse which would settle this question? And to repeat, was Aristophanes aware of the question 
regarding the existence or non-existence of the gods and of the importance of this question. I, I, is, do you have an answer, Mr. Can did you smile? Well, the clouds. Yep. Oh. Sure. That verse alone would settle it. That so, uh, he presents Socrates as saying, Uc est Zeus. Zeus does not even exist, would be the correct translation in the context. Yeah? You know, this is Zeus, of whom you say all this, who pray so highly, he does not have this minimum of virtue, which consists in mere existence. Surely. And then, that is his grave, uh, grave issue is indicated by the whole play. It ends with the fact that Socrates' uh, think tank is burned down uh, because he had been arrogant, insolent, and yet tolerable. So that is clear. This question was in the end. And he, he, his own work showed it. But, now we come to the real question. Did Aristophanes himself answer this question regarding the existence of the God, gods one way or another? That is a much more difficult question. After all, the poet never speaks in his own name except in the paralysis, where the chorus speaks at least partly in the poet's name, and there these statements never occur. There are some slight exceptions to what I said, but uh, that's what I mean. So, so th therefore, that is really a question of religion, um, where um, opinions may very, very differ, and where the solution can only be found by these broad considerations, in other words, which interpretation can account for everything occurring in the place, and which can account only for part of it. Now, this is my statement of the problem. I would call now on Mr. Schrock to state his objection, difficulty, or whatever he might call it. I think that uh, I gave the impression that I had more uh, substantial reason to object to the uh, Yeah, but state it nevertheless, because uh, what you said uh, to Mr. Gilden in private is not uh, known, nowhere but it to us here. Well, it is uh, merely, I think, a restatement of the objects. That is, that you can't know whether a uh, poet or philosopher was aware of problems or raised questions until you examine them examine the writing. Uh, you, uh, when we started with the banquet, you gave us a rule of thumb that there's very little of superfluity in, uh, in Plato. Very little of? Very little uh, superfluous in, in Plato. Everything has a purpose. Yeah, I would even, as a rule of thumb, I would even yes. say nothing of superfluous. Mm -hmm. Well, the assumption seems to be about the same with Aristotle. Uh, yeah, but you must have seen also from my present exposition that I did not make this In other words, I can't believe it. Now, now you are, uh, now you bring up the crucial point. The real difference, which also I believe must have been underlined Mr. Hayes. We have a certain notion of what poetry is, what writing is, what books are, quite much. Through a number of observations, I have been led to believe that up to a certain time in the past, say, hardly beyond 18, there were a number of great writers, not all writers, a certain number of great writers, who wrote not only with great care, I believe there are today even people writing with great care, but with what from today's point of view could only be called excessive care. Yeah? So that's really not This possibility uh, has to be considered. Yeah? There might be. Whether a given author, say Aristophanes, has to be subsumed under the set, under the group, writers with excessive care, 
or honor the writers with ordinary care is an empirical question for which you should answer. Now, if you thought that I approached him with a prejudice that he is one of his writers with excessive care, you were right, as a matter of fact. Yeah? But that is not rational. But it was not, a, how should I say, a, a thought as prejudice. I mean, something in which, I, you know, as some people who have a notion, apply it universally. You know, like a hair, you know, for uh, growing hair and apply it to bald people as well as those who have plenty of hair and don't need it. And I can tell you the reason. The reason was the way in which I learned from the stories from Plato. That was one major point. But I, but surely, to begin with, everyone is entitled to say that it means nothing. So, you know, the poor simply follows it. But then you get into certain difficulties. Like we mentioned only one which occurs to me at the moment. We have these two scenes at the end of the birds. You know, first when they come to the, to the sacrifice, to the founding scene, and then to the immigrants. And in each case, there is only one with a proper name. In the first case, an astronomer, in the second case, a poet. And I raise the question, should this be entirely in yeah. Does he not indicate something regarding the special importance of astronomers on the one and poets on the other? And then I remember the following fact, that Aristophanes wrote two plays dealing with the persecution of astronomers on the one hand and the poets on the other. The persecution of the astronomers of course clouds. Yeah. So it is presented there as an astronomy and astronomy is the same thing. There is another play called the Thesmophoria Suicide where a poet is persecuted or universe. In the one case the persecution ends with the destruction, at least of the of the dwelling of the astronomer. Whereas the testimony for a suicide ends with the liberation of the poet. The poet can defeat his adversaries, in this case the women of Athens. The astronomer cannot. And there are other things in that. One thing given the other create builds up a certain uh, laws of opinion which is cannot be more than a cause of opinion until one has interpreted every line. Yes. But you see, since the dangers of terror today are along the now traditional lines of being very I mean it will be very boost poetry. Yeah. Then I, for this reason, I believe one should at least give a fair chance to show this approach, its virtues and its vices. And then we can say, is it that makes sense? Uh, th this comes out, uh, this approach is most crucial, I suppose, uh, when uh, there's an apparent contradiction in the poet or the philosopher's uh, writing. If one finds a contradiction and is unable to uh, resolve it, then does one assume from the general reading of the poet that uh, either he was, uh, if, if you assume, if you read the poet and find that he commits errors up elsewhere, you should then assume that this contradiction is resolved of uh, sloppiness, whereas if you find these careful in other instances, you would think that the contradiction uh, has a meaning. Is that yeah, sure, that would be one way. Yeah, sure, but it would apply also to other things. I mean, contradictions are the most shocking irregularities which arise as you commit. But other irregularities are, for example, lack of order. Lack of, you know? that he jumps from one thing to the other without any visible reason. That may be due to simple lack of craftsmanship or thoughtlessness, but it may of course also be due uh, to uh, uh, other reasons. One has to invest. 
there are sometimes, you find sometimes in writers, a remark about how they wrote. For example, in Plato, you have a remark uh, which is not from Plato. Plato never drops a word in the dialogues, as you remember. Yeah. Although you have certain remarks in the Platonic letters, which, which is this and so on. But here you are confronted with David the difficulty that almost all these letters are now declared to be serious. Especially the, track, the second letter, which is very a short letter, which is very important. But still, it takes, <coughs> but here you can argue uh, on the basis of the present day assumption that Plato speaks through the mouth, for example, of Socrates. Yeah? Socrates says in the Phaedrus that speech, and in particular a written speech, is subject to the principle of logographic necessity. Now, logographic means speech right? To the necessity governing speech right? And what is that rule? That just as in a living being, there is no part which is not important for the living being fulfilling its function. They don't even know that is. In the same way, in a speech, everything must be necessary. Now, the living being has a function to live. What is the function of uh, a speech in the highest sense? In the, uh, I think one can say to make people think about the important matters. Therefore, now, if we assume that Plato acted in agreement with what his own Socrates so emphatically says about speech writing, we are entitled to believe that in Plato's time, Every feature, however seemingly trivial, is meaningful. Is, is meaningful. Now there is, of course, the second question is where are the limits? Because not everything can be meaningful. I mean, chance, in ordinary life, there is all kinds of chance, all the time. But in a work of the, a work of art of the highest order, there is chance reduced to the minimum. But the, a minimum of chance remains. And therefore, there is the possibility of a misguided <coughs> subtlety that you seek something at upon this. That, that is a matter of fact, which, as all forms of fact, cannot be transmitted in any rules, but depends on experience. If I may give you the simplest example, of rules which are possible. And that is one of uh, which I have seen so frequently as very happy in Plato as well as other writers. And that is that in any enumeration, in any enumeration, what is in the center is most important. Now that is clearest if you have an odd number, then it's clear. If it's an even number, you have to consider the central pair. Yeah? Now this is never said. I came across it about 20 years ago for the first time when I discussed a certain passage in the first book of the laws where I was completely misguided by the argument because the argument suggested that what, there were three things. And the argument suggested that number one is the most important thing. But then I saw, no, the whole thing becomes clear and I assume this is second or central is the most important. And then it became clear. And uh, some other observations led me to this truth. Then I found, absolutely independent, in writings on common rhetoric, forensic rhetoric, that it was the rule of the rhetoricians, you know, for, for attorneys and uh, public prosecutors, attorneys, you defend, defend, to say that you bring into the middle of your defense the senior side of the man you defend. The reason is very, very simple. At the beginning, the audience listens. And there, of course, you speak of all his virtues, you know, that he has been studying at the University of Chicago, and got his PhD, and uh, was um, Rockefeller fund, and so on and so on, and also the famous, and uh, was running for Congress, and whatever you said. And then the little thing with the embezzlement. <laughs> 
the middle, while the audience is the, uh, the attention is flagging, and then when you say, uh, as everyone has ever made about this which knows, now I come to my conclusion, which of course means there will still be 20 or 25 minutes, but then they begin to listen again. Yeah? And so you will also bring them in these 25 concluding minutes, you will again bring the self-consciousness. Now, turn it, that is a, a vulgar rule of forensic rhetoric, which I'm sure is obeyed instinctively by the good uh, defense lawyers, uh, but which was elaborated as a rule, for example, in Cicero and other writers. And there was also a rule of tactics, of military tactics. Uh, in the front, the brave guards. In the rear, also brave guards. The cowards in the middle. <laughs> so they come up. And you see, the meek, cowardly, indefensible things, the dangerous things, the indefensible things, in the And it may happen that the most important things, theoretically, are the least defensible things, are these the least things, least uh, open to vulgar understanding. That's it. But very, I mean, the statements about this kind of writing with exceeding care, I have a collection of them, which is not too small, it's on the NFI. It's not too small, but it's of course out of an inaugural portion to the center which it was practiced. And it disappeared practically with the emergence, with a society becoming ever more liberal in, in proportion to, in, to accept <coughs> which a society does not exercise any restraint on opinions, on the expression of opinions. To the extent to which a society permits without any harm, whatever, legal or non-legal, to the speaker, to say anything he believes, uh, is a necessity for such a writing disappears. You know? I mean, that is a bit, this is not quite as simple as I said it, because there are still, in, uh, and there are very rarely do you find a hundred percent <coughs> But still, the Western societies are uh, 90 percent liberal, there's no question. And in former times, societies were 10 percent liberal. Uh, and therefore, there is enormous difference linked up with it. But I say, there are two things. There is first this possibility, which is a mere possibility, as a mere hypothesis, must be understood. And then there is a second thing, which is absolutely empirical. Is this, has this possibility of such a kind of writing ever existed in actual fact? And more particularly, has Aristophanes, for example, now, Mr. Cole, go ahead and go. Yeah. Um, do you distinguish between interpretation and hypothesis? Well, the, the interpret I mean, if I use this somewhat simplistic distinction, I would say that interpretation belongs to the process of validating or invalidating. The hypothesis would, in, in this particular case, be this, there are such writings. Therefore, whenever you study and the chances of the, the, that a writer of the 19th, 20th century would be of this kind are practically zero. I mean, I would, uh, I would not uh, consider it a zero, uh, unless I, it is forced upon it, but I would not. Uh, in earlier times, I don't know. And therefore, I'm open-minded. I mean, I'm open-minded, A, that he may be a writer without any such depth, this kind of depth. But I may, uh, and I'm open to it, but I must be, that is what my hypothesis compels me to do. I know that this could have been, and I cannot dogmatically exclude it. And so, that depends on the world, and, and I would say on the contrary, the simpler, the more childlike, the, the more, uh, uh, Innocent, you read and take the surface as a whole thing, the more clearly will it appear whether there is a deeper stratum which does not meet the eye or not. 
You began to touch on this when you spoke with possibility of several things, excessive several things. Uh, how do you go about distinguishing between what is actually? No, thank you. Yeah. <coughs> For example, let, let us take a simple thing like names. Yeah? That Plato in the first book of the Republic, there is a fellow who presents a certain point of view, who is called Thrasymachus. Yeah? And Thrasymachus means literally translated, bold in battle. Yeah. It fits him nicely, doesn't it? There is a guy who presents a similar point of view as the gods. His name is Polos. Literally translated, cold. Also, spirited, not very intellectually. Yeah? So there are the names in Plato, and Plato himself plays with them frequently. For example, in the Apology, the accuser is called Meletos. That was a matter of brute historical fact. But Plato uses it to find meaning in the name, because that reminds or has something to do with the Greek root for caring, meline, happy lifestyle, such words. And so as if he were called Mr. Kera. And Mr. Kera has accused Socrates because he cares so much for him. Yeah? So there are many others. Does this mean that Plato, uh, as, as the name like Caliphus, who is Caliphus, that's the only character who is not historically identified in any way. Yeah? There are some hypotheses, uh, uh, but for me, not know The name is absolutely unique. Plato has chosen that name. But whether I should go into the question of name and say I must really find some the stadium of meaning in every name which occurs, I don't see that. I mean if, for example, you have the Protagoras, and Protagoras if you translate it into Bible Protagoras, if you translate the name literally it means something like the first to speak. The first to speak up. Now it so happens that Protagoras in his speech says of himself, I am the first who speaks up. Funny. There is no, but if you look at the Gorgias, I don't think that you can find anything of this kind regarding the Gorgias. Why should they then worry, although there is occasionally a connection between Gorgias and the Gorgo, you may have seen it, but, yeah? See, where I would not, I mean, uh, if I observe something while I go, I wouldn't take notes of it, but I would not dig and uh, find, uh, overlook the wood for the trees, that is what I mean. These things in all matters, in all matters uh, of this nature, there is something like tact, uh, the sense of the reasonable and plausible, which comes from experience and which cannot be transmitted by rules. There are certain rules of freedom and belief which one can formulate and which are helpful, but they are never sufficient. Where one could, uh, for example, there is another example that there are a platonic dialogues where the first word of Cosmos of the translation, but of the Greek origin, is manifestly meaningful. The first word of the Republic literally translated would be down a bit, down a bit. Now later on, going down, in contrast opposition to going up, plays a key role in describing the relation of the philosopher and the city. Yeah? Going up or out of the cave and going down to it. The first word of the gorgeous is the first word of battle and fight. Of, of, of war and battle, of war and battle. Now, for, uh, gives you already something of the spirit of this dialogue. There are other dialogues in which uh, nothing of this kind is visible. Why should I stop at the first word and say, oh no, that Plato did it where it was convenient and he should not do it, this was not. That was the way in which I started to read the time at first which begins with very, um, uh, 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 how shall I say, pain words. What, what is it exactly? I forgot it's in the name. The code. Yeah, I see, I see. But then later on, by not, exactly by not worrying about it, I came across something which 
makes his beginning intelligible. That is one speech. Uh, is it not? Uh, the speech of Zeus. In the oh, the speech of Zeus. Yeah. Uh, which also begins that way. No other speech of Zeus in Plato anywhere begins that way. That is something. That is what I mean. I mean it's really a rule of thumb and of morals. And the main point is, as I always say, be good. And uh, I mean, don't don't sing. Be good. Read carefully and think carefully. That is all. But on the other hand, one must be aware of a certain kind of levity, which means if one doesn't see any meaning at one's reading, that there may not be more meaning than as many there are. There are, and I have not spoken of an entirely different kind of complication, I mean that there are writers of extreme care who have something entirely different in mind than these old writers, uh, and where it is, I believe, impossible to discover this kind of meaning, except if they have accidentally spoken about it. Now, I will mention it, uh, lest I wet an uh, appetite and do not uh, satisfy uh, For example, I mean, I have only one example ready at hand. In Goethe's Faust, there is a famous scene, uh, the witches, the witches, the witches Sabbath, yeah, the witches Sabbath. I've never, I mean, it, it plays a certain role there in the context of the plot and so on, yeah, but um, that was about all what I understood. And then I read in a, in a letter which Goethe wrote, and which uh, I found by sheer accident, uh, that he says, that is a description of a decaying society shortly before the revolution. I do not call it literal. I must confess this idea, but it never ever occurred to me. And why? Now, what Goethe did was this. Goethe tried to convey the sensible expression, the expression on, uh, on the impression on the senses of two such entirely different things as a rich Sabbath on the one hand, and a very sophisticated, decaying society like the French nobility by the French Revolution. You know, what, you see, the common thing was an aesthetic impression, strictly speaking, meaning for the senses. Whereas in this kind of literature I have in mind, it is never mere the sense of expression, but there are some clear indications in speech. So one would say that it's called the one logical, derived from speech, and the other aesthetic that exists. And I believe that what the better critics today consider exclusively is this kind of sensual, aesthetic element, you know, which indeed does not convey a, a, a clear a meaning. But I do mention only one example uh, among thousands of people. When you take an author like Thucydides, well, everyone who has read Thucydides, even in a translation, knows that this is a deep thing. Very dense and thought out. Yeah, but what people overlook, and which I think obstructs the deepness in Thucydides, is a certain kind of Playfulness, which to see this is. One example. The first two speeches which occur in the first book. The one begins, the first begins with the word just, dicker. The second begins with the word necessary. Well, of course, one must think a bit and then uh, on the basis of the and then one will know that these are two very different, positively conflicting considerations justice and necessity. Now, the beauty, as far as I understand it, is this, that the appeal to justice by beginning with the word just is made by the less just people. And the appeal to necessity, or if you call it, if you please, experience is made by the people who were less unjust. That is not implausible. We all have seen people who talk more about justice 
precisely because they care less about him vice versa. Is this kind of, uh, uh, only as one of many examples. But the general discussion is not very helpful, except if uh, to make clear in the most general terms what in itself is a mere possibility. And uh, but the, the proof of the actuality cannot be given by a discussion of the possibility. And what can be created by general discussion is a certain plausibility, namely if we reflect on the fact that our present-day notions of books in reading and writing are naturally delivered from a liberal society. And the further observation said up to a certain point, say, surely not prior to 1640, there never was a liberal society. Athens was, of course, not liberal. Uh, there was no freedom of opinion, as, as a trial of Socrates shows. I mean, regardless of whether Socrates was condemned justly or unjustly, he was condemned on the basis of opinion. Uh, the law was clear. If Socrates has held certain opinions, this alone made him guilty of capital uh, punishment. That is, I mean, that I think is a simple difference between a liberal and a non-liberal society whether opinions as opinions are regarded as crimes or not. And the, I think the first example would be uh, the, English, um, the English Civil War under Cromwell, well, with the qualifications even there. And of course, after, after the Restoration, and that more or less at the same time, the same developed in, in the Low Countries. Is that the first example? Fair enough. The, the law, what the practice could be, very liberal. And it was so in, in some cases, like Athens, in certain parts of Imperial Rome, in certain epochs, but there was never a legal basis for that. And don't underestimate it. I mean, that is one of these follies of the sociological approach, that they underestimate the importance of law. Well, I mean, uh, uh, an honest man will always consider also what the law says, even if the law is not very uh, strictly enforced. And uh, we have considered this simple fact, the law which is the so-called sociology of knowledge, and maybe that liberal societies strictly understood are very recent phenomenon, uh, much too little. Liberalism in the sense in which I have used it now, liberalism has n meanings, as you all know, uh, is of course not identical with democracy. A do democracy is not necessarily liberal, and a monarchy, for example, is not necessarily illiberal. In quite a few respects, the French Republic, the Third Republic, was more liberal than the Anglo-Saxon countries. And at the same time, the Germany of uh, after Bismarck was also amazingly liberal. In no way democratic, but amazingly liberal. There are long questions. Good. But is there any point you would like to take up or before we turn to the uh, wasps? As you put it, which is hardly anyone can claim regarding any book in order to be sure that this is a man who writes with excessive care. If you have a, a sufficient number of examples of that, you are bound to have the prejudice that if you do that all the time, yeah. you still will need a, an examination, surely. But I can only say that the danger today is not that of uh, uh, unnecessary subtlety, <laughs> but that of indefensible uncertainty. Well, there, yeah. yeah, I mean, this wasn't really a philosophy question. There is a problem regarding Shakespeare, which you can sometimes find subtlety, a great matter, but at the other time there seems to be strong evidence of either carelessness or indifference about the published text Works. You know, that is, of course, a terrible situation. If you don't have uh, a good text 
and to that extent you can't be certain that you have Shakespeare. That's a great difficulty. In the case in, in, the, in the case of Plato, we'll be in a wonderful position because the text is really very good. Very good. I mean, there are certain dark passages, possibly corrupt, but on the whole it's very good. In our there is a great difficulty of, of this ground alone. I never mentioned that. The ascription of the individual speeches to different characters is largely hypothetical. Uh, that, uh, I mean, we cannot, uh, I take for granted that the common ascription is sound, because otherwise we would uh, come into an infinite question. Uh, it makes the impression in many cases where, where it was important to me. I consider that, and I think on the whole it is correct. But that is, uh, that is not in the clear, not clear in the manuscripts. Uh, that is a great problem. Surely that can exist anywhere. Yes. Am I right in thinking that your opinion as to why the reasons for this excessive subtlety um, stems only from the legal prohibitions against holding certain opinions? Or would you? Yeah, well, that is the most practical and the most, how uh, uh, should I say, unsubtle and uh, reasonable. Yeah, and uh, therefore, uh, well, I wrote once some essays with the title Persecution, and there are writing yeah, that uh, indicated it. That uh, clearly. But you see, the thing, to, uh, if you go a little bit deeper, it turns around as follows. Let us assume that a writer knows certain, op certain opinions cannot be questioned without committing a crime. Yeah. It do, doesn't have to be a legal crime. It doesn't have to be a capital crime, but social ostracism to regard as a dirty fellow is not something which a proud man would like to have, yeah? I mean, in other words, if there are forbidden opinions, or whatever you call it, that comes up for all men, yeah, for all thinking, who do not agree, who, who thinks that these forbidden opinions are wrong as yeah. Good. Now, if these there are, here is a, a crossing of the roads. A man may say, well, I'm going to prepare a society in which no opinions will be forbidden, a liberal society. Then this would be a kind of temporary concession to the prejudices of a benighted, illiberal society. A simple example of that would be Thomas Hobbes, who practiced a certain amount of concealment, but quite clearly with the prospect, 100 years from now, this kingdom of darkness, as he called it, will have been dissolved. Yeah. The alternative, which is more interesting, is this, that the man says, you will never have liberal society. If you destroy this particular opinion, say about Zeus' uh, relations to Hera and the uh, Kronos and so on, you will get another set of opinions which may be a bit better, which may also be considerably worse for all you know. So there will always be opinions which are not quite reasonable. Now such a man, of course, in such a case, it becomes a matter of responsibility and not of mere fear uh, to be careful, yeah? The demons of all that, yeah? Is this clear? Yes, it was. Yeah, 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 sure, both exist. I mean, the most simple, of course, is the case of what they call in Tsarist Russia, Aesopic language. I mean, taken service from the fables of Aesop, yeah? Or how do you pronounce it? Aesop, Aesop, Aesop? Yeah. Yeah. You speak it always, you tell stories about some nice little animals, rats and uh, squirrels, and, but you mean really the Prime Minister and, uh, <laughs> and so on. Yeah, good. That's it. And uh, they also call it, as I've seen, I saw from a, a communist writer, very funny. When they speak of all their times, they call it the language of slaves. Yeah. Yeah, but what they do now, that, uh, 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 by the way, is to read such a book is Pasternak. Uh, Dr. Shibabu is not uninteresting from this point of view, although it's extremely simple. Uh, he's, you know, his complete science about the Stalin era, uh, uh, which has a simple explanation that it is too terrible to say 
is beyond speech. It has, of course, also the implication is that he couldn't dare to write about it. Good. That's simple. You know, it's very, it, a man merely bows to the baronet and not him. That's a more, much more interesting thing that the baronets are farther remote and a broader view is behind it. Yeah? I mean, it's more exciting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, and uh, well, uh, for example, the question of Shakespeare is an infinite question. That is only the smallest part of it. I mean, the fact well, I meant that, the yeah, scholars yeah. argue for this indifference. Because other poets produce very excellent texts of their poems in that same period. Yes. No, that's, I don't know. I mean, since one knows so very little about Shakespeare's external life and all kinds of things might be uh, might be possible, that uh, I don't believe that uh, Shakespeare was careless regarding any verse he wrote from the little bit of his what I understood. But he might have been compelled by things beyond his control. He might be unhappy, unable to care about the printing. I don't know why. But, well, we have uh, it, uh, co for a coherent discussion of the vast. Uh, we do not have the time. And the, I will perhaps like, uh, I should make a few general remarks, and uh, which we will take up later next time. Now, as I said at the beginning, in fairly and politely taking issues, Ms. Lowe, that the question, which the point which you stated very well, that Philoclion, the father, friend of Cleon, the lover of condemnation. I mean, he is not only a lover of law courts, he loves to condemn. And in the scene with that dog, what the son achieves is by his trickery, as you rightly call it, is an acquittal. He likes to put So what is his government? That is a great question. What now what does he do? And she said this is not a unnecessary question or, or an improper question, is indicated by the fact that he, it is answered in the play more than once. Why does he love to condemn? I mean, that is first a character trait. He is an ill temper, a discolor. Ill temper. Sure, an old ill tempered fellow. And the term is also applied sometimes to the other deacons, but that is not his special man. Do you remember what? Oh, I mean, what is the special reason which the reason peculiar to Philocleon? Why he loves to condemn the Delphic oracle. So strictly speaking, he does not love to condemn. He feels morally obliged to condemn because of the Delphian origin. Is it not interesting that Socrates too traces his mission, an entirely different mission, to the Delphic oracle? You see how, for what difficult purposes that oracle could be used. So the Delphic oracle. And that means ultimately the gods, the gods have such an influence. That is one very important consideration. Now the other point is this, which is connected. We have in a way answered the question, what is the difference between the other Dika, other jurymen, and the hero jurymen? The other fellows are simple fellows. They don't have such kind of religious obligations. They don't feel that obligation to condemn. But there is another difference which is equally important, although much more external, between the hero of the uh, juryman and the mass of the juryman. That is, there are, I grant that there are passages which obscure it, but the plot as a whole brings it out with perfect clarity. What is the motivation of the poor fellows these old guys who go to the jury, uh, to the court, and uh, do their duty. Money. Money. Uh, and why do they do that, may I ask? Why are they so interested in money? They are poor. poor. And there is a long scene 
uh, between a father jury man and his boy, which brings it out, that whether they have tonight, I don't say a steak, but a hamburger, depends on whether there was a sitting of the jury. What about the hero? He has a married son, at least. Sure, you know, that he does not, on the contrary, he is wealthy, he's obviously wealthy, son. there are many slaves around. Two are, uh, come up in visibly, but there are others. They, they are wealthy people. And the son says to his, uh, his father, don't go to the jury, to the law courts anymore. You can feast at home every day. That is elaborated uh, with uh, considerable obscenity, what kind of pleasures he can get for nothing if he doesn't go to and uh, so they are there. So that only underlines the fact that the motivation of the hero is entirely different from that of the poor people. And the poor people are the ones uh, who are easily convinced, who are from a certain moment on, after the, the son has made his speech, fully on the side of the son. You know, they, they are nice people. They are only, uh, you can't blame them. Uh, you, you can't blame them. They, they, are, they need that money. I mean, that is so as if you would, um, uh, and does not suggest the abolition of social security or the progress of income tax, if I may suggest present day equivalence. No, no, in this sense, it plays not political at all. Yes? Well, how much? Uh, of this opinion of the Dekkests is uh, because they perhaps held that they held a special place in, in the polis. They were ordinary citizens. They were special citizens getting their military pension, in fact. By yeah, that is already an improvement which they suggest that only former GIs should get uh, a common majority. Do you remember? They, well, this is the point that Weber makes at one point. Which Weber? Max Weber. What does it mean? About, you know, this was, the, the, the Dijkers system was a system to, sp to split up the spoils, the looty, the loot, the booty, the, uh, the land rents, and et cetera, that uh, Athens collected overseas. Yeah, man. More in commerce. The Aristophanes, well, however important it may be, uh, Aristophanes does not criticize that. On the contrary, he makes even the very demagogic suggestion that much more of that booty should be divided up amongst the citizen body, as you have as you as well, the border. They, they that reacted is, uh, immediately and, and uh, were immediately won by this argument. Yeah, yeah, sure, that is a political trait. But that is not the action. The Leon has no influence, of course, of the what will be done with the booty, where we are even that thing in empire. But he has influence only on his father. And so the action is this. First, that Berlioz has to bring on the citizen body, or that cream of the citizen body, on his side. Yeah? And then he does by showing them, you get only these few bucks, and the real uh, stuff is goes to the demagogues, yeah? It's a simple demagogue, demagogic trick on his side. But after the father has been convinced no longer to go to the law court, then that's the second half of the play that is as important as what happened up to this point. Now, what are, in other words, what he has to find after having persuaded his father that he will no longer go to the law courts, he has to find substitutes for yeah. Uh, you know, William James, I believe, from an article called Substitutes for War. He has to find a substitute for condemning. Now, what, and there are three substitutes altogether, I believe. Three things. Uh, which one has to consider? The first, about which you reported very clearly, is the mock law court at home of the dogs. Yeah? And that is sure, that can, but obviously that is not sufficient. Although he has infinite conveniences at home, again, I cannot say what his conveniences are because they are not quite decent, but all kinds of things which he can do while sitting in judgment on the dogs, 
which he could not do when sitting on judgment on citizens in the public law court, but your imagination may very well supply the details. That is one, but that is not sufficient, because then the whole problem would be settled. Two more substitutes come up. What's the second substitute? Easy. Pardon? Easy. Yeah, uh, feasting, but more important, in polite society. And that is important because here you raise the question, is very glare as a son not also, in a way, blamable, not to say a fool? And that seems to be the case. He tries to make a nice gentleman out of his father, and that ends in complete failure. I mean, and he does certain things which I think we all would find exaggerated, that he buys from the most elegant cashmere coats. Yeah, it's just Kagante at the time, the case it wear some silk stuff from uh, Persia. Yeah? And all, but the main point, how do you converse in nice society? Yeah? And he, the father has, of course, the crude, crudest notions, and the son tells you, don't you tell you have been pressed at this, and now, well, what could it be on this race, horse races, for example? Yeah. Well, I don't know how far boxing matches would belong to a proper theme of... Uh, no, but for example, Olympia. Uh, you're, you're sure and what is going on, the Rose Bowl in, in uh, California would, I'm sure, belong to uh, polite society conversation today. And then also uh, stories of poets, you know, this kind of thing. Yeah. So, but the father is a complete flop and he behaves like a rude rustic and gets completely drunk and drags out a flute girl and uh, very, uh, and, and uh, mayhem, you know, and a sort of battery. And as you rightly say, this condemner becomes now the object of criminal uh, charges against him. In this part, there is a clear failure of the of this clear failure. You must not forget, it might still be better that this man is fine than that he condemns other people to death. But to some extent, it is a failure so this, uh, to transform this, this fellow into a, a nice gentleman is hopeless. But that is not the end. What is the end? There are three such substitutes. What's the third one? This dancing scene. The dancing scene. I must say that I have been not the word. I saw so one of my friends Because I find the general impression it ends with a failure, but it's not true. The third is a success, as is shown by the fact that everyone, for example, the, the dikas, the jurymen, four who speak for the poet, are pleased at the end. It is not an end like the clouds, you know, where it's a clear uh, defeat for the hero. Yeah? So that the host, in a way, also was stop here. But here it is not so. At the end, we have a reconciliation. What is that? Dance? So one would have to understand the dance. Philocleon's bad temper, which uh, leads to a breakdown when he seeks a substitute in polite society, leads to success if one uses a third substitute. Forgive my bad grammar now, but you get my point. What is that? What is that answer? What's it about? I mean, in the most general terms. It is obviously a parody. Yeah, a parody. The names are mentioned of the people who he parodies. Parody. What has parody to do with the temper of philosophy? What is his temper? And what is parody? And what is his temper? You still don't know it. It's bad. Bad, yeah, here bad, tempered, and malicious. Is there a connection between parody and malice? I would say that a man of perfect, sweet temper would never buy the parody. Now let us look at what the poet does. One great part of 
the comments are parodies, especially of tragedy, but also of other sort of dance. Here is a use, there is a mitigated use of malice, which is universally pleasing and is a counterpoise to this viciousness, which is most hateworthy in the case of viciousness of citizen against fellow citizen. Although, as you rightly say, it finds good use in war. And, you know, when they use their states against the foreign enemy, that was okay. But you can't have war all the time. There must be some outlet for that. Uh, enemy. One form, which is not negligent, is comedy, which gives an order to the And that, I believe, is um, the malicious wit of comedy is effective as a substitute or cure for raspishness, misplaced. And so, there is not, therefore, I think the, 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 it is really a vindication of the poet himself. You remember there are quite a few allusions to what happened uh, to him with the, with the previous comedy, probably the clouds, you know, and this kind of thing. And there is also a passage in which, uh, we may read that next time, in which it appears that Deli Cleo, the son who binds his father, is the comic poet. But the comic poet who has no... Aristophanes is distinguished from Deli Cleo. He's a comic poet who has learned the polite jokes the subtle jokes that cannot fulfill this practical function of counteracting the masters. I think that is, I will try to develop this more fully next time, but that I think is, it really, it is uh, the end, that the ending is a happy ending here. Uh, one must emphasize, I must, uh, especially for me, that is, uh, uh, I have considered that before, Daddy Cleon surely makes a mistake, but Daddy Cleon has too high expectations from such, such a waspish man. But what Daddy Cleon does not do, Aristophanes does. He, he uh, shows you know, a, a way out uh, which is, uh, which is, uh, is helpful. Yes. Part being in the middle. Yeah, yeah. Well, this was also, yeah, but never do that uh, uh, mechanically. Uh, the day was very great that one was mechanically. But, uh, for example, uh, last time in the, in the birds, had the, the three immigrants, the center one was a poet. And uh, if you count properly, the guns also came from the founding scene. I believe you will also find that the astronomer was there. Although that is not uh, immediately so. Yes, I would not I think that is so. But uh, I would say this, no. You, you, uh, the question is not so much to see that something is in the middle. Yeah, that's a matter of simple counting. But, no, but I mean, rather as opposed to the beginning and the very end. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But the point is, why is it in the middle? You see, it, it is the most important. But from what point of view most important? Simply. Or is it most important only in this particular context? That is a question which must be settled afterward. It must be decided. Well, so we leave it at this today. And next time, Ms. Hill, we will hear your paper. And then Mr. Johnson. Yeah. No, Mr. Strickland. Mr. Strickland, I believe the key remark which you made is that in the problem of justice, as it appears in the clouds, is that Socrates is not strictly speaking unjust, but he is impure.
And uh, therefore, the question is, what is the relation between justice and piety? Now, it is shown that the Zuganis is not defeated because of his impiety. Strepsiades is not uh, really shocked by Zuganis' impiety for one moment, as we have seen. But he becomes shocked only when he sees what this means to the family. That beating the mother, beating the parents, incest, uh, becomes permitted on the base of souls. In other words, yeah, this is this is a, a key phenomenon, and this is unique <coughs> to me that the family is conventional and acquires its status, its sacredness, only by virtue of these humanly invented gods. Yes, I think there is much to be said for that. Do you want to limit yourself to that? Yeah. No, maybe this point. Yes. Or would you like to the... bring up another point? No, this is, I think this is a crucial point. Yeah, sure it is crucial, but you need to be Now, in order to be, uh, we must, uh, <coughs> I mean, if we want to have this class uh, to have any termination, and we are obliged to terminate it sometime, Law, we must uh, begin next time with our study of Plato, and therefore we must uh, discuss the wasps today, which we have not yet discussed. But the um, one thing I would like to do, can you state now, Mr. Haig, succinctly and clearly what your criticism of what is of what Ms. Connie just said? That the things in the plays which supposedly support this interpretation may also be explained as having been included for other reasons. And therefore, I don't want to say that this interpretation is wrong, but that if there are other reasons for the inclusions of the evidence for this interpretation, it cannot be said definitely and clearly that this must have been what Aristophanes intended. That is an excellent argument, but it's an entirely iffy argument, because you would have to say, show what these alternatives are, which account for the phenomenon. Uh, this is true. You asked uh, for a succinct uh, statement, and certainly I don't want to involve the class in any wrong discussion. Yeah. But my reasons... Yeah, no, this is in, the in there. All right, all right. I mean, really. Yeah. It's a pity last time I had really cleared the desk or the deck entirely for you. But maybe we can, uh, you can bring up some of these points later when we turn in connection with the past. Or did you want to add? Well, uh, I think another point that I, I want to make was that the just, there's a choice only between the just and the unjust speech. He doesn't seem to suggest that there can be any alternative to this sort of animal-like existence of the just speech, of the unjust speech, and conventionality. Does he, does he see no basis anywhere else? Yeah, that is a very serious and interesting question. And that is exactly, I mean, if you, if we go on from where you, what you said now, it would mean that Aristophanes overall suggestion, I mean, if we generalize from the clouds, is a reduction of human life to the life of the brutes. I say brutes because the Greek word so on, which we is animal, includes man. So, yeah, I mean, from the animal is uh, the genus. Uh, which can be split into two parts. Animals which possess speech, that are men, and animals which do not possess speech, that are the dumb animals, as we say. Yeah. And therefore, in other words, Aristophanes suggests a kind of return to brutishness. This interpretation, which is uh, not quite tenable because a man of the intelligence of Aristophanes and of a certain pride of his own craft cannot have meant it so literally, but there is this element in it. 
And that is exactly the suggestion which Plato makes. Plato, uh, in, in the banquet, what Plato suggests in the banquet is this. He knows, of course, that Aristophanes believed in wisdom and that the brutes cannot be wise. But he cannot give an account of wisdom. And therefore, it serves him right if one believes it as that. And that is what Plato presents. For Aristophanes, Eros is, as presented by Plato, Eros is strictly horizontal on the same level, yeah? Not vertical. The Platonic notion of Eros is that it is a striving for the highest transcending man. As often as understands it crudely, uh, horizontally. And another way of putting it is that in the assembly of women, Aristophanes introduces uh, communism and equality of the sexes, as a matter of fact, the preponderance of the female sex. Roughly as Plato is addressed in the Republic. But one thing is missing, which is so crucial in Plato and is completely absent from Aristophanes, in the, uh, from Plato's Republic, is uh, so crucial in Plato's Republic and completely absent from the assembly of women. The third big institution, the rule of philosophers. And that, of course, is related whether Eros is understood horizontally or, that is, you know, or vertically. Vertically means denial of news, of mind, and therefore also denial of the rule of philosophy. And on this basis, Plato has built his comical presentation of Aristophanes in the banquet, where the whole effort of Eros is a return to the pre-mind stage, simple union of the two separated parts, say males and females, and complete immersion into that. In that and that, of course, means there is no longer anything, uh, any object of the mind, where a vis-a-vis, -vis, yeah, here is this thinking being, and there the object of the thinking being is involved. That is what uh, Plato, that is, you know, I mean, surely, but Plato's uh, objection goes, of course, much deeper, as he indicates in the banquet, by having, Plato, uh, having Aristophanes change his place with the physician, Eric Simmons, who is a, a direct pupil of the famous pre-Socratic philosophy, Empedocles. The pre-Socratic philosophy, uh, that is what Plato suggests, does not understand mind in its specific character. And therefore it must reduce mind in one way or the other to non-mind. And therefore in application to human things, it must reduce man to brutes, which of course is not limited to pre-Socratic philosophy, but comes up again in modern materialistic and positivistic thought, where the same occurs again with him. technically perhaps more perfect, perfect, but I believe also less clear. So that is truly the point. But as I say, that is not an interpretation of Aristophanes, that is already criticism of Aristophanes, because Aristophanes was sure, uh, and uh, surely meant that there is something like wisdom, and which is uh, peculiar to men and not to the truth. And this is a distinction of the honor of men to have. Wow. Uh, even the policies, is, after all, a human thing and not a brutish thing. Yes? How did he indicate? This in terms of the wisdom. Well, it's a is what he says uh, in the way that what he says in place of himself. But f from this point of view, the fact that uh, the birds, for example, yeah. play such a role, you know, that uh, it could be used with, with a certain malice by Plato as a proof of his interpretation, of his caricature of our story. He knew this way. Uh, and the, I mean, the mere fact that at the end of the banquet, the only beings who are awake and can talk, the only really thinking beings, are so as 
and Agatho and Aristophanes. And so he goes off a little bit earlier than she does. This much. Now, what other point do you want to make? Exactly what standard is he judging the old Athenian policy by? Well, so this question must be uh, answerable on the basis of what we have read. Why does he prefer the old polity to the present extreme democracy? Is anyone among you who has an answer? It's not a difficult question. But all the excesses which he presents, yeah? for example, this, uh, this uh, jury system and this preponderance of the label of Athens, of the city of Athens, as compared with the healthy rural population. It's a simple, uh, I mean, what was common to the conservatives, if you may use that term, yeah? I mean, those opposed to Pericles, and naturally still more to Cleon, uh, the same, I mean, the point of view which you find in Plato, in Aristotle, in Thucydides, and, and everywhere. The same people who were afraid of the madness, yeah, that was the term which they used, of the, of the democracy where everyone had, uh, in principle, the same say. I mean, it's a simple story that the lot can make anyone uh, a jury man and even um, can give him one of the highest positions. You know that there were certain restrictions only on generalship and on the treasure. There you had to have, uh, I mean, it was it seemed to be imprudent to make a man a general who was a notorious scholar or had no military experience, or to make a man a treasurer who was a notorious ambassador. <laughs> Uh, so they were, but otherwise the restrictions were very small. You had to prove that you had paid your taxes, uh, or the equivalent of taxes, that you had, yeah, uh, had done your military, uh, had your, uh, done your military service if you were called upon to do it, and whether, and the interesting other point, whether you took properly care of the graves of your parents. That was also a point which was. Uh, used in that dokimasia, as they call it, in the kind of appraisal preceding election vote. The others who fulfilled these minimum conditions, their names were in the, in the urn and could be, uh, could be selected. The good old times, I mean, the, the point is this, whether these times were so good is a long question. And it is also a question whether each of these men who speaks about them was absolutely convinced of that. The general idea was a break, you know, to apply a break, to apply a break, and in practical terms it means, is there not a body of laws, that was not so clearly defined as it might be today, a body of laws which cannot be overridden by a psephisma, by a mere vote, you know, on a measure of the day. For example, it takes the case of Socrates, you know, the only political action of Socrates, the question of the generals or the hundreds at the Battle of Aginusa, they had not picked up the corpses. It was not a matter of the living sailors, but of the corpses. It was a religious crime because they had to probably go home to Attica for proper burial. That had something to do with the ancestor worship and this kind of thing. There was a trial. And in the trial, the, uh, certain legal safeguards, and maybe the decision must not be made on the same day, and I forgot the other point. There was a law that was simply disregarded. And so well, let's protest, and, and, and of course without success. Now, in other words, while in a way the assembly was sovereign, but that was not, uh, it was still understood there are certain laws which one cannot change. They don't have this simple distinction which we have between the constitution and ordinary, but something like it is this. Now, the old fashioned, were very anxious to limit 
the legislative power of the assembly. And uh, it will, in other words, it will insist on the fundamental distinction between a vote on current measures which had to remain within the limits of the law and simple change, you know, and, and outright change of the law. Uh, that was as a practically very important point, but it went also together with other issues, for example, the imperialism and the exploitation by the leading city, namely Athens, of her allies, or uh, not on anti-imperialistic policy, and uh, therefore one which was uh, more in, would have avoided the Peloponnesian War and would have regarded the cooperation of Athens and Sparta against the foreign enemy as the most important. That way, I think so. The, 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 the extreme democracy at home, which went together with an imperialistic policy, you see, that is of course very different from what's the lineup generally in modern times. The, the extreme democracy was an extremely imperialistic party, an irrational policy. That was the view of, of these men. I mean, Thucydides, who is particularly fair and, and restrained in his judgment, and who admits that Pericles himself, if he had been, uh, if he had lived long enough, would have saved the situation, you know, that, but uh, of course Pericles was dead at that time, you know, and, and the successors to Pericles uh, abandoned the moderate policy of Pericles. But their objection to Pericles was this, that Pericles, by destroying, you know, by, um, by bringing in the extreme democracy, made moderation entirely dependent on the accident that the key man happened to be a moderate man. The institutional breaks he had abandoned, therefore the opposition of Pericles. You know, it's just this, well, think of, you have contemporary parents, for example, uh, the issue which was raised by the Supreme Court packing two decades ago, you know, and anything altering the breaks on the will of the majority of the moment, that was a practical issue, and there, uh, I think everyone, uh, every sensible man was at the same time. And uh, there, there can perhaps be made a case for paragraphs in the given situation, but that is a difficult thing. And the prima facie case was for these people. I mean, we must not follow present day uh, inclinations and, and all kinds of wrong analogies uh, to think that uh, uh, to, to think that this were, there was mere prejudice. Um, uh, I think one can say that all the great writers to uh, whom we have, to the extent uh, whatever the, uh, the word democracy can mean something, can mean all kinds of things. The word is not excited. But the general notion of what is sensible, not the overall notion, it does not differ. So that the practical proposals of a man like Thucydides, of a man like Plato, Aristotle, and Aristophanes would not have differed to any degree. The difference is not there. The difference is in the principles which they appeal. And there was a crude political term that was the ancestral polity, something which existed or was thought of. That does politically not make a great difference. Uh, prior to the emergence of the extreme democracy, and that they were all united. And that, uh, I think, does not create a great difficulty. I mean, you know, of course, one has to assemble the material and uh, go to it by every point, but I think the result is fairly obvious from the beginning. And of course, there was a connection between this constitutional change to um, enter innovations in manners. Yeah. I mean, the, say, the old-fashioned respect for older people, respect for parents, respect for tradition, declined naturally. And then there was a connection between this loosening of the old morality and theories, what is vulgarly called the sophism. Uh, but here a difficulty arises because here and not all so-called sophists 
we are simply unscrupulous men. And secondly, that contained also a possible remedy for the cure. Uh, for the, uh, you know, and that is where, uh, therefore, the ambiguity of people like, like Aristophanes and also like Plato. Plato also knew a restoration was impossible. Uh, he has indicated as clearly as he could at the beginning of the Republic and by the personnel of the Republic. Is the personnel of the Republic, I mean, the, the characters there, apart from Sugaris, uh, to the extent to which they are, are not foreigners simply like Thrasymachos, where some of them, at any rate, were victims of the restoration, of the reactionary restoration which was tried in uh, by Critias and uh, you know the thirty times. Uh, that is quite interesting. And when and Bell himself says in the seventh letter he had to begin with his, as a very young boy of twenty, a certain sympathy for this restoration attempt, but after a very short time he the old democracy which he loathed appeared to him like the golden age. Look what an expression. Like the golden age compared with the business of his own relatives, such people like Richard and Charles at the time. So, uh, I mean, they don't have no use. The only remedy they could find was, to, was that this glibness of tongue could be put to a wise use, and then it would be even more higher than the ancestral polity. And is Aristophanes suggesting his something of this? Yes, yeah, something of this kind. Yes, it's the comedy. Is Aristophanes comedy? Is of course novel. Yeah, and his pride is the novelty of it also. But this novelty is at the same time an attempt to preserve in a through in a different medium and therefore in an altered form. So, to defend the police. Sure, he won't. There's no question. I mean, that, uh, that he knew. But uh, the simple terms in which the problem is stated, and, and uh, frequently he uh, does not do justice to near, uh, what Aristotle wants. Aristotle is compared by the, comment, by the fact that he writes comedies to present everything, in particular this issue, in, cro in gross and crude terms. You want to say something, Mr. Head? I want to say Good. Now, let us, uh, is there any other point you want to I'm still not clear on what yeah. justice is from your stuff needs. Is it, is it the old morality? Is it the new morality? Yeah, no, the question is an excellent question. but. I think you will seek in vain, as far as I now can see, a definition of justice. But can we not reconstruct such a definition by what we have read in other authors? When, at, I mean, you see, in authors like Plato and Aristotle, there are n levels. Yes. Levels of the highest refinement and also a level of the greatest crudity. Now, one has, of course, to look primarily for these crude notions of justice. Now, what is the most primitive definition of justice which occurs in better words and which is, on reflection, proves to be untenable, but which is good enough for many practical people? Return deposits. That is already uh, too subtle. There is a much cruder one. Give to each his due. Oh, that's still mm -hmm. more. That's the same one what we said. Kendrick says only yours is more sophisticated. Uh, no. Obedience to law. Sure, to obey the law. The opposite of justice is violence or maybe fraud. But a just man is a man who obeys his law by him. That's clear. And that he surely means. Now then, of course, uh, there comes up this little question, is everything which was passed by, um, every measure passed by the assembly in a moment of hysteria brought about by hysterical speeches of demagogues, 
Is this a law? No, of course not. A law is a, is a way of uh, a determination which has lasted for a long time. It's an old law. And that, of course, includes all such things as the family, the crude prohibition against theft, robbery, and natural murder, and so on and so on. This is what we still understand, I mean, in our ordinary speech about these matters, we understand a square versus a crook. And that is the first orientation we have in any justice. Yeah. And then, naturally, we know that sometimes a, a crook is not as crooked as it seems to be, and not as square is not as square as it seems to be, and therefore we have to ascend. And there the difficulties arise. So, of course, what Aristotle is himself does to some extent. And then, if we take this beautiful traditional definition of justice to which we refer, justice is a constant perpetual will to, to give everyone what is his due, surely, but who determines what is a man's due? The law, absolutely. But the law may do it in unjust men. Yeah. And therefore, one would have to go to the question what is due to a man by nature, not by mere human arbitrary yeah. And there the difficulties arise. But even there we have certain notions, crude notions, for example, one rule, which is not a matter of mere positive law, first come, first served, which has a certain uh, legitimacy without any question. But who, he who cares sufficiently to get up at six in the morning or five in the morning to be the first in line, whereas the other fellow is lazy in bed and comes at 11, the latter one cannot complain when the things are distributed, you know, that's one thing. Another rule of this kind, which is a more important perhaps, is that the more the wiser the, and the more responsible, the more public spirited should have a greater say in the community than the foolish and irresponsible and purely selfish. Yeah? And so we all kinds of things. But a poet is under no obligation to write a treatise on that. They don't also wear to different degrees. Aristotle certainly did it very well. In the fifth book of the Ethics, there is a long treatise in which all these things which are to which I alluded are cleared up in such a way that if they are properly commented, they are really exhaustive, you would say. But the comment uh, would be necessary, indeed. I mean, not that Aristotle omitted anything, but he, he is very laconic. And then there are certain things which simply have to be left by their very nature to mere arbitrariness. The most simple example is, of course, right and left driving. It is by nature not more just to drive right than to drive left. Yeah. Uh, but if you, if you take such a question like property, which is, I think, really is a central problem, uh, because uh, that murder is to be forbidden is, I think, uh, not a controversial issue in any society. You know, I, I think uh, there is no movement in this country for the abolition, I don't say of capital punishment, but of punishment for murder. But uh, nor for that matter of theft and robbery or embezzlement. But the question, of course, is the property, the, the ways in which property is distributed in society as a whole which depends somehow on law, you know. You know that there are legal ways of, confis of confiscating property, i.e. of robbing people. And the old argument was, what's the difference uh, whether a highway robber takes away your money or the police in form of a law? It's not also robbery? Great questions, really great questions, because it is clear that the police if it is to be respected, cannot behave like a robber. So they must have a good ground for that. As a good ground usually given is, of course, a public good. But is it not an essential part of the public good to consider the property rights, the pre-existing property rights, the pre-existing inequalities, or is perhaps this inequality the root of all injustice? As Rousseau, for example, said, and the socialists often said, 
that raises, of course, very important questions, really fundamental questions, uh, is an uh, absolutely egalitarian society in this respect possible and desirable, or is it not? If inequality is necessary, then, of course, one could rightly say, why should the injustice that Mr. X has inherited a million and Mr. Y has inherited zero be changed all the time that for once Mr. Y gets a million and Mr. X gets one. This is this turmoil, this upheaval in any proportion apart from private greed and envy. And should one not leave it as an ordinary traditional ways of inequalities, you know, and so on. These are the questions. These are, of course, the fundamental questions regarding justice. And I, I mean, I, I'm sure I have no doubt that Aristotle was, on the whole, in favor of a very uh, quote conservative policy. You know? I mean, in you know, other that there are certain ways of acquiring property which are regarded as just, just in, uh, like uh, purchasing and. Uh, uh, so on, uh, must be protected. Others which are unjust, uh, simply taken away by force or fraud, uh, are forbidden and must be punished. And these elementary things he accepted without any doubt. That there are difficulties there, uh, deeper difficulties, and I'm, I'm sure he was aware of, just as Peter was aware of, and uh, he would have admitted, I think, that there is a certain point where a kind of crude convention is the only way out. The alternative would be anarchy, destructive of all civility. And, but there is, one must emphasize whether it is a crude convention or whether it is a lucid law of reason. Because if it is a lucid law of reason, no exceptions can be permitted under any circumstances. If it is a crude rule of thumb, then it can be modified if circumstances arise where higher consideration demands such a modification. That, I think, is the issue. So the people who speak so much of the conventional character are not necessarily enemies of civilization. You know, but they, they, they may only mean that all rules of actions, of which laws are, of course, the important part, whether any rules of actions can be, strictly speaking, universally valid, and whether the nature of human uh, affairs is incompatible with any universally valid rules of action. That's the problem. And the standard was for the ancient thinkers always nature, the nature of man, the nature of human association, and which I think they thought gives some broad and for broadly, for broad purpose, sufficiently clear directive, not for any individual case, uh, because every individual case is different from the other. And what you can do for the individual case is to have crude decisions. As a majority of cases, this is the best thing, but uh, there was, uh, was always admitted the necessity of a translegal redress uh, uh, called equity, or the pardoning powers, or what have you, and also such things as emergency powers, you know, and emergency situations requiring them. This, I think, is a political meaning of that. I mean, you have good examples today, for example, as the issue uh, regarding birth control, where you have, the pro pro on the one hand, the proposition that is I overstate it for the sake of clarity, that is simply bad. And uh, there are others who say that it depends on circumstances and so on. Yes? No? Uh, well, would you say then that uh, Aristotle needs to suggest that prohibition against incest, the sacredness of the family, is a lucid law of reason, but that it has to be backed up by something sacred or else it would be broken? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, that, I mean, this extreme example and this extremely shocking example of incest is, of course, that is exactly the point. We cannot perhaps easily visualize a situation in which incest can be defensible. The simplest way of arguing is that we take the most sacred text from the Western world, the Bible, 
And we see that according to this account, there were situations where incest was absolutely necessary for the survival of the human race, first generation. We cannot know what would happen after a thermonuclear disaster where um, human beings might be confronted with a situation. Should, they per- should the human race perish or should they do this most horrible thing as a way for the man, of a recovery of men? We cannot know that. That is a very um, harsh thing to contemplate, but we are, let us limit it. Let us take an, an example which is simpler. It is the famous story of the two men on a, on a, on a raft. The alternative is suicide or murder. Both forbidden things. But you have no choice. That is the problem. I mean, that is an ancient thinker. So, there is one way, one solution, a crude solution, which of course was taken by some people there and which plays a great role in the beginning of modern political philosophy in men like Machiavelli and Hobbes. And that is simply to say, that shows you that there is no justice. Because when you go to the tough cases, the extreme cases, no solution, no just solution can be suggested. But when one can, of course, also take exactly the opposite point of view and say the extreme cases prove absolutely nothing regarding the normal cases. But one, one can admit that there are extreme cases in which justice fades into injustice without any possibility of distinction and still say that doesn't say that justice is merely an arbitrary human arrangement. Now let me see, there are some examples of that. Yeah, I think that is, uh, I would say, is a, is a simple difference between Sowers, Pedro, and Aristotle and say Machiavelli and Hobbes. That for Sowers, Pedro, and Aristotle, the key is that the orientation is by the normal case. Oh, yes, in present day ex- so called existentialist literature, this problem comes up, of course, again with uh, a deep unawareness of the oldness of the problem. I remember a statement by Sartre on this case in France, 1940, or no, 41, a German occupation. A French young boy, the only decent member of the family, his mother. The others are all collaborators whom he despises, a father, brother, and so on. And he wants to fight for France, free French. And he's in this conflict of duties. Shall he go to De Gaulle, shall he join De Gaulle, what he thinks is his duty, and then his mother, remaining alone, will perish, or shall he stay with his mother? In other words, a conflict of duty between the country and the mother. That things exist, and I think one can, it is not quote realistic, unquote, to deny that there can be such insoluble conflicts. The conclusion which such people like Sartre draw is this is the normal situation regarding morality. That he doesn't say, but the whole doctrine is based on that. Whereas one could rightly say, draw the other conclusion. Why did the French not fight in 1940, or rather before? And then this problem, in other words, is there not a responsibility there for a situation in which the most elementary human problems become insoluble problems? So, once they have arisen in certain situations, there is no, no way of acting uh, uh, clearly uh, and uh, with a clear conscience anymore. But to say that man can, under no circumstances, act with a clear conscience is, of course, an absurd uh, conclusion. Yeah, so, essentially, in this respect, simply uh, um, uh, connected with this way of uh, looking at the moral problem from the extremes and not from the normal case. So, we see our problems, I mean, um, uh, 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 what we study in Aristophanes is not very far from us, uh, not merely ancient history. Mr. Berman. Uh, I'm just curious, if you take that 
those two speeches in the clouds, the, the just logic and the unjust logic. What not logic. Uh, um, Don't forget that logic yeah. does not exist prior to Aristotle. It does not even exist in Aristotle. But in a crude way, you could say it exists in Aristotle. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Uh, one defending a brutish morality and the other defending a traditional morality. Well, Aristophanes certainly does not say brutish, and he doesn't present us in these three plays with a traditional person. Uh, they're corrupted, if they are, they're corrupted traditional. Now, in, in line with that, what about the Dikas in the West? The Turing. Yeah, but the, but the, you mean the individuals? The point that you, yeah, but even even with the Dikas, the point you were about, there has been a break. Uh, there, there is a break in their condition, and, and they can, they're not. There's no longer the same social condition, let's say, which allowed them to exist in the type of rural golden age which may yeah. have existed before. Yeah. Now, what I can, I've been trying to find a common denominator between three situations in the three plays. Maybe. The situations of the final scenes in all the plays. Strepsides burning out of Socrates, just as Stratus's, just as Terrace's, uh, final victory, in a sense, and the lockdowns dancing in the streets. I mean, if, if these are perhaps symbolic or actual statements of what Aristophanes considers as a just, a, a just reconciliation of the situation. I, I can't be. Yeah, no, that is perfectly correct. Uh, that uh, I mean, uh, I would study slightly differently. The fact that the clouds have an unhappy ending, yeah, if an unhappy ending in a comic manner and not in a tragic manner, don't kill him. Whereas the two other plays have happy endings, it should have been. And the second thing is that in two of the plays, the wasps and the birds, there's some kind of creative element in the ending, if you can call it creative. No, there's you a, can't. You can't. Well, I, you create a concert, but uh, I mean, the problem, you know what that means. Yeah. And you, you uh, vote, for, you elect a concert. Uh, or you create, God creates a word, that's also possible. But you cannot call this, uh, if you want to speak appropriately, you cannot speak of creative. But uh, is there an invention? Why not? Or invention. Yeah. There are two inventive situations, and one non inventive, uh, or one, one which doesn't seem to lead to anything, perhaps, in the same inventive manner, the clouds. Yeah, but in the first place, the clouds that Sogades was a man who actually lived, whereas it is safe to say that Philocleon and Delicleon were inventions of the poet, and Pisteteros and Euripides were invented persons. That is quite true. But otherwise, invention, of course, abounds in the clouds. I mean, did you ever hear clouds speak? Uh, did you ever hear, see a, a just speech, an unjust speech, coming up and having a good discussion with one another? Yeah, well, I was thinking in terms of the final statement in the play of these is just a type of category of what the way the situation finally evolved and what it means. Uh, why did the plays end in this way? Yeah, but because what Socrates does deserves to be punished. What uh, Pistadero does and what uh, Delicleon does to his father does not deserve to be done. Why not take this simple point? I mean, let us not underestimate these things. I mean, our abstract art yeah. in every field makes us oblivious of these very elementary which are so crucial, so visible For example, that Madame Bovary, yeah, the novel, that Madame Bovary perishes in a most terrible manner, yeah? And that is this, uh, yeah, this absolutely miserable and degrading end is absolutely essential for the understanding the very nobility of this woman. But if this uh, would be, uh, uh, that is never, uh, I mean, that is true, I think, uh, of every scientific or scholarly activity. The most important things are the immediately visible things. Not that they are, have the, have the 
And they said, give us a why. Yeah? They said, of course, the reason. But they are the, the, the indispensable starting point for any understanding. And there's this massive fact, uh, uh, I think that applies also to the Shakespearean play, by the way. These massive facts, uh, the happy ending, the unhappy ending, and, and other things of the same crudeness must never be minimized. They are not sufficient. I mean, uh, otherwise, there would be no difference between a Shakespearean tragedy and a Western movie. But one must also not forget what Shakespeare has in common with the Western movies. There is a kind of false sophistication, which one may very well call snobism which is as dangerous to the understanding as mere stupidity. You know, by mere stupidity, I mean unawareness of differences. Of I, I think I'm, I'm more perturbed about the reasons. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. But yeah, it's the reason. you have to ascend to the reasons. Then you have to see what, di- what is it what makes so that as faint in the clouds disturbed. And what makes it, what is it, what makes Philocle a much more abominable man than Socrates, yeah? What makes his happy end deserve to have But if the solution is not in the play, it can't be found. And it may still be that theoretically you cannot exclude that Aristophanes wrote the play in a state of complete uh, schizophrenia, drunkenness, uh, or what have you, and for some reason the Valga applauded it because there were some funny scenes in it, and so it has been preserved. That is, prior to investigation, everything is possible. And that is, of course, the burden of Mr. Hague's criticism, that what he says are, are, are absolute verities, uh, but uh, which are true, uh, which precede any empirical uh, investigation. And better that is a fair criticism of your whole statement, of course I can't say, because I haven't read it. But you tend in this direction. No? I need to see, I think that's all. Well, then let us turn to the last. Or, or did, did you want to know? Now, you will have seen that the play begins with a long scene where none of the two chief characters appears none of the two uh, chief characters appears, whereas in the clouds and the birds, a chief character, not three chief characters appear immediately. This is, uh, needs, this is also one of these externals, which need to be discussed. This way they have one. And it, it is a conversation between two slaves of Philoclea. They are on guard duty, but sleeping. They dream. Apparently, they dream things presaging evil, but the dreams are political dreams. They dream about Athens. Slaves dream about the city. Is this not strange? They dream of the city as theirs. That is some light on Athens. Does it uh, ring a bell? Plato's description of democracy in the eighth book of the Republic the distinction between citizens and, and slaves has lost its power. But these omens proved to be good omens after they had been interpreted. And that is perhaps a kind of prelude to the whole thing. Some bad omens, some things which proved to be bad omens, like the jury man. And the, the, the excess of the jury proved to be good omens at the end. Now, at this point, the wise interpreter of the second dream speaks to the audience in the name of the poet. That's interesting. You know, not only the chorus speaks in the name of the poet, other individuals, <coughs> individuals also may do that. And he tells the audience that they should not expect very much from this play. No such themes as Cleon will come up. Yet it is, in spite of the fact that it is a very uh, small thing, the comedy is wiser, cleverer, and more thoughtful. The Greek word implies, wise implies both, you know, the smart, clever, and also the thoughtful. Then the vulgar comedy. 
Now, what is the situation? Deli Cleon has locked up his father because the father suffers from an illness. You may lock up your father. For example, let us assume he is, has a pneumonia and running under high temperature and wants to get up, you can use force to keep him mad. Everyone would admit that. Even the most, those most opposed to any violence applied to the father. But what is the illness? Not pneumonia. Perhaps we read that in the translation on page 221 towards the bottom, verse 81 following. Nay, but the word does really end with lover. Then Sosius here observes to Derclus that tis a drink lover. Confound it, no, that's the disease of honest gentlemen. Then next, Nicostratus of Scandon says, it is a sacrifice or stranger lover. What, like Philip Zenus? No, by the dog, not quite so lewd. Nicostratus is that. Come, you waste words, you'll never find it out. So all keep silence if you want to know. I'll tell you the disease old master has. He is a law court lover, no man like him. Judging is what he dotes on, and he weeps and as he sit on the front bench of all. Now let us stop it. You see, the group, uh, uh, by the way, in this remark, when he brings out what the disease is, he uses the, the oath, which is not for translation, by the dog, which uh, plays such a great role in so it's uh, mentioned in public. Now what he says, he is not a lover of strangers, and then he's not a lover of strangers. And then the joke is that the word uh, lover of strangers, philoxenos, is now capitalized and used as a proper name of one individual who was a debauched fellow, and that is the case excluded. But the real point is this, he is a lover of sacrifices, yeah? He is a lover of sacrifices, this is not denied. That he is a lover of strangers is denied, and we will see later on that the wasps are not lovers of strangers by nature. I mean, the police, the fellow citizens, not the owners, but he is a lover of, of, of sacrifices. This is stated to begin with. And he is surely not lewd. And he's a man of a bad temper, a hanging judge. His son is opposed to him. Uh, after having vainly tried all other means, he keeps his father prison. And then there follows the scene which demonstrates the situation. Phil Phil uh, Philocreon, the father, tries to break out and is prevented from doing so by his son and the two slaves. You see, this, it's also important that the slaves force their master, you know. The natural order is destroyed in both respects. Turn to page 224, top, which is verse 156, following. Let me out, Philips, let me out to judge. What, shall drag the tides escape unpunished? What if he should? I once, when I consulted the Delphine Oracle, the God replied that I should wither if a man escaped me. A hollow shield, what a cross. Here, you see, that's the point. As you see, the lover of oracles, induced originally by a Delphine Oracle to become a hanging judge. It's a great theme going through the play. His motive is a sense of duty imposed upon him by the Delphine Oracle. Now then there is a funny scene where Philocrion escapes from his judge, uh, from his prison like Odysseus. Yeah? And uh, what, what kind of creature was it? An ass. An ass, yeah. You know, just the Odysseus and the ram. Yeah, what does Philocrion have to do with Odysseus? Well, that is something very simple and Oh, what, what did Odysseus, I mean, what uh, most superficial characteristic, which everyone remembers, and which links Odysseus with the hanging judge? Odysseus. No. No, no. But the end, the slay of the suitors, a terrific act of revenge, and beautifully prepared, and he enjoys the revenge, every bit of it. But also in the very scene here with Polyphemus, where he escapes, also revenge. 
the avenger Odysseus, but it may mean one. And of course, Odysseus is a friend of the goddess Athena, the special friend of her, which we must never again. Now, Delicleon scolds his father in very harsh terms and forces him back into the house. He uses the violence against his own father. The father calls for help from Cleon and his fellow jurymen. The fellow jurymen turn up, as a matter of course. Cleon never turns up. Philogion proves to be the harshest of all judges. Harsh like a stone. Yeah, we cannot possibly read uh, everything. Um, that is really very bad. As he's seen. Now, Philoclion comes to sight to the jurymen, and he is conscious of having done something evil. In other words, what the God commands him to do is to be hard to others, to do evil to others. At only one point on page 230 of the second half, which we might read, I have in mind verses 340 for them. He will let me do no mischief and no more loss to be tried. True it is, he'll feast and pet me, but with that I will comply. You know, that is a very succinct statement of the situation. The son does not wish his father to do evil anymore. He wants his father to feast what could be more fair and more nice. So the light is absolutely on the side of the of the sun here. But in this connection, it is made clear that there is a great difference, not emphasized, but we have to think for a moment, between Philocleon and the chorus, the other jurymen. Philocleon does not have the motivation of the others. He is not poor. He is plainly vicious. That's the only reason I want to judge. And he traces his viciousness, as we have seen, to the Delphian Oracle. His son will cure him of his viciousness and therefore justly uses force against his father. He debates in the crowds and the young man in the birds who came to the farm did not just be used for us. Here we have, in other words, here in this place, Aristophanes answers the question, under what condition can a son legitimately use force against his father? Here we have it. But the chorus is so shocked by such an atrocious behavior, and he suspects Delicleon of being subversive in evidence, a lover of tyranny, and a democracy. And then there is a discussion between the chorus and the father as to how he can get out. The only way is to gnaw through the meshes. But thereafter he may be attacked by his sons and the two slaves. But the chorus assures him of protection. Look at page 232, bottom, verse 387, where the chorus um, uh, assures Philoclea that he doesn't run any risk. Do you read that? Oh, nothing, nothing will happen to you. Keep yeah. up, old comrade, your heart and hope. First breathe a prayer to your father's gods, then let yourself down by the trusty rope. Go on. O oh, Lycus, neighbor and hero and lord, thou lovest the same self pleasures as I. Day after day we both enjoy the suppliant's tears and his waiting cry. Thou camest here, thine abode to fix, on purpose to listen to sounds so sweet. The only hero of all the things by the mourner's side will soon be seen. Oh. That, that is all we need for our purpose. Yeah? In other words, you see, the element of, of viciousness linked up now with the hero, with heroes in the fifth sense, the demigod, uh, who also enjoys seeing men suffering. Now, then that Philoclea still tries to get out, yet is discovered while he lets himself down. He is threatened with blows, and the chorus now sends for help to Cleon. In the meantime, a dialogue develops between Delicreon and the chorus. 
The accusations are again repeated very harsh. Telegrion is an anti-democrat, subversive tyrant. Again, he makes clear that but you to custom, to ethos, is an acquired law. No one will do this in nature. Here the argument between father and son begins. The son asserts that the Dikas are slaves and not the rulers. As his father asserts that he rules over all. And it is made clear that the argument concerns the whole polity, the whole political order, who is ruling in Athens. That is, a, you see the question, it's not a private question anymore, it concerns the whole affair. Uh, if you turn to page 240, line 3 to 4, it's verse 546, uh, sorry. O friends upon whom it devolves to prove the cause of our sovereign power today, now show us your best, now bring to the test, each trick and eloquent tongue can devote. Yeah, so the chorus encourages them. It literally translated on the, king, on, our, on the whole kingship, what he says here is our sovereignty, sound power. The whole kingship, that is the issue. Now, Philo, Philo, the father says is, our rule, the rule of Sejurim, is not inferior to kingship in any sense. Sejurim is treated like a god. His rule is irresponsible without appeal. And let us turn to page 243, bottom, verse 620. Is this not our dominion of man? Is it less than the empire of Zeus? Imagine, the god like this lover of sacrifices, commissioned by the Delphian god, exercises himself Godly power, yes? Why the very same phrases, so grand and divine, for me as for him are in you. For when we are raging loud and high in stormy tumultuous din, O Lord of Zeus, say the passers by, how thunders the court within. The well being great when my lightnings glare, turn pale and sick and mutter a prayer. You fear me too, I protest you do. Yes, yes, my Demeter, I vow, it is true. But hang me if I am afraid of you. Yes, so that is only as a specimen. Now, is then Belly Cleon's response, in line 650, that is on page 244, bottom. No, no uh, the, the speech of Delicleon uh, on the uh, page of the uh, bottom, yeah? Hard were the task and truth the intent? Yeah. For a comedy poet all too great to attempt to heal and better it old disease ingrained in the heart of the state. Now let us stop here. For a comic poet, that is what Delicleon says, he, through Delicleon, the comic poet himself speaks. Belladon is, in a way, the comic poet, just as a slave who is spoke for him. He knows that Belladon knows that he cannot heal this ancient disease. But, that is implied, perhaps the comic poet can supply some relief. Now let us go on uh, where we left off immediately. Yet, O dread Cranides, Father and Lord. Yeah, who is that, by the way? Who is the Cranides? Zeus, of course. Oh, our Father Zeus, he says. Yeah? And what does the Father reply? Stop, stop, don't talk in that fatherly way. In other words, yeah, don't call him, yeah. In other words, he, he takes it, he identifies himself with Zeus. We are not surprised at him. Now, Benicleon says, uh, his proof. Only a very small part of Athenian revenue goes to the alleged rulers of Athens, the jurymen. The bulk goes to the demagogues. If the demagogues wanted, every juryman could be a rich man, which, needless to say, is campaign oratory. 
at its worst, but not in effect. Now let us turn to uh, page 248 uh, talk, verse number 19. Let a panic possess them, they are ready to give. Do what they are at once for the state to divide, and engage to supply for every man for fifty bushels of wheat beside. But five poor bushels of barley each is all that you ever obtained in fact, and that doled out by the poor, while first they bury you under the alien act. And therefore it was that I locked you away to keep you in ease. I'm willing that these with empty mouthings your age should build. And now I offer you here today, without any reserve, whatever you please, save only a drop of treasurer's milk. Yeah. Well, you see, the Delicron is a super demagogue. He has to be. You see, that is, by the way, the theme of the comedy The Knights, where the the upper class people, the knights, higher, the lowest and most lost demagogue to get rid of the ruling demagogue, you know, and uh, this is amazing. So he's a super demagogue, but he speaks only to his father, to his father, whom he, to whom he will give all he wants. He does not, you know, he, he does not promise the change of the law the division of the whole revenue of the German, the only promise which he makes to that extent is an honest demagogue, that he makes only promise to his mother. If his argument were addressed to the Juryman, it would require a tremendous increase in all forms of social security. But now a surprise will be left off immediately. Let me, let me see the time is a little bit advanced. Could, could anyone tell me what's the exact time? Ten minutes of time. You know, I think we dropped that. And I mentioned all this. The chorus is convinced. The chorus is convinced by this speech. Although they do not derive any benefit from Delicleon's proposal, they are convinced because they identify themselves with the father, with Philoclea. How can this be? I mean, how can you identify yourself with someone else who gets all the money and you are happy because he gets all the money? How is this possible? Let us use a bit called psychology to understand that. Can there be such a vicarious pleasure can there, and to what extent can it be? And that is, I think, a very good observation of the poet. Because if people look up to a man, as the jurymen look to a Deligleon, then they can be satisfied by his satisfaction. I mean, I have heard that some union men are very proud of the elegant Cadillacs driven by the union leaders. These poor fellows don't have such elegant cardiacs, but they vicariously enjoy that kind of, Yeah, that happens. And so they are satisfied. Why is, is this an, an, uh, is this a wrong observation? Well, it mustn't be. Let us assume that it, that it was not in this case. What does the poet teach? The demos, the simple jury, are curable because of their basic good nature. Good naturedness is a word which Aristotle applies to the common people in his Athenian constitution. And this good naturedness is analyzed a bit because of their inner dependence on the rich or on certain rich people. The malady of Athens are not the common people, but the demagogues on the one hand, and wealthy old men like Philocleon on the other. In this particular play, Aristophanes is not concerned with the demagogues. He emphasizes that by having Cleon called in, and Cleon never comes out. Cleon is not the theme, the other one. In the West, the theme of the poem is the type represented by Philoclea. The son convinces both the other Dikas 
and his father. He has done violence to his father and gotten away with it. That's amazing. There is a parallel to that in the oldest play, one of the sermons which has been discussed, the Akarnians. A man commits high treason. He makes private peace with the enemy, with Sparta, during the war. And he is naturally persecuted, as he should. But then he does one thing. He borrows rags from Euripides. Euripides liked to dress his heroes in rags. And in the clothed in his rags, and with his head on the executioner's block, the man who had committed high treason makes a speech to the citizen body, the Maradon fire, the American Legion. And he succeeds in splitting them. And then he's free. Once you, a substantial part of the community, is on your side, the mere law can no longer be enforced. And that is said. So you can get away with high trace under certain conditions. Here he showed you can get away with beating his own father under certain conditions. He got away with it, yes. Well, in listening to his son, the new demagogue, he changes his opinion, he judges his previous opinion. Is this judgment evil? If he has been judging evilly in the past, doing mischief, yeah, has he done mischief at this point? When he judges his past opinion to be bad and condemns his past opinion, is uh, convinced by his son. Yeah, but he's only convinced of one point that he is not as powerful as he believed in Athens as he believed he was, only of that. The question of, of hanging or condemning did not come up. He only uh, was strutting around and saying, everyone depends on me, I am as powerful in Athens as Zeus is in the universe. And then his son proves him by simple statistics about the revenue of Athens that he's wrong. If he were so powerful, he is, as Judge Julian, he would get, say, 10,000 a year, and he gets only 200 a year. <clears throat> if that doesn't prove it, I don't know what could prove it. That is it. The hanging is not a question. Now, Philagron has been convinced that he does not rule like a king or a god, but he cannot give up his real inclination, namely to sit in judgment and to condemn. This is the only thing he cannot give up. And therefore, it's a compromise. He is permitted to act as a judge in his house, where he is anyway, where, where the activity is anyway more pleasant. Well, take a simple thing, an innocent example. I suppose, in, I never was on the jury, you can't smoke cigarettes while uh, being, uh, sitting on a jury bench. At home, he can smoke cigarettes. And he, he gives some Greek equivalents for that thing. Now, then, uh, the very funny scene where a court uh, sitting takes place in the house, and uh, there is one verse, I don't know whether I find it easily, which is, uh, we must not really rush disgracefully. There is a, a remark of Deliton in verse 834, where he says, what's, what's the matter? How terrible is the addiction to locality, to a place, and to what is customary in that place, you see? The father is, in a way, a typical patriarch, but in a, in a somewhat problematic way. And that means attachment to the local and to the old for its own sake. Deli Cleon does not have that. Now, there is a beautiful presentation of the same problem in prose in Xenophon's Greek history. There, he has given a description of two leading Greek generals said at the beginning of the third book, two spots. One is the famous King Agesilaus, who is really a model of a king, I mean, a common blimp, and how should I say, 
in a way, uh, other generals, of whom you may know, and uh, so. But then there is another fellow, and, but he proves he is very militant, but he proves to be hopelessly inefficient. He destroys what his predecessor had done without any fuss, and what he had finished completely intended. The name of his predecessor is the Christian. Whom everyone called Sisyphus. Sisyphus means not in the sense not most known today, but says super clever. Sisyphus. Super clever. Thank you. That's, and that was the grandfather of Odysseus, was called Sisyphus. And uh, he did a magnificent job without any fuss. Now, this man, who was such a perfectly wonderful friend, also very humane and nice, was forever punished, for example, for not being very strict yeah, for some ataxia, for some lack of discipline uh, when he was uh, with, the Spanish, uh, with the Spartan army in, uh, in Byzantium. And especially he has another quality which Xenophon calls with an intranslatable word, philapodemia. He likes to be away from the demos. He likes to be away from home. You know, that is... Uh, a similar feature it seems to be characteristic of the nuclear. Still, he, the son is praised by his father for do, doing everything according to the manners of the country. Now, there is a sacrifice prior to the city, and directly on praise. It appeared, yeah, let me might read, uh, on page 253, second half, that is verse 875, sorry. The non speech of Telegon, the second half of 250. The prayer. I praise my neighbor and hero and Lord, who dwells in the temple I best to be obeyed. I pray thee be graciously pleased to accept the right that we knew for my father create. You know, it's an emphasis on novelty. Yeah? He, he make introduce a new vibe. A new vibe. We make an innovation. O oh, bend to a pliant and flexible mood, the stubborn and resolute oak of his will, and into his heart so crusty and tar, a trifle of honey for syrup and still. And do him with sympathies wide, a sweet and humane disposition, which leans to the side of the wretch that is tried, and weeps at a culprit's petition. From harshness and anger to joy, may it now be his constant endeavor, and out of his temper the stern, sharp sting of the metal to sever. Yeah, that's what we need, you see. The harshness of Philoclea appears in contrast to the gentleness of the demos as presented indeed. Now, there's a scene to, uh, uh, of which uh, Monsieur report last time, the trial of the dog. He has to judge somebody, and at least a dog, you see. And it shows that Philoclion hasn't changed at all. He's, he, he's as eager to condemn as he was before, but his son deceives him into acquitting the poor dog. Yeah. And uh, he is rather uh, shocked by it, and at the end of this, on page 757, middle, you would see the motivation becomes clear again. The motivation is piety. He thinks he commits a sin by acquitting. The little shock, by the way, is this. There was a lawsuit against Laches, who is known to you from a platonic dialogue called Laches. And the do uh, here there was some affair in Sicily uh, where Cleon persecuted him. And the dog is called Laches. You know, I came from your form letter in Greek, and Labes comes from the Greek word lambano, which means take, uh, take away, steal, yeah. the, the taker. And that's a minor joke which uh, links it up with the contemporary situation. Now, this piety is to be replaced by pleasure, and this pleasure is meant to include love of human beings, kindness, philanthropy. Now then the Parabasis, the speaking for the poet, says, 
the poet, admiring the poet's courage in attacking monsters like Cleon, which he does not do in his plays, and his novel inventions. You see, the two elements, the political action, that is called the poet's justice, and his inventiveness, his cleverness, these are the two sides, the two claims placed by the poet. The chorus consists of the jurymen of humdrum Athenian citizens, no, of true-born, I'm sorry, I can't read my hand right, of true-born Athenian citizens. They are the defenders of Athens against the Persian invasion. That was the greatest moment where their waspishness, their stings, their anger, the term anger, sometimes he uses the word thymos, which is only then said by spiritedness, the key theme of Plato's Republic. Spiritedness, the quality of the guardians, that is characteristic of the citizens. At that time, they did not yet know how to speak well, but they were concerned who were the best so uh, sailor or soldier, real guys. Thus they became the founders of the Athenian Empire. They are proud of having stings, which means of being harsh-spirited and ill-tempered. These terms are they are proud of them, because that are the conditions for winning a war. A war is not won by uh, soapiness. They were distempered to the highest degree, both in war and in peace. Their vindictiveness in law courts is only the reverse side of their prowess in battle. The only political reform which they want is limitation of full citizen rights to those who have served in the army, a defensible position to take. It is not altogether unreasonable, uh, altogether reasonable because someone might be bodily unable to bear arms and might be good in counsel. We know that famous problem. But uh, that this simple man would think that way is perfectly uh, defensible. So uh, you see, so they, this man, they, there is a place of waspishness. There is a right kind of waspishness against the former element. There is a wrong kind against the federal citizens. And what the poet attacks is only the wrong kind, naturally. The, electoral, uh, uh, the son tries to change his... Uh, yeah, this is, uh, in a way, uh, the, uh, that is crucial. Now, the next thing. Deli Cleon tries to change his father. So, uh, the, what is implied, you must not forget, the first substitute for condemning, public condemning, is domestic condemning. And that worked out well because of the trickery of Delicreon, but no conversion of the father, because the father wanted to condemn too. You remember? The son tricked him. So now the son tries now a more radical cure. He tries to change his father into a fashionable gentleman. Now these are very amusing scenes which we unfortunately cannot read. If you would turn to 266 bottom, you know, well, we can't read that. He gives him specimens of how people converse in polite society. You see that they talk and not uh, talk about special subjects and so on. I mentioned it last time. Drink and laughter of gentlemen. Yeah, but then, all right, the, uh, the father goes into polite society, but that's a complete fact. He doesn't behave like such a fine gentleman at all. A slave gives his report of the vulgar and vicious conduct of that old fellow at the dinner. Philogion now becomes the object of judicial proceedings, and which he now despises, you see, because he is now the receiving head. He promises his inheritance to the flute girl when his son is dead. <laughs> he mistakes his son for his father, he sees how drunk he is. 
and he is prepared to beat his son, which means, of course, his father. In his view, you see, he is completely changed bad. But nothing of this kind is happening because he's too drunk for that. And he's brought to a house, to his house by force by his son. Then there is another scene where the chorus appro approves of Delhi Cleon of the son's conduct. I mean, in other words, what, what the son did to his father, he's using force against him, is perfectly decent as his guardians of decency. <laughs> and the, the chorus even expresses his admiration for the sun. In a way, the sun is a comic poem. There is a reconciliation between the demos and the comic poem. Now let me see uh, whether we find that easy. Yeah, read, let us read the speech at the top of page 274, slave speaking. Do you have that? Oh, Dionysus, here's a pretty mess. Into our house some power as we're at a gate. As soon as the old man heard the pipe and drank the long and tasted wine, he grew so merry he won't stop dancing all the whole night through. Those strange old dances such as Despis taught. And, and your new bards, he'll prove old tools, he says, dancing against them in the lists. Yeah. In a way, he is the old reactionary, yeah? But on the other hand, uh, he is, in a way, more fashionable than the reactionaries because he says his modern tragedians, modern tragedy was, they are old fogies. You see, there is a kind of coincidence with the extreme reactionarism and the extreme modernity. It's a complicated situation. But in the final scene, Philocleon parodies, parodies, ridicules the dances of today. That is an, and that ends with there is no mayhem anymore. You know, and all these terrible scenes with the flute girl and with the what what, what kind of woman was that? What did she say? I mean, I forgot what it was. Bakery, yeah, but I don't know. And he, and, he, and he beat up people and it was absolutely disgraceful. But now he behaves in a, in a legal manner. There is the end is peaceful, the end is happy. Now, I would like to make this remark uh, in conclusion about the play. The play proves to us one thing, which has been of great interest to us in the two previous plays. A man may use force against his own father, namely, in order to prevent him from evil doing, and in order to turn him to a life of pleasure and of innocent pleasure. Such violence is legitimate if the force is used for the benefit of the father and or the police. Look at the beautiful beginning of the Republic, where the definition comes, justice is restoring the posits. And then the objection comes here, but if the fellow has gone, the owner of the knife, or the, or the submachine, gun, uh, submachine gun, has become mad in the meantime. Of course not! Oh, then justice is not simply identical with returning to positive. Now apply it to your father, which Plato doesn't do it explicitly in this place. Surely a mad father, the duties to a mad father cannot be the same as the duties toward a non-mad father. Yeah? It's important. It's important. So the mere paternity doesn't make it. And then we have to take it for them. Now then, of course, we must consider, as I said already last time, the particular kind of madness of the father. Harshness, vindictiveness, stings. Yeah, but the stings are not altogether bad. The stings are needed against the foreign enemy. The police needs ill-temperedness. Plato uh, has used the more delicate term than ill temperedness. He has called it spiritedness. But don't forget what Plato says about the characters of the gods. 
They are to be like dogs, kind to the acquaintances and ill-tempered towards strangers. He says so. Aristotle blames him for that, but Plato says it. You know, he says, you know, like a vicious dog, if he is not, if he is not a fellow citizen. Uh, this element of, of Aristotle is very, is very gentlemanly and tries to keep out all harsh things from uh, politics, and he succeeds to a very great extent. Not completely, because he has to bring in slavery in this funny way, you know, it's the first book. Some people know only this of Aristotle and slavery, but they don't know uh, how complicated that issue in Aristotle is. This. We may, I will take this up on another occasion. All I say, police needs a certain amount of ill temperedness, viciousness, as we call it, harshness. And I think that is empirically true every day and applies to the kindest societies as well as to the unkind. Only the difference of degrees is very important in practice. Now, the city can avoid war, and perhaps it should avoid war, surely unnecessary war. But let us assume it succeeds in avoiding war for an unusually long time. What will happen? Will there be everything honey and milk? Not at all. The stings will be, become effective against fellow citizens. And that is what is presented here. Yeah, that, you can say that is a dogmatic, for the time being, I'm willing to settle for that. It was a dogmatic prejudice of Aristophanes that there is no possibility of eradication of the state. Yeah? That, but I would say, if you mean it from an anger, anger which I fear you might mean it, I would defer to a man called Sigmund Freud, who said something about the impossibility of eradicating stings in his language. Is it not true? Good. So I have some social science support for, for, for our stories. By the way, remember this beautiful story in the birds. The father beater, you know, who has also this vicious side to beat someone, is sent off to war in France against a foreign enemy. Also, the, the war against the foreigners is less vicious than the war against your nearest and dearest. Now, this stinginess, you know, stinginess, I'm sorry, <laughs> this waspishness is true of all wasps, but not quite of the hero of the play. He is a special kind. He is characterized by a special kind of waspishness which is derivative, which is traced to the Delphic Oracle. If we can, I can use one of these abominable modern words which the Greek language in the good times did know, but which is helpful for simple, superficial, colloquial understanding, religious fanaticism. Religious fanaticism. It is this kind of fast with which the poet is concerned in our play. Not that of the demons. The vastness of the demons is partly useful and partly incurable. He is not even concerned with the vastness of the demagogues. Remember, Cleon is called twice a demagogues. The poet wants to emphasize it as strongly as possible. It is not Cleon and this kind of evil with which I'm concerned in this play. The vastness of Philocleon is curable, it seems, in a simple way, if he has the right kind of son who will beat him. But it is curable only to some extent. Philocleon is prevailed upon to stay away from the law court, where he could do massive mischief. But he needs some more or less vicious substitute for the supreme viciousness of condemning people at all costs. 
which is the sun. And there are three such substitutes suggested. First, playing with condemning, pretending to condemn, as is seen with the dog. But that, of course, doesn't cure the disease. It only substitutes harmless objects for the objects where he could do harm. The second one is refinement and elegant society. And that is a failure, a complete one, because he is much too cruel. And that is the central point. That doesn't work. That would be the best. And so you must not forget that the poet, um, um, with proper poetic license or liberty, presents his refinement in a grotesque form, you know, as a kind of very, uh, very funny scenes, what kind of uh, coat he wears, what kind of shoes. The, the old man has never heard that such things exist. It's a kind of conversation you make at a cocktail party and so on and so on. That's very funny and that is uh, naturally, legitimately well done. But then there is a third point which works, and that is parody of the new art. Something which Aristophanes himself does all the time, especially in connection with, Euripide, with the tragedy of Euripides. Now, these substitutes are supplied, and especially the last, by comedy. And therefore, that Denicleon is called, uh, calls himself in a way, a, a comic poet in this verse to which I refer, 60, 65, 650 is perfectly correct. The comedy mitigates the inevitable evils of the police and the law. Therefore, because it mitigates evils which are felt more or less by every sane human being, the comedy is welcome. But the basis of comedy, prosaic wisdom, or to use a still harsher term, astronomy, understanding of the basis of everything, is not welcome. You see, Socrates, Socrates is interested in, in what the truth, uh, finds it out there, uh, find, uh, uh, and so, and that is, is not welcome. I mean, only a very special individual like Strepsiades has a momentary interest in it because he misconstrues the meaning of the whole. He thinks he can get out of his steps. But what the poor does, who knows what Socrates does, but does something, puts it to a good human use, mitigating the evils, the inevitable evils of society, that is welcome. The son fails in his attempt to transform his father into a man of elegant society. Only vulgar pleasures would attract this old guy. We, perhaps we can say, because there are some allusions to that, that the son made the mistake of Aristophanes, whose clouds were rejected by the judges, who was deserted by the Athenians, as is indicated in verse 1291. Yet the malicious wit of comedy is effective as a substitute and a cure for the waspishness in question. That I think is what he means to say to us. And so we have seen it in it also. The, that is clear, I think, the, the theme or a theme of great importance in the three plays we have discussed is the beating of the father. And the status is entirely different in the three plays because here we have, as I say, a legitimate beating, whereas in true other cases it is, uh, it, it, it leads to, it's either forbidden or leads to a okay, Now we have then to turn rather abruptly to Plato the Apology and the Crito. On the surface, of, I mean, when we begin to read that, we will not find directly these themes. We will not find directly these themes because 
The apology, as you know, is a defense of Socrates against the charge, and the quieter is a discussion between Socrates, and I don't say his most intimate friend, but his oldest friend, as to whether he should escape from prison or, or should stick it out. But the connection is there, there, there to Aristoteles, to the problem of Aristoteles. Why does Socrates accept the verdict of the city of Athens? which he regards as unjust. You know, when, when he was condemned, he, a very sentimental young friend of his, Apollodorus, said, how terrible that they have got, uh, to, uh, condemned you to death unjustly. And then Socrates, for once smiling, laughing, said, would you have preferred it that I be condemned justly? <laughs> And so as soon as was uh, condemned unjustly, that's at least the claim. And he nevertheless accepts the punishment. On what ground? I'm speaking of the most superficial aspect. Well, honor father and mother. But the honor owed to the police is much greater than the honor owed to father and mother. So that is the principle. And we must see how this is related to rational morality in the case of Socrates. I'm sure that this problem is sufficiently articulated in these two works of Plato in Bosnia, although there are others which are very pertinent, but we cannot uh, read too much. Uh, we cannot read more than these two relatively short writings. Uh, let me only make clear, lest there be any misunderstanding. Next time, Mr. Strickland will read the paper, and Mr. Puckett will hand it in. Yeah, seven pages. Is there? I will. I will I have two or three more minutes, if you want to. If there is someone who has a very clear and simple question, I'm willing to discuss it. Mr. Fulton. Would you discuss what uh, Aristotle is like in the Euripides? Some of us have seen the, the performance that goes in the theater of the colleges. Uh, the text of the colleges, Euripides the colleges. Yeah. And there, there it becomes very clear that Aphrodite of love is the target of Euripides. Is this found up? Yeah, well, that is, of course, the accusation made in the Thesma of Raya Susa, that you remember is a women hater. Yeah, women hater. Um, and the women of Athens persecute him, but he, in contradistinction to Sugares, can save himself. Yeah, but that, I think, doesn't go, doesn't go to the root. Uh, one would have, it is, uh, you find, in the frogs, there you find a clear opposition between Euripidean tragedy, the modern tragedy, and Aeschylus tragedy, the old tragedy, but uh, both regarding content and form. Yeah, but what Euripides, uh, what Aristophanes thought about it, remains ambiguous because the judge there, the god Dionysus, can't decide it. Because some are, some things are good in Eskimos and others are good in Euripides in both respects. And the decision is made on purely political grounds. Who has a sound view regarding Alcibiades? And that is Eskimos. Yeah? So the, what the utmost one could say is this. There is, Eskimos is given an edge because of his political judgment. And perhaps the poet implies that Aeschylus had better political judgment is not unconnected with the character of his tragedy. That's the utmost one can say, because, uh, yeah, but you had also, in the, and Euripides belongs to Socrates, yeah? And superficially, that settles it. He's a new fangled man, and Aristotle is a old reaction. But that is not sufficient, because we have seen Meto. The, the, the other Socrates, the astronomer, oh, how is he thrown out by Pistateros? 
but only because the police cannot stand it, not because he himself does not love him, as he said. Yeah? That is uh, difficult to say. I think uh, on, a, on the basis of what I know, I would say Aristophanes regarded Sophocles as the greatest of the three. And therefore he is so... There are two verses on Sophocles in the Frogs of utmost beauty, which precisely in this shocking parodizing context stand out as the greatest compliment one could pay, uh, pay to a man. So that uh, I think it cannot be, well, like, no one praises Aphrodite more than uh, uh, Aristophanes. That cannot be, that cannot be the difference. That needs a long study. It cannot be the conclusion. So, next time, we will hear the